Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention for a little bit? Uh, you may wonder when the panel will start. Actually, our main program in the Europa Saal is a bit delayed, around maximum a half an hour. So, um, yeah, you can drink a cup of coffee in the foyer or in, in the village at the main time, and then you can come back in around about 20 or 30 minutes, and then it will start. Thank you for your attention.
Can I have the mic here for a moment? Appreciate everybody moving so rapidly to this room, and I've already had a number of questions on what is the panel in this room. Um, so let me just try and make sure you all know the, uh, if you were not in the right room or whatever. This is digital inclusion, and it's the marginalized groups panel. So I think a number of people were looking for the education and skills panel, and as I understand it, that starts after this panel in 30 minutes. So if you were a, mod if you were a panelist on the marginalized groups, could I ask you now to come forward? I have a list but we've had a number of people that have had to um, drop out. So what I'm, I'm looking, I believe, up here, for Sue Kahambu Stefanu, who's ICAO CEO and founder, Joanna Breidenbach, Bishaka Dada, Inger Paus is here, Marcus Biko is not able to come, um, I do hope Fatima Ba is able to come because she was an outstanding speaker a moment ago, and there she is. And Vincent Bagheer. Thank you, Fatima. So we've had a number of very, very good speeches this morning, but as everybody has already heard, we are extremely behind, and we've been given um, very strict orders that each one of these panels has to last 30 minutes with a rapid swap between the two so that we can all go back to the main plenary room. So I really want to ask everybody to sort of respect that in our, in our comments. Um, I'm not going to do um, any long introduction. I think we all know why we're here. Um, there were some speaking remarks that were planned. Um, obviously, access to the internet is incredibly important, as we've heard so um, clearly this morning. And as I, I know, many of you whom I recognize in the room really, really recognize as one of the most critical um, tasks we all face. Um, so with that, and I think maybe the fastest way to move through this as well is we have a presentation first from Inger. Um, we'll do the presentation. I'll ask everybody to just give a really brief introduction as your turn actually comes to speak. I think that's the fastest way to make sure the most appropriate information is shared in this um, collapsed time. And unfortunately, I, I think I have to say right now, I don't suspect we'll have time for any Q&A. Um, but I really appreciate everybody's support here. And of course, all the panelists will be available throughout the, the course of the week as well. So with that, Inger, I turn the floor to you. Inger is actually um, with the, the Vodafone Foundation. She's the CEO. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, good morning, um, or let's say good afternoon. Um, yeah, thanks for, for the opportunity to talk um, in this panel about marginalized groups. Um, actually, I'm not the CEO of the Vodafone Foundation because that's 27 organizations. I'm the um, uh, chairwoman of the German Foundation and the managing director of the Vodafone Institute, which is the European think tank of the Vodafone Group. And um, when I was asked to, to participate in this panel, I said, great, that's a good opportunity to talk about one of the um, largest marginalized groups, which is actually women. So this doesn't work. Yeah, here we go. So <clears throat> and um, also give you a little bit of examples what we are doing at Vodafone together with our partners to empower women. So first of all, if you want to achieve gender equality, which is an SDG in its um, in itself, you have to look at a, a set of issues which are um, actually impacting women at the moment. Um, that is ranging from education up to health and well-being and, and uh, employment and entrepreneurship. And if you look at the current situation of women worldwide, in particular also in developing countries, we've got um, more than 130 million girls who are out of school and thus lay, um, lack the basic foundation for decent um, economic opportunities. Um, if you look into health, there's one particular issue, which is a special, special focus of today. Also, it's, it's domestic violence. Um, there are 8 million working women, which a current study of the Vodafone Foundation today revealed, who are experiencing domestic violence. And I'm just talking about working women, and in fact, it's much, much more. Um, and this absolutely has an impact of their professional and personal lives. Furthermore, women are much more likely to do unpaid work compared to 
75% uh, of men who are in paid um, employment, it's only 50% of women. And that goes along with entrepreneurship. It's only a fraction of the tech startups who are run by women or who are founded by women. So how do we change that, actually? So at Vodafone, and I'm not just talking about the Vodafone Group, but also about the foundation and its large network and the Vodafone Institute, we um, address all of these ED, um, SDGs which I was talking about. Um, uh, let's start with education and skills. There is a myriad of programs um, across the globe, not just in developing countries, where we try to provide um, access to education with technology, but also technology competencies. For example, um, this girl effect, that's a program which we run across Africa um, to address vulnerable girls and make sure that they get all kind of information about their um, well-being and um, uh, career opportunities. It's Code Like a Girl, which basically provides um, coding competencies, make sure that um, girls can have a career in um, in tech, or let's take the Instant Network School Program, which is um, providing um, kids in uh, refugee camps, including a lot of girls, with um, basic education via uh, technology. If we look at health and well-being, which is a particular topic um, also for women who are raising kids, um, we have also created a lot of programs also in Africa, like Mom and Baby Services or M Mama, which is a, a taxi service for pregnant women run by uh, um, uh, with, with M Pesa, which is really um, trying to um, uh, decrease the mortality of kids and women um, uh, who are uh, carrying a baby. Um, furthermore, on domestic violence, um, we have rolled out Texas and Bright Sky, which is um, supporting women who are experiencing and girls experiencing domestic violence um, with services to um, get support um, by police authorities, but also um, to um, spread awareness about um, domestic violence amongst girl communities. And I'm sure you've heard of M-Pesa, which has been a game changer when it comes to financial inclusion in developing countries, in particular in the African continent. And a lot of uh, millions of, of women have benefited from this because they could basically uh, start their own business, uh, run their own uh, family finances, and, and this definitely increased um, a lot of situations and families in Africa beyond. And last but not least, and this is what I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about, it's female entrepreneurship. So the Vodafone Institute um, started um, an accelerator program, which is called Fastlane, um, uh, or F-Lane, female Fastlane, so to say, as, as abbreviation. And we did this because we did a research which revealed that only a fraction, depending on the geo, it's between three to five percent of the technology startups are owned by women or created by women. Um, and also the STEM workforce is only, um, it's still just a quarter of women um, who are working in this particular sector, which has become so important for the transformation of economy and society. Um, and uh, along with this, it's even less venture capital, which is going towards female entrepreneurs, which really is hampering their growth opportunities. And last but not least, um, as an impact or effect of that, uh, women um, are still one of the largest unserved markets in business. So, and this is why we said, okay, we need to change that. And we created F-Lane. Um, it's a social ventures accelerator program. It means basically we support um, uh, ventures which are funded and run by women on, and in particular impacting the lives of women with the business models and the products we um, create. And that means we are not just supporting women, but also men who are creating these kind of ventures um, for the well-being of women and economic um, opportunities. And so far, we've run four batches. Um, the last one just finished last day here in Berlin. Um, we are running this out of Berlin, but it's a global program. We have um, um, achieved, we have um, got 700 or more than 700 applications over the course of the last two and a half years. And out, out of them, we supported 20 ventures in 12 countries. Um, as you can see, a lot are in Africa, but also in um, Asia and, and Europe. And um, these, um, these social ventures have impacted more than 300 lives already, which is great. And uh, we hope that we can scale this program even um, more on a, global uh, on a global scale because we are looking for partners. So if you're interested to working with us on F-Lane, so please um, uh, make sure that we talk today. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Inga. Inga was actually meant to give a longer keynote presentation, so I really appreciate you <laughs> moving through it so quickly under the time pressures. Um, I neglected to introduce myself at the beginning because I was trying to organize on the on the fly here. Um, my name is Lynn Sainamore, and I'm actually the chair of the Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, or IGF MAG. Um, I think at this point, I, I, at some point I need a time check because I think we're supposed to finish in 20 or 22 minutes now, um, so maybe Henriette can help me. Um, and I think the only way we can make this work is if I say very little and we just ask everybody to move through and take sort of three minutes each with a quick introduction, um, make sure we've got your title correctly, um, a very short introduction to your organization so that people can actually place the activities since they're all very important and so pertinent to this particular topic, and then ask you if you could move through your speeches quite quickly. Um, with apologies because we didn't have any time to organize or in fact for me to even meet with the panelists um, beforehand. Um, so maybe I'll start here with Fatima and then we'll just move down the, the line if that's okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. Um, I will try not to be too long on the introduction side. I think you um, might have in mind I'm a tech entrepreneur turned into a venture capital investor. But there is something I wanted to develop, which is the reason why. Um, and when you look basically at um, the funding space in Africa, um, you have a phenomenon that is very unfair. So basically, uh, according to IFC, at seed stage, you have 51% male and 49% female entrepreneurs looking at getting access to funding. But then the further you go in the life cycle, so series B, C, D, so like big money, here you have 90% male and 10% female because it's acknowledged that maybe women will only need, I don't know, microfinancing. And it was actually one of the motivation for me to start my own venture capital fund because I felt that maybe one of the reasons why there is a lack of access to funding in Af Africa is actually roughly $42 billion gap in terms of access to, to, to funding um, is, is because you actually are lacking female managing partners because seeing a young female having a, a, a project around fashion in, in Senegal can be a turn off for a Silicon Valley VC uh, old guy, but it's actually something exciting to me. Yeah, it, it's either neutral or positive. Um, and we've been actually uh, investing in female-led businesses. We actually have a female, 60% uh, female investment team with uh, good results so far. And one example I wanted to mention in particular is actually from my um, entrepreneurial and that investor background is how trying to find ways to increase access um, of the products sold on my platform in Nigeria to the many, especially in rural and peri-urban areas. We started a program with 120 women and we equipped them with tablets. And we said, you actually don't have to be out of your home. You could sell to your neighbors, your immediate family, or even your church. And then when you sell, we give you a cut, a bit like we will do for Facebook and Google advertising or affiliation online, except here it's offline and it's targeting um, women in rural and peri-urban areas. And it was a huge pride for my team to have been able to scale the program two years and a half later to 45,000 women. And when you ask them what that taught them or brought to them, they don't say, oh, I gained digital skills. They tell you, hey, I was able to earn an income and become actually a source of profit and, and gain a kind of, you know, some, some kind of social recognition in my um, uh, husband's house. So it's really something that can be game changing. And again, it's not only about only doing it for the right reasons. It's also economically empowering because what I forgot to mention is that it was actually my most successful sales channel. Thank you. I'll be very quick and comment on this because I already had my five minutes, but there is a structural imbalance in the system. So it's, it's a lot of components which we need. It's kind of the, let's say, the basic entry, right? Equipping with the, the basic skills and, and teach them along the way what you can do with this. And, but it's also f um, it's, it's getting more women into the investments. Um, and this is what also investors start to realize in America and, and in the other big destinations where you've got the money. So, And this is actually what Eflin is about. It's a prototype. It's really funding more testimonials in the system, which are role models for other entrepreneurs. Hi, everybody. My name is Suka Humbu Stefano. I'm a CEO of a company called Green Dreams Tech. And my work is in the marginalized space of smallholder farmers, many of them who are subsistence farmers, but bringing them up to becoming commercial farmers. Um, I built a mobile phone-based application for feature phones. So although we're talking about internet here, I almost feel that 
the majority of the smallholder farmers don't actually have access to internet or even the phones for various reasons, cost of the phone, charging of the phone, cost of bundles, reach, etc. Many have feature phones, but it doesn't mean that they should be left out. And if they are left out of the bigger picture and the bigger discussions around connectivity, then we all lose. As it was mentioned earlier, we are as strong as our weakest link. And in the case of food security on the African continent, we are as strong as the smallholder farmers. So I built a platform that basically farmers register on through a USSD menu. They choose through the menu the content that they want. Um, it started off with the pain points. The farmers have built the product with us. We have very, very close feedback loops with hundreds of thousands of farmers across, across the country. And we built content that farmers felt were their most, you know, the biggest priority, their pain points, um, which they can access. We were lucky enough to work with a, um, a telco in the country and are able to deliver the service for free now. Since 2010, we started. For the first six years, farmers paid. And what we found is when we had climate shocks, farmers that needed the service most fell out because they couldn't afford to pay. So we managed to now roll it out as a free service. And our aim as a company is to do this across Africa. The gains that we've seen are incredible. Just by increasing farmer knowledge, access to experts, and access to skills and confidence is resulting in increased wealth and revenue prosperity from the ground up, which is then enabling farmers to start purchasing smartphones, purchasing instruments that can help them with solar power and help them then to the next scale is to eventually access the internet. And I honestly believe, and the reason that I'm here, is that I believe that governments and um, telcos need to work together to start looking at policies they can put in place to make this space, the USSD space, affordable for more social impacting um, and transformational services so that we can actually scale these things across the continent at haste. We can't afford to do it. We don't have time to do it slowly. As we, as we know, the um, population on the continent is going to double in the next 30 years. Currently, we're the only continent with increasing levels of stunted childhood under the age of five. Um, and currently, in a country like Kenya, a quarter of the population is already suffering from malnutrition. So we need to work at haste, and we need transformational change that is embedded from government, from policy, and with like-minded, um, big, scalable partners. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, I'm Joanna Breidenbach. I'm from Berlin. I'm co-founder of a platform for social projects called betterplace.org, which is Germany's largest crowdfunding platform for social projects. And the Better Place Lab, which is a think tank which looks at the intersection between digital technologies and the common good. And I want to use my two and a half minutes to just highlight some of the key findings which we did, especially in our research in the, at the Better Place Lab, where we've looked at a lot of uh, inclusion issues, namely especially with uh, regards to dig uh, refugees and digital solutions digital platforms which enable a better integration of refugees. Uh, we also did a lot of work in the female space, so we published a, por a report bridging the digital gender gap um, based in five countries where we looked at uh, digital inclusion of women. And also, uh, we are very active in the hate speech um, area, especially uh, in the German-speaking uh, uh, context. So when I look at these very different topics, uh, all related to marginalized uh, uh, populations, we definitely see that there is still a huge lack of awareness that, this, uh, that you know, people are discriminated against. Um, and we are so overwhelmed, I feel, in the tech space by a very you know, masculine, on steroid value system uh, from the Silicon Valley, um, that even at my company, it took us quite some time to realize that on betterplace.org, we also, of course, have the norm normal di discrimination which we see in the, on online, uh, in the offline world also being replicated and even maybe increased and strengthened in the offline space. Because when you look at, for example, who gets most funding, because you know our platform is being used by NGOs, and so there's always a, a project manager who asks for funds. And when you look at, do people of color actually have equal access to funding? No, they don't. You know, our donors predominantly um, uh, donate to projects which are, are headed by white uh, people. And so what can we, as a, as a 
platform do in order to counter that? That's a really important uh, question. We also see that in many areas where we look at um, the existing uh, infrastructure to fight discrimination, many of them are analog. And we see that these kind of you know, crisis centers with, which look after refugees or after uh, uh, women who are uh, victims of domestic violence, we see that they don't really yet have an awareness of the fact that there is a, a huge phenomenon in the digital space. So we feel that really, you know, we need online and offline, this awareness really needs to be strengthened. Um, one um, topic which we find, we, we see across the board is that there is far too little co-creation of content. Uh, when you, we look at the German digital refugee uh, situation, we see that loads of German providers uh, have built apps and platforms for re refugees, but they very rarely did it with refugees, but always for refugees. And so, you know, that's really like structural violence if you do something for people and if you don't do it with them. And that's, again, a constant pattern which we see everywhere. Also, in regards to women's space, I did field work in India on uh, did the digital inclusion of women. And there were many spaces created by men, uh, and there was a lot of pink content and not not, you know, content which was adequate uh, for women in this sphere. And I could go on and on, but I think my last point has to do with the values and, again, related to funding, which was already mentioned by all of us, I think. Um, when we did f do field work in many different countries, we've been in 26 countries at the Better Place Lab and looked at social startups, and we see amazing solutions to real problems, you know, on the ground in, uh, uh, across the world. But we always see such a huge lack of funding uh, because it's not the most valuable in terms of money and profit. It's not the, that way you can squeeze out most profits. So when I look at the kind of world I want to create in the internet, in the digital global space, I really think, you know, I want to look at values. I want to see how can we come up with really the values which we need in order also to save the planet. And they have to do with inclusion. They have to do with multi-perspectivity, taking different points of view into account. And so this uh, discussion about marginalized populations is not something marginal, but really is at the core of the new world system I hope we all want to create. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. And now we'll go to Vincent Bagheer, who's a permanent secretary, Ministry of ICT and National Guidance for Uganda. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for a moment, I thought I was going to be marginalized as uh, the only male on the panel, but then I got a colleague here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I come from government, and uh, I'll just give a government perspective from, uh, from Uganda. And indeed, it is true, uh, governments do everything to digitize our services. We address infrastructure and access, but at the same time, when we, when, we, when we provide infrastructure, we want to see to it that there is a usage of the infrastructure and all the services that come with it. And indeed, as we do the deployments and uh, deliver ICT across the country, we create more divide in one way or the other. Uh, you create more, you, you, you don't, you want to do digital inclusion, but at the end of the day you find yourself basically just uh, increasing the digital divide. And uh, in so doing, as policymakers, we find ourselves reinventing policies at all times. I'll give examples. We have a policy in the country where students can be examined for ICT at what we call ordinary level and advanced level. But unfortunately, the schools in rural areas, deep in the rural areas, do not have access to computers. And we've tried as much as possible to use what we regard as universal access funds to create that uh, access for the students to be able to indeed study computing and also be a part and parcel of uh, those who can learn computing and skills and so on. But the computers that we provide are indeed not enough. I was in a rural place uh, just two days ago just to get the experience uh, uh, before I traveled here. And the students had to wait. There's a school with around 200 students, and they only have 20 computers. And examining computing is practical. You can't just do it without, uh, you know, just as a theoretical. 
And then the students indeed have to wait till around midnight for them to finish exams because they do it in shifts. So those areas of digital inclusion are real, and those are things that uh, we need to, to deal with as uh, African countries. But beyond that, these, uh, as you can imagine, we are talking about studying computing in a school, but there are people who are disabled, they are deaf, uh, or they are, uh, they are blind. And indeed, you find that some of these, initially, we did not take care of. So we've had now to put together a policy for ICT for people with disability to ensure that, indeed, when we deploy computers in these schools, we take care of people with disability as well, so that we not just do computing for those who are able-bodied, but we provide computing services for also those who are disabled. And last but not least, of course, uh, the major challenge is as we digitize services uh, in the country, you find that there are people who cannot read and write in English, but they can read and write in their local dialect. Implying we need to localize the content to ensure that everybody is not left behind, as the saying goes, and as many people as possible access services that governments offer. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And then our final speaker is Rosin Yelyakov from Minister of Transport, IT, and Communications from Bulgaria. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to take part of this panel. It was supposed to be presented in another panel uh, regarding access and infrastructure, but I came not because of the gender balance on the left side, <laughs> but, uh, but, but because I think this topic is uh, very important and needs to be promoted um, as well, um, not not only speaking about ideas, but only uh, but uh, to show the best practices and the lessons learned. So that's the idea to to tell about the Bulgarian approach and uh, our achievements. Um, nowadays, the women account uh, for 52 percent of European population. Uh, yet hold only 15% of ICT-related jobs. The entry of more women into the ICT sector would boost the market where labor shortages are projected. The first edition of the Digital Women's Scoreboard shows that women's participation in digital technologies is lagging behind in several areas. Only one of the six ICT specialists and only one of the three graduates such, of, such as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are women. In 2019, the main results of the Women in Digital, your Digital Economy and Society scoreboard, shows that in Bulgaria, women are more active users of the internet and have higher digital skills than men. Moreover, in Bulgaria, the percentage of female ICT specialists is 26.5%, which is higher than the EU average 17.2. Women in Digital World has high on the agenda of the Bulgarian Presidency of the Council of EU of the first half of uh, 2018. We were the first ones focusing on the topic. The Bulgarian Presidency provided a platform for discussions and exchange of practices on the subject. Some events during the Bulgarian Presidency were uh, international conference, etc. Other forums that took place in Bulgaria during the recent uh, two years were a meeting of high-level group of gender equality, which was hosted in Sofia, cooperation within the European Institute of Gender Equality, which is focused on the uh, theme Women in Digital World, organization of an event of 62nd uh, session of the Commission on the Status of Women in the United Nations, in 2019, we have signed the EU Declaration of Commitment in Women in Digital alone, the other member states. Furthermore, we have a National Council for Gender Equality of the Council of Ministers. Other, other national initiatives that show our countries strive for more active participation of women in digital world are the Digital National Coalition, which abbreviation in Bulgaria sounds like the English abbreviation DNA. Uh, as a prominent representative of women engaged in digital technology in Bulgaria, empowering gender, which is a special focus for increasing entrepreneur 
neural skills among women aged 16 till 25, and women in technology, which is aimed to leadership in the digital industry. Uh, our concept is the Trinity. The Trinity, when the well-promoted national policy with consensus among the stakeholders and a good face, a good face, good women face, woman face, as a, a national digital champion to promote, uh, articulate with the audience is the trinity of the success. So we, we f are fostering this and the results are obvious. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I just have a couple of quick words. I didn't engage in any of them because, frankly, there's just not time. But for over two decades, I've been doing everything I can through various positions to bring the internet to every corner of the world. And I'm at times overwhelmed by how much more there still is to do. And at the same time, so impressed and so energized by the activities that are being undertaken. You know, the IGF is a, is a dialogue for platform on these issues. We're also a place for action. So, you know, in everything we do and everybody we talk to over the course of this week, we really should talk about concretely what can we do next to help make a difference, whether it's a human rights discussion or it's an access discussion or it's gender balance. Every one of us should be saying, what can we do tomorrow, what can we do next week, this year, to actually improve significantly on these? And we should be so impressed by the various activities that we heard about here on the panel this morning, and there are so many thousands and tens of thousands of more stories like that. Um, out there on the hall. So I really hope people do take that forward as we go, go forward here. Um, I need to wrap this up really quickly. I'd um, like to give the panel a round of applause, and then we'll all move quickly, and the next panel can come up. So I think we should all move quickly off the little dais here and invite the next panel up. And again, with great appreciation for everybody in this rapid pace. Can I ask the panelists for the next session to take their seats, please? No seating arrangements, please come up. Okay, so hello everyone. We are all operating under compressed time and challenging conditions, so please bear with us. Um, with our tightened time constraint, we, we don't have a lot of time for discussion. Definitely no exchanges uh, is going to be possible. So we would only have time for the input uh, from the panel. And I think that if we just try to be as concise as possible and as clear as possible, that would contribute to everyone's understanding in the room. So I'll start with just a few words um, about myself. My name is Rinalia Abdurrahim. I'm Senior Vice President for the Internet Society. In case you don't know about the Internet Society, we are a global nonprofit organization that works to strengthen the Internet and um, expand its reach. Uh, we believe in an Internet that is open, globally secure, 
um, globally connected, secure and trustworthy. Sorry, a lot of movement happening in this room. Please come up and take a seat. And I'm pleased to share that uh, today we've released um, our action plan for 2020 that basically contains projects that works towards a bigger and stronger internet, which we are quite excited about. Our session today will explore how to equip the 21st century workforce with digital skills and to ensure that no one is left behind. We have a large group of panelists and, um, and it is a panel that is focused on digital inclusion and focus on education and skills. I have asked the panelists to focus on three questions. It's quite broad and they are free to address any aspect of these uh, questions. The first one is, how do we equip the workforce of the 21st century with the necessary skills to take advantage of new employment opportunities that will result from digital transformation? The second question is, what kinds of initiatives can stimulate broadband use, digital literacy and skills development? And finally, what will work to address gender issues as well as the needs of the disadvantaged, disabled or vulnerable people, people living in low economic, socioeconomic conditions and with lower levels of education? So to start, I'd like to give the microphone to Ms. Lynette Magasa, who is CEO and founder of Boniswa Corporate Solutions. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Oh, sorry, good afternoon. Actually, um, I thought um, for, just to prepare the, uh, the workforce for the 21st century, it's very important that um, training of, um, you know, there should be a change and shift in training. Um, in such a way that it has to start from home. Um, if all the individual or the young ones are given a chance from home as part of the culture that um, they, they have access to internet, that will help and that will work quite well. Thank you. Thank you, very nice, short and sweet. The, <laughs> the next uh, speaker is Mr. Cedric Vachos, who is Chief of Section for ICT in Education, Science and Culture from UNESCO. Thank you so much, Rinalia. Um, a warm welcome to you all. Uh, UNESCO stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Uh, we do standard development, capacity development, policy development, and we also a laboratory of ideas. Uh, we, I will want to speak briefly about the skills which are needed in the future and how we go about uh, teaching these skills. Um, first, if you think about 21st century skills and which skills pupils need and learners need and people need in the future, this is formed, of course, uh, through a number of developments, including uh, artificial intelligence. And generally, if you speak about uh, skills, people speak about the four Cs, which are required in the future. Um, first, it is critical thinking um, and uh, problem solving. The second is creativity and innovation. And the third is communication. And the fourth is collaboration. These are general uh, skills which are often mentioned. We have developed, in view of AI, uh, a report and looked into more skills and looked into what is really um, necessary also in view of artificial intelligence uh, in the future. And if you look at that, you will see uh, that actually uh, learners in schools will need to learn more about coding and computational thinking. This is about having the skills to at least understand the principles around how code is created and the broad, uh, basic problem solving um, around and through algorithms. And secondly, uh, another area is data awareness and the capacity of building, manipulating and visualizing large amounts of data. And the third aspect is the capacity to think and act across silos and make interdisciplinary connections because as AI, as it currently stands, uh, is particularly strong in specific data-rich domain but has difficulty to understand and interpret context and make interdisciplinary connections. Um, now, how do we in UNESCO help uh, with these future skills? We have, of course, uh, we do policy and capacity development standard setting and are facilitating uh, international cooperation in formal and non-formal um, education. So in formal education, we assist countries in developing policies, teacher education, and curriculum, curricula. For example, we have developed a third version of the competency framework for teachers, that is the competency teachers need in the future, which includes AI and some of the aspects I just mentioned. 
Um, just in non-formal education to close, um, uh, we have different programs which reach also out to youth and particularly girls. We have a youth mobile program where uh, youth is, training, is trained to develop applications which div um, address local sustainable development challenges and we have particular trainings also for girls in this area. And we work, for example, in the Africa Code Week with SAP and other partners in 39 countries to teach youth coding. These are examples on how um, we move forward, how we assess the new and future skills, but also how we work on formal and non-formal education to integrate that. Thanks. Thank you, Cedric. Next is Mr. Nikolai Astrup, Minister of Digitalization from Norway. Well, thank you so much um, for inviting me to this panel. Um, I think it's true for any country that digital dividends coexist with digital divides. Um, and I think skills is key to uh, maximize the dividends and minimize the divides. Now, um, I think the educational system is going to be important. We need more experts, yes, but we also need more interdisciplinary skills. So we need to stop, for instance, sending our future doctors to medical schools without also learning them about AI and big data and sensor technology. Same goes for nurses. I recently visited a farm in Norway and I learned that 98% of Norwegian cows are now online. So even if you want to be a farmer, you can't escape technology. So it goes to show that the educational system needs to be interdisciplinary. Um, I also believe that that's not going to be enough because lifelong learning is going to be crucial. We need to invest more in um, the people who are in work uh, today. Uh, and uh, that's not the job for governments alone. We need public-private partnerships to make that happen on a large scale. And we need to think, I think, outside the box of sort of traditional educational programs and more short courses that can ramp up uh, skills fast. Now, I've also had the pleasure of being a member of the UN High-Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. And as the UN Secretary General has been uh, clear on, we will not reach the Sustainable Development Goals without the use of new technology and digitalization. Um, but in order to do that, we, we need more connectivity. Um, so we need to make sure that the people have access to the internet, but also that the internet is relevant to people all over uh, the world. And we need to do something about the barriers to entry that exist today. So for instance, in South Saharan Africa, we know that 54% of the population have access to broadband, uh, but only 24% use it. So why is that? Uh, I'm very happy that uh, one of the report's uh, recommendations on, on connectivity for all adults and especially uh, access to basic financial and health services is being followed up by the ITU and, and UNICEF uh, that are launching a common bid for connectivity. That will be helpful, I think. Another recommendation from the uh, panel's report is to establish help desks uh, to help governments on these uh, difficult policy and technical questions that we're all grappling with uh, and um, uh, that are going to be even more important going forward. Now, um, another important recommendation is um, around digital public goods. Um, so it's about creating an alliance and a platform uh, for digital public goods, um, a go-to place for discovering, using, adapting, uh, creating and financing uh, digital public goods, i.e. Um, technologies, data sets that are useful for others, uh, open source, um, and that can be adapted to local cir circumstance uh, uh, elsewhere. There are many examples of this. Uh, let me just mention a couple that Norway has been involved in. The Global Digital Library, which is learning material, free for all, uh, now in 100 languages. Uh, we are expanding to 300 languages um, to make um, learning material uh, available, but also to make sure that it's available in a local uh, language. Uh, weather data is another example. Uh, the Health Information Systems Program is now in use by more than 100 country, uh, countries with a global footprint of 2.3 billion people. That's an example of a global digital good. And let me also mention uh, the Indian uh, ID system, Adahar, which is uh, open source and is now, the World Bank is now helping uh, Morocco to make use of of the, this technology uh, and, uh, and introduce uh, digital IDs to, to Morocco. So uh, this alliance is going to be important. Uh, we now cooperate with UNICEF, Sierra Leone, and the Indian think tank, ISPRIT. And I hope that many more countries and companies will join the alliance to make sure that this becomes a success and ensure that countries and uh, actors in all over the world don't have to reinvent the wheel 
in order to make use of the digital technologies that already exist. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Lucas Coleman, uh, HR Director from Henkel AG. So thank you. So I'm uh, working for Henkel, global player, one of 20, we're active in 120 countries, and I'm responsible for the global HR strategy. So when we interact with our employees and uh, we talk about digitalization of our workforce, I th I, we see it from two angles. The first angle is that we want to digitize our systems and processes fully. So whenever our employees interact with the company, they should do it in a digital way. Secondly, it's about human digitalization. So we need to offer to employees the right programs to upskill, to get the knowledge they need today, but also for tomorrow, in order to excel also in the digital area. Um, and here comes the problem we face as uh, any other corporation. And uh, the way we tackle is that cloud solutions can here play here a big role. We need to enable them uh, to have access to what we offer to them. And here cloud solutions with the, enable, with the possibility to have easy access to systems with private email address. You don't need necessarily a corporate email address or a corporate device to enter the system is one way. That brings me to the second topic because, we, as I said, we're active in 120 countries around the globe. We have uh, from board, for sure, down to blue collars, everything in our company. And we, for sure, need also enable our production workers uh, to enter our system. And here, as a corporation, we have the responsibility to offer all our employees also the possibility to have a device at a fair price, at a cheap price, to get access to our systems, tools, and especially also to our learning offers, which we target at them. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person is Mrs. Anna Maria Braun, Managing Director of B. Braun Melsungen AG. Thank you. Yes, B. Brown SE is a medical device company with 63,000 employees across the world and a strong focus on manufacturing. And first, I would like to point out, we discussed future skills that are needed and maybe uh, that what we need to implement in the educational systems, the skills are needed now. We need the digital skills now to work with the digital technologies. And just as you said, across the entire board, it's not a question of uh, the production line being automized and need, needing to advance their skills. It's really in every area, whether it's finance, controlling the quality lab, and uh, this we provide, of course, with uh, platforms, learning platforms, and teaching our employees, but I want to raise or highlight one point that I think can be a big limiting factor, and that is the human factor, because the worry of the existing workforce, what will happen to my job, and how uh, can you ask someone to implement digital technologies if they are worried that afterwards, or with a new process, their job is gone? And this is where we try to work on making it very transparent what uh, the process is needed for, and to highlight where they still play a role, because this will be key and vital that humans are still needed to analyze uh, the data, for example, or to manage the exceptions. And being in the healthcare industry, one key element that links maybe back to the discussion on inclusion or diversity is that we see that the data we collect now can be, of course, very biased. And this is a danger, and with all the opportunities we have, with the data collection and opportunities, especially in health management, we need to ensure that our employees or that everyone is aware of this and we can manage the data well to avoid that prejudice that we have in the analog world is transferred to the digitized world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Mr. Hans-Jürgen Bill, Chief Human Resources Officer from Nokia. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, Nokia probably is the one who is, who is building the networks and the base for everything we're talking about here. So for 5G now, or, and uh, mobile networks, and fixed networks, and IP networks. So we have 100,000 employees around, across the world, and you might think, okay, we are a high-tech company, and we should know everything. Our engineers should know everything, but we're hiring 6,000 people, 6,000 engineers every year. And uh, we need to focus now on artificial intelligence. We need to focus on data science and machine learning. So what we have introduced, I just wanted to share, is a so-called learning index for our employees. Uh, the question was, how do we make learning attractive for everyone. Even for engineers coming from the uni university thinking we know everything. They don't know anything. And our, our environment is changing so fast that there is a constant lifelong learning needed. So we have done, we have introduced this learning index. is a digital tool which shows employees in a in a score system, how much learning they have done in the last time. What we have seen is that after we have introduced it, 
uh, a year later, we saw almost 50% increase of learning hours for the employees. We have 80% of our learning is digital learning today, so you can do it from everywhere. It's, uh, it's augmented reality, it's virtual reality. You can do it from everywhere, and you have a scoring system, so you see definitely how you improve. It led to a situation that we have today 77% of our employees are really using this system, almost on a weekly base. And this is absolutely necessary in order to get them. Of course, now the challenge is how do we get the 20%, the remaining 20% into this direction. So this is one, at least one example how you can make learning attractive, which we think is absolutely necessary. Thank you very much. Next is Under Secretary Mirella Liuzzi. She comes from the Italian Ministry of Economic Development and she will speak in the Italian language. Yes. And there is an interpreter, okay. yes? Okay. Thank you. Uh, vorrei, per rispondere alla, alla domanda riguardo alle iniziative per l'inclusione digitale vorrei parlare di due iniziative del Ministero dello Sviluppo Economico che oggi rappresento. La prima iniziativa è un progetto che si chiama Italia Piazza Wi-Fi. L'idea è quella di concedere e dare ai cittadini italiani una possibilità di connettersi ad internet in modo gratuito tramite l'identità digitale è um, un modo anche per uh, sviluppare l'inclusione digitale tramite uh, processi gratuiti e aperti. So, hello everybody. Uh, to answer to the question, I would like, um, regarding the initiatives that we're um, planning, I'd like to draw, your attention to, yeah, to draw your attention to two different things that we're doing. The first one is called Piazza Wi-Fi Italia. This is what we call it in Italy. Um, it's an initiative that is meant to give all Italian citizens the possibility to have a free internet access, free of cost, free of charge, and this is a way of having the real inclusion we are talking about, inclusion into the internet for everyone. La seconda iniziativa riguarda la Casa delle Tecnologie Emergenti sul modello UK dei Digital Catapult, ovvero dei centri di, uh, di aggregazione tecnologica nelle città dove già si sperimenta in Italia il 5G per lavorare a uh, piani di intelligenza artificiale, blockchain ed internet delle cose. L'idea è quella di avvicinare tramite questi hub tecnologici fisici sparsi su tutto il territorio nazionale uh, start-up, uh, PMI e uh, anche organizzazioni e amministrazioni locali che vogliono investire e innovare uh, grazie e tramite le nuove tecnologie che abbiamo a disposizione. And the second initiative is what we call Casa delle Tecnologie Emergenti, which is the casa, it's, it's the centers, it's the houses, the homes of the new technologies. Uh, these are centers for technology transfer, and they are uh, going to be put in place where in the cities where we already have the 5G net. So we can have this possibility to offer to startups and SMEs who want to invest in the field um, blockchain, IoT, that is Internet of Things, and all these important things that they can then use uh, to be present with their activities. Thank you very much. And finally, um, Mr. Günther Braunig, Braunig, sorry, Chairman of Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau. Yeah, thank you. Um, having listened to the previous panel, I should have probably been on the other panel because there was so much talk about the lack of funding, in particular in Africa, that I wanted to at least say a few words on this because it's one of our prime missions uh, to do development work in 35 countries in Africa. And we have a portfolio of about 20 billion euros there. And uh, it is going to be uh, really our mission to continue our work and uh, intensify our work in Africa. We're still in the basic needs uh, very often in our projects in Africa. It comes to, to infrastructure, to energy, to uh, transportation, to uh, building roads. Uh, so the digital agenda is something that will follow up on it. And we have our first uh, pilot projects like um, uh, an e-learning program in Malawi or uh, a blockchain program in uh, Burkina Faso. So we have the first, uh, the first steps there. but. I think, uh, as, as we said in the previous panel, there's uh, still uh, um, 
still uh, a big uh, demand to fight poverty uh, and inequality in Africa, and these are our basic programs where a lot of our pro uh, programs go to. Um, at the same time, uh, digitization for our company ourselves is, is a big challenge as banking uh, is going to be fully digitized. And so it is also our job to, uh, to upskill our people with the skills that you mentioned uh, in, in the technological area, in the soft skills that are different from what we used to have, in the ability uh, to, to run um, scrum teams uh, in, in IT development projects. So there's a lot of to do in, inside the company and also the education uh, is, and the upskilling is different. We learn today different than we uh, were used to learn as we, we learn continuously uh, through webinars. In the, the whole e-learning is, is different from how I learned to, uh, to get myself uh, developed. And so uh, we try to get the whole company, but as you said, um, you have to uh, also overcome uh, skepticism. Um, you have to, to bring everybody on the agile agenda. And so uh, we are on the same track when it comes to, uh, to get into the digitized world. Thank you very much. We were given a very short amount of time to do this session. And again, I apologize. It's something that is out of our control. But one thing that I'd like to comment on is that um, in 2003 and 2005, we had the World Summit on the Information Society. At that summit, we identified the challenges of access, bridging the digital divide, challenges enabling connectivity, essentially, the problem of enabling lifelong learning, the challenge of uh, having effective public-private partnerships and multi-stakeholder partnerships to address all the challenges and the all the opportunities that digital technologies have brought forward. And the solutions are many, as you could hear from this panel, but the challenge is how, how do we enable more people to know about what's been experimented upon, what's worked, under what context, so that that can be scaled up in other situations and geographic area. And also, how do we make sure that partnerships become really, really active um, and effective at the international level. And I think the IGF could take a role in, f in drawing out all these examples and making them available and then enabling or facilitating a process of forming the partnerships that can bring the solutions to people and areas, um, communities that need it. So I apologize again for the limitations of this session. I thank you for your contribution. I think we're expected back in the main hall now. Thank you very much.
first session after the mic. Is this one working? This works. This works. This works. Ooh. Yes, I would say uh, that those people who were on team one should take the seat uh, at the front, and anybody else who fits from the rest of the group can join us as well. And then we can rotate out after the first hour. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for showing up after lunch so promptly. It's a challenge. I am William Drake from the University of Zurich uh, in Switzerland. And this is NetMundial Plus Five, the legacy and implications for future internet governance. It's a session sponsored by uh, CGI.br, who were, of course, the secretariat of the NetMundial meeting five years ago, as well as three German-based organizations, EuroSIG, the European Summer School, um, DINIC, and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. Um, in April 2014, for those who don't recall, Representatives of governments and stakeholders from around the world uh, came together in Sao Paulo, Brazil to negotiate the Net Mundial Statement on Global Internet Governance. Uh, the statement was a non-binding, bottom-up, open and participatory uh, created document, uh, which was really a first of its kind um, that was intended to help shape the evolution of the internet governance ecosystem. The statement had two parts, uh, one which was a set of internet governance principles and the other which included a so-called roadmap for the future evolution of internet governance. Um, at the time, for those of you who were around back then, you will remember that the Net Mundial was a big deal. Um, it came on the heels of the ITU, the International Telecommunication Unions, World Conference in International Telecom, where we had the biggest diplomatic catastrophe in the history of international communications policy um, and a breakdown of cooperation that resulted in a, a treaty that half the members didn't support um, and the Snowden revelations. So it was a very tense time uh, and uh, Fadi Shahadi, who was at that point the uh, CEO of ICANN, went to Brazil to meet with the Brazilian president Dilma Rousseff after she'd given a speech in the UN General Assembly calling for a new multilateral approach to internet governance to convince her that we should have a multi-stakeholder meeting to try to sort all these things out. And it really was an important thing. It was the first real multi-stakeholder decision-making type process on broad internet governance. That is to say, not just names and numbers and the things managed by the ISTAR community, the technical infrastructure and so on, but also a wide range of other issues as well. And of course, since then, we have had a number of other efforts to do multi-stakeholder initiatives of various kind, many of which are being announced at this uh, event. So we had, uh, I would call them multi-stakeholderism by invitation. Uh, they were generally uh, projects uh, that produced reports with recommendations and things like that. You've had things like the, the Guterres high-level panel, uh, the, the Internet and Jurisdiction Projects uh, outputs, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, uh, and various others that are releasing reports here. Uh, but the Net Mondial was a real open, bottom-up decision-making process where a text was adopted. Uh, come on up if you want, Janet. Um, right off the plane. Um, uh, where we actually did something in the way of making decisions on a multi-stakeholder basis. What we've seen evolve since then mostly has been more like intergovernmentalism plus, which is to say intergovernmentalism with a greater level of multi-stakeholder input 
but in terms of multi-stakeholder decision making, not much has really happened. So it really seemed like it didn't make sense to let the Net Mundial's five-year anniversary go by without commenting on it and reflecting on what it uh, indicated for the future evolution of internet governance. And the IGF is the right place to have this conversation, obviously, in particular because I would argue some of the techniques pioneered in the Net Mundial could well be adopted by the IGF to great uh, ends. So uh, we decided to have this session. The purpose is not to have a bunch of veterans of the meeting sit around telling war stories to each other <laughs> about what happened, although that's tempting, um, but rather to try to look forward and assess what is the longer term implications of this, what have we done or not done to try to make the, the Net Mundial process a substantial living thing in some manner rather than just a one-off event. To do that, we've decided to split the session into two halves. The first half will be chaired by my friend Wolfgang Kleinvector. Uh, that will look back at the meeting because some people here were not at the meeting. And even if you were at the meeting, you might need your memory refreshed as to what happened. So the first chunk of time we're going to spend talking about the Nut Mundial uh, event itself. Um, and then after that, we'll turn over to me and we will have a second part that's more forward looking. So we have two different teams of people uh, participating, and uh, on, on the first, yeah, it's, it's fine. By the way, I also want to mention uh, we have here uh, Mona Badran from the Cairo University as our remote moderator. If there are any people online who want to pose questions, uh, Mona will read them out to us when we come to that part of the session. So what we're going to do until uh, 1345 is talk about the Net Mundial meeting and the Net Mundial statement. And the lead participants on that uh, will be, and do we have the slides now? Are the slides showable? Uh, I put a PowerPoint slide in there. Where, did the guy leave? Ah, okay. And how do I go back? All right. So, all right. So, no, I'm good. So you can see here the list of participants: Carlos Afonso from Brazil. Fiona Alexander, formerly U.S. government, now academic. Vince Cerf, of course, from Google. Raul Echeverria wrote to me. Uh, he's going to be a little bit late. Henriette Esterhuizen is in the front row there and will come up later. Hartwood uh, Glasser from CGI.br. Jeanette Hoffman, who's next to me. Uh, Nana Nawakana, I always have trouble with her last name, who is also late but is coming. And Christoph Steck from Telefonica, all of whom were heavily involved in the process at the time. Um, and we're going to break into two teams. So on the first team uh, that will ha take the lead on the first part of the discussion, we have Hartmut, Raul, uh, Raul's not here yet, Carlos, Nena, who's, not, who's coming, and Christoph. So I turn it over to Wolfgang to uh, moderate this part of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And more or less, Bill has already summarized you know, the background of the Net Mundial, where it came from, and what we are planning to do here. And I remember also that uh, the whole conference was driven to a certain degree by the uh, Snowden case. And if uh, you remember, there were two prominent cases with interception into uh, telephones. That was the President of Brazil and the Chancellor of Germany. And that's why, you know, Germany and Brazil became in a certain way united in looking for uh, reactions and, 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 you know, moving forward. And, you know, one concrete outcome from this, this is partly forgotten, is not only the two documents which emerged from the Net Mundial Conference itself, but it, uh, the outcome was a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly which produced the, the new position of the Special Rapporteur for Privacy in the Digital Age. That means the reports which are now have stimulated the debate in the last three, four years from uh, Professor Katanaki, you know, are a result of this uh, German-Brazilian joint initiative. And that's why, you know, uh, our idea was uh, to start with two very brief interventions of the CEOs and or former CEOs of the registry of the two countries uh, which are managing the domain name system. And I would invite uh, first Jörg Schweiger from uh, Germany and then Hartmut Lasa uh, from Brazil to think, uh, to reflect a little bit about this, uh, um, uh, their approach and their reflection about it. And then we move into more the concrete details of uh, how uh, Net Mundial uh, was uh, 
uh, made. And uh, I'm also very happy that Jeanette is here because she was a member of the um, team who really drafted the document. And it would be very good if you could recollect your experiences in how to uh, uh, really formulate and draft a document in a multi-stakeholder environment. I think these are skills which are more than ever needed in, 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 in the years ahead of us. So, uh, Jörg, uh, could you just uh, make some uh, short... Um, well, thank you, Wolfgang. I wasn't aware of the fact that I'm going to get such a prominent role and be the first one to uh, state something on, on Net Mondial. Well, um, to get back to the, the, the major point, what has Net Mondial really done for us? And I think the, the most important point that Net Mondial really done was to pave the way on showing us how a process for governments, governance on and of the internet could be shaped. And that for sure is a multi-stakeholder process. And furthermore, given the uh, global nature of the internet and the world's different jurisdictional frameworks and cultures, what Net Mundial described in addition for me was a way forward on how we can really achieve results. And these results actually are values, values we can refer to, result, values that are respected and accepted. And one thing we do have to do right now is build, build on these values we have been digging up at Net Mundial. Thank you. Probably I need to start with CGI first, uh, because CGI was one of the organizers of the event in Brazil. CGI is the multi-stakeholder uh, governance model in Brazil. Uh, we have 21 members on the board of CGI. We start 96 with this model, and CGI take care not only of the domain names and the assignment of IP addresses, but we have also other activities related to the internet, as in security department, department for statistics, uh, uh, and center for the development of applications in the web. And uh, Fadi uh, called us if we are ready to be partner in this Net Mondial activity. Uh, he visited uh, Dilma in September or yeah, September, October 2013, and then we decide together to organize this event. I take over the Brazilian side. CGI uh, supported uh, the expenses, half of the expenses, the other half of ICANN. And I need to, st to tell that Brazil 2009 decided to publish uh, 10 principles for the use of the internet. And we, on this time, when the Snowden affair starts 2013, we already have our proposal running in the, in the Congress that our uh, principles will be probably a new bill of rights for the internet for the Brazilian users. And this was a very good model because uh, 2013, 2014, uh, the Snowden affair pushed uh, this movement in a very, let's say, uh, aggressive way, so that on the opening uh, speech to, in April 2014, our president was able to officially announce that we have now a new Bill of Rights. And this was, let's say, the beginning of Net Mondial, April 2014. Another strong difference, uh, because we are a multi-stakeholder model, we use uh, also a multi-stakeholder discussion model. We have four different lines in the auditorium, uh, uh, one line for government, one line for uh, industry, one line for academics and technical people, and one line for the NGOs and the activists. And uh, everyone needs to wait before it was his turn. So we use a very, let's say, dynamic process. We have more than 50 hubs connected 
overseas from all parts of the world, so that we have probably uh, three, four, five hundred uh, people participating uh, from overseas. In the total, we have thousand people present in Sao Paulo, and uh, all the discussion was not only was not only during the two days. The discussion starts sixty days before, because everyone could send proposals. We, ha we have a platform. This platform was uh, every two, three days uh, uh, reviewed and sent again to our participants. So when we start with the event, uh, the first day, we already have 90% of the conclusion ready, and then the final negotiation uh, run during the two days. Uh, my big surprise, uh, because we have the principles already used in Brazil, that we have more than 100 countries present, and that we have a very good final agreement on the uh, Sao Paulo Declaration. And now we have this document, let's say five years old, and we can compare what happens in 2014 and what we can do now in 2019. My, my personal uh, feeling is that this was the first time that we have this amount of uh, countries coming together to discuss the best way how we can use the internet in a very, let's say, cooperation manner. The multi-stakeholder model is uh, a winner, it's a win-win solution for everyone, and our dream is that we, in the next five years, can see more progress coming uh, using this model. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hartmut. And, you know, if you look backwards, sometimes you see only after a couple of years clearer what was the outcome? And if I look backwards the last 20 years, I see we had some milestones in the never-ending process towards internet governance. And the, uh, uh, the first milestone was certainly the definition of internet governance in the Tunis agenda, which introduced the principle of multi-stakeholder approach. But at this time in Tunis 2005, nobody you know, uh, had really a clear and precise understanding what the principle means, what multi-stakeholderism is. And the big achievement of Net Mundial in my eyes was with the eight principles and the very specific specification, you know, what a multi-stakeholder approach is, is that the uh, Net Mundial gave us a definition of what multi-stakeholder approach means. So this is very concrete and in so far I'm very happy that Janet is here because she was part of the drafting team who produced the language, and uh, even Janet is part of the second team, I think this would be the right moment that uh, Janet uh, a little bit recollects her experiences with you know, how such a document could be produced in this multi-stakeholder environment. And by the way, I just want to point out, I put on the slide yeah. here, the information from Joanna's chapter, uh, uh, the number of participants, the online consultations, the comments, so you get a sense for what the buildup of this was. It was a very big, uh, multi-global, open, bottom-up process. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, Indeed, the, the outcome documents were the result of several drafting processes, some of them starting way before the meeting. Then uh, in the days before the meeting, we had the first uh, drafting process at the venue. Then we had a public drafting process that I think had five lines because also remote participation had its own slot. And I found that quite efficient, that we had very sort of short speaking slots, and they moved from stakeholder to stakeholder to remote participation. So the documents went through several loops, and in the end, we had a non-public drafting session, which I found most interesting. It was chaired by Henriette and me. Henriette um, chaired, hmm? You chaired um, the, uh, the drafting of the principles, and I think I chaired the, the uh, roadmap. But what really matters, I think, that it was new for the internet governance space, for governments and non-governmental actors to coming together and really agree on a text. Um, that might have happened before in other global governance areas. Perhaps environmental policy is more used to this because it started much earlier, but for the internet governance area, that was really new. And 
Um, I would say that we actually managed this, had a lot to do with friendly governments, among them the Brazilian governments, who made it clear to us what sort of the corridor for a document would be. It had to be based on agreed language. We couldn't go beyond language agreed in UN documents. We, as NGO and academic people, did not know exactly what agreed language would be. We were really dependent on people who would tell us what kind of uh, history of documents was there we could build on. And that wasn't always easy. I remember that particularly language surrounding mass surveillance it was very important for civil society to get this in, also for the whole human rights uh, community being present, but there was only limited language that we could use. So we were negotiating texts again and again and again. And I remember that the Brazilian government helped us very much by also calling people and uh, who were more privy with the documents and made it clear to us what we could agree upon. I learned a lot also technically from this meeting because I understood how documents are actually developed and how you make progress. So for the people uh, being involved in this process, that was really, really interesting. And this, I would say the sad part of the story is that we could not practically build on this in the way of that we repeated this and sort of started innovation process for other venues. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and another person who was involved in making uh, the document was uh, Carlos uh, Afonso. He was a member of the uh, board of CCIBR. Yeah. And uh, so, um, Carlos, um, can you reflect a little bit about yes, this well, history? Uh, I'll try. Hi, everyone. I, I will try to avoid repeating uh, things that have already been said and will be said. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I, I, list, I listed in an article I wrote for the Wolfgang's book, which you all received, uh, 14 initiatives, processes, or events uh, related to internet governance from 2012. Most of them are ongoing, not, not, not stopped, like the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which started just before uh, the Net Mundial. But the, the ones that are ongoing all had uh, received, in some way, the impact of how Net Mundial was organized, the, the methodology, the way uh, uh, the, the organization of uh, remote participation was created and was established, and the methodology of accumulating information before the event and synthesizing the information and the opinions of so many people, hundreds of uh, opinions, to try to consolidate in a document to be submitted to that multi-stakeholder event in really equal participation. Like Fadi uh, Shehade like it to say, multi-equal stakeholder, which is very difficult to achieve. But we, at least in the discussions in the Net Mundial event, we achieved that. You know? uh, and uh, I, I would like to, to, to since I, I know that you are going to comment on all other aspects, one aspect of the, the documents of Net Mundial, which was, was quite interesting, considering the participation of so many governments in the, in the event and in, in the uh, production of that document, which is that uh, it specifically says that the uh, multi-stakeholder participation should go all the way up to and including decision making. And this is clear in the Net Mundial document, very clear. And the question is, after five years, is this, has this been achieved on a country by country basis, on a government by government basis? How, how, how far can the multi stakeholder process go to regarding decision making? You know? And perhaps one of the answers is how governments are tolerating or accepting advocacy from other sectors, from civil society, from the private sector, from the acad academia, in the elaboration, in the decision on their decision-making processes. 
uh, if this is achieved in a, in a meaningful and effective way, we are responding to that agreement of the Net Mundial document in 2014. Thanks. I thank you, Carlos. I think, indeed, Net Mundial was a pacemaker, but uh, looking backwards, I see a different differentiation in how many stakeholders see uh, the Net Mundial really as a success, and as I say, yeah, it was just a drop in the ocean. For instance, you know, the excitement is still on the side of the civil society, of the academic persons, also some technical groups are excited. Uh, private sector is, has a little bit mixed feeling, and governments, also if you look in the room now, there is only a very small number of governmental representatives here in the room at the moment. And when we tried already to organize some sessions in the last IGF in Paris, uh, you know, the reaction from governments was rather low. And to give you just a personal experience from September this year, when I was sitting in a meeting of the open-ended working group in the General Assembly of the United Nations, where they now just reinvent the participation of non-state actors in intergovernmental elaborations if it comes to cybersecurity. So that means if the governments are amongst themselves, so they have still five years after Net Mundial, a problem to open the door in a reasonable way to non-state actors. And in so far, the experiences of Net Mundial should be revitalized so, and, and, and present as a good example because this, the outcome was very constructive and it was not you know, destructive or it blocked further developments. And in so far, I'm very happy that uh, one representative of the private sector, Christoph from Telefonica, uh, is here also on the panel because Telefonica was very helpful both during Net Mundial and also afterwards. Uh, Christoph, what is your, your, your memory about Net Mundial? Well, th first of all, thanks for the invitation. And, uh, and I think my memory is quite good. Um, I think that uh, in its time, uh, it was really a miracle that Net Mundial somehow came together. I mean, we, we forget these things that five years from today, I mean, it's like in internet, everything's like three times as fast, so it's like you know, a whole generation already. But, but it was a very specific time um, for the internet as well. I mean, there was after the Snowden revelations, um, there was, I think, the first kind of really huge wake-up call that some things were happening and, and people were not so happy about it. And, and so the question was, what can we do about it? And the situation in international politics was like today. I mean, it's not really working fast if it's working at all. So um, we looked for solutions. I think there was an idea in the room um, created by, by, by Fadi and ICANN and so on. And I think it was really a, a huge... Um, achievement by, by CGI and the Brazilian community to kind of take that idea and bring it down into something that had structure and a process. And I think that was also the reason why, for example, the private sector got interested in the whole process and also governments were interested because there was some form of structure. There was something you could, you know, basically there were some form of groups working on something, there were texts coming out and so on. And I think that was, that was really the, the, the key experience. It was uh, and this is not to diminish the IGF and what's happening here is fantastic, but it has a different role. The idea was to create something written, some form of principles, as you said, Wolfgang, to, to say what is multi-stakeholder? What is it really? Because everyone used that word and no one really could really define it. You know? and, and I think that was the key, key thing coming out. The principles, if you look at the principles, they're still totally valid. At least you know, the first part of the document, I think it has quite a timeless character. I mean, what's in there is still valid. You can read it today and we'll say, yes, fine. And still, today, most stakeholders would agree that these are the principles. So I think that's, that's the, key, uh, the key outcome for me, that using a multi-stakeholder organization like CGI, uh, well connected, of course, to the government, understanding also the governmental multilateral world, bringing in, uh, really, as far as possible, people from around the world, working on one document. I mean, look at these numbers, uh, 1,300 people. I mean, that's like half of the people here today working on one document. I mean, the, the, the energy was amazing. There was quite an energy. And, um, and also quite, it was challenging. And I mean, <laughs> I know that the ones who were drafting, they, they, they had a very, very hard time. But um, I think in the end, the, the outcome is really worth it. And, and I feel that um, you know, some of these things, like the queuing in line, uh, equal footing, um, three minutes speaking time, 
I mean, all these kind of things, they were really quite nice, and people liked them, even governments liked them. Uh, I still remember, you know, some governments, very powerful governments, staying in line, waiting their turn, that, you know, uh, whatever other government was, was speaking, you know, three minutes, uh, and the same happening in all, this, uh, all, the, um, all the stakeholder groups. So, uh, for me, it was a huge achievement, and, and I really hope that some of these um, learnings can flow into what we now call the IGF+, Plus. I mean, maybe the next level of the, of the IGF. Thanks, Christoph. And uh, you represented a private sector, and the technical community was very crucial at, at this moment. And I remember that just a couple of months before the Sao Paulo conference in Montevideo, there was a big meeting where the ISTAR organizations uh, came together and said, we have a big trust problem. And, and, and I think it was the Montevideo statement which triggered to a high degree also uh, finally the Net Mundial. So that means the initiative came from the uh, technical community which said, okay, we can uh, survive with the internet only if we have this trusted network and we have to rebuild trust. And Raul was at this time, you know, a key player in the technical community. This was your home country. Raul Echeverria, thank you for coming and joining us here. And so we want to know something from your memory. <clears throat> thank you, Wolfgang. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, so, um, as you mentioned, the Montevideo statement was a happy moment for the iStar community. Uh, because we arrived to the meeting, okay, I didn't arrive because I was already there, but uh, when, when we got together for the, for the meeting, everybody had something similar in mind. Okay, that's the time. That's the time we, we need to say something because we need to make the things to move uh, in order to make progress on the, in the IANA transition. Um, so that was a very happy moment, but uh, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the following two weeks, uh, a lot of things happened in part because uh, we didn't know the plans of um, uh, Fadi Chehade to invite uh, Dilma Rousseff to organize the, uh, the meeting, Net Mundial. And there were a lot of discussion in Bali during the IGF, and so uh, Virgilio invited me and, and Demi Gechko to co-chair the executive committee of Net Mundial. So it was, uh, I had to take a decision because I was a little upset uh, with uh, some parts of the processes after the Montevideo statement but so we had to decide, uh, okay, what do we do? We just stay away from this meeting because it's not our meeting and we commit ourselves and do what, what we can achieve. Uh, fortunately, we uh, took the decision to, uh, to, to be part of the meeting, in part because uh, Virgilio Almeida, who was the chair of the, of the uh, Brazilian Internet Steering Committee at that time, was really a, a source of uh, trust. He was a kind of anchor in, in, the, in the trust anchor in the in the in the process, so I felt very confident. And he talked to me and to, to them and say, "You will lead the, the work of the executive committee. No restrictions. You all, you only have to to follow the those principles: inclusion, transparency, participation, all those all the things that we know." So it's a it's a first lesson that uh, when you try to to build a, a bottom up uh, process uh, without any antecedent because it was the first time that we were doing that it's always important to have a trust of anchor that can take decisions when needed so we escalated the uh, problems at, but somebody at at at, that, at some point Brazilio had to make consultations with other um, partners and and took the decisions and we took another decision that was very important, that uh, Demi and me agreed that we would depart uh, from the scratch, and we would not uh, start the process uh, based on an uh, already written uh, document. So, and it was a, a, a very important decision, I think, because that's the way that the community really felt involved in the process. The, we can say that the, that the document was really written uh, among thousand and something people. And, and we had to be very creative in the, in the, in the tools that so were needed in order to allow the participation of everybody. Other thing we, we decided is final dis discussions will happen during the meeting. It is not a kind of a governmental summit that when the, the people arrive into the, uh, into the meeting, the, so the, the documents are already uh, approved or adopted. So we wanted that the, the, the last round of discussions happen during the the, the, the meeting, so the meeting was really meaningful in the discussion. So there was a lot of lessons we learned in the, in the process. And um, I, 
I think that it was Wolfgang was speaking about the participation of different stakeholders uh, when I joined it. And I remember when um, uh, Benedicto, as the ambassador Benedicto Fonseca, he proposed the idea, that crazy idea of having the four uh, lines for to speak. I say, why? Because if not, the governments will not uh, probably will not feel enough uh, encouraged to participate to, to to speak. And so we didn't believe that really, but uh, we followed the Benedicto leadership and we accepted that. And what happened later? That's the 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 line of the governments was the line that had more people all the time, more people queued to speak. So I think that's, that uh, I remember Benedicto told me, I was hesitant if the, the governments would, be, would feel comfortable enough to speak, but let's see. <laughs> and, but I, probably that the idea was, I think that was a very practical thing, but that has a, 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 a huge implication, huge impact. And just to finalize, what we can learn from that, that still five years uh, after the, the Net Mundial meeting, there are things that we learn in the process that we have not applied enough yet. And in my comments uh, with regard to the digital cooperation um, it's, um, report and the, the uh, specifically about the IGF Plus, I, I included my recommendation that the, the, the Net Mundial style is the form that should have the, the high, high level meeting during the IGF. So if we could have a high level meeting at the end of IGF instead of at, at the beginning. With that format, where all the people, high-level people, is, uh, is really engaged in discussions, but meaningful discussions, and so I think that uh, we uh, could make a, a significant progress in the, in, in the production of outcomes. Remember, just to finalize, that the, uh, as far as I know, Net Mundial was the first time that outcomes were produced in a multi-stakeholder fashion without any formal negotiation, negotiation mechanism. What is really, I think, is amazing. I just want to add that the point that you're making about the linkage between the Net Mundial uh, methodology and the possible future of the IGF is something I want to probe in the second half of this session because it's something I've written about and I feel strongly too. The other thing, by the way, I just want to say, when you talk about the different lines that everybody had to wait for, the important point was the government people had to wait for the next line, right? The government people had to wait while the civil society people spoke, and then the technical community people spoke, and then the private sector people spoke, and then it came back to the government, which was, I think, very special. Anyway. Yeah, this was an interesting clash of cultures, but you know, this has innovated the processes, and we should really push for uh, this methodology because this would uh, you know, enrich the debate in the 2020. So we have 10 years ahead of us until we have the year 2030 with the Sustainable Development Goals. In between, we have the UN World Summit on the Information Society plus uh, 20. Uh, and, uh, but coming back and to close our uh, first part where we exchange memories, so I am very happy that Nana has now arrived because she gave such an emotional speech. And so uh, <laughs> President <laughs> Rousseff just, you know, uh, went to you and said thank you. And, you know, what are uh, about your emotions? You are still live with these emotions. And you can you repeat, you know, to heat the room now, you know, with your emotions. Nana, thank you for being back on the podium here. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. But this time I'm just coming from the launch of the contract for the web. Uh, I still have uh, strong emotions about the Net Mundial. And if you want to leave with something from here, it's S-O-N, the sun, the spirit of Net Mundial. Okay. I'm going to confess, I was really interested in Net Mundial because I'm a soccer fan. And I wanted to visit Brazil first, tour around before the World Cup, and get, get a number, get it registered, so that when I hit the ground during World Cup, I'm, re I'm operational at the same time. That was one of the reasons. Personal, OK? <laughs> But the other thing was that, if you recall, we were moving from MDGs to SDGs, and the negotiations was on. And those who were negotiating, you recall that we had the principle, or, or we wanted to call it transparency at that time, and we were fighting on it. It ended up being 
peaceful communities, goal 16 today, but we wanted that word transparency, we wanted rule of law in it and all of that. We did not get that, but we got the, the goal 16. Uh, so it was a point in time when everyone was saying something needed to be done around this. Um, then there is the work that CGI.br has done. I, I don't know if you've mentioned it while I was away. You know, all the time we've done the IGF, uh, because um, I want to pay homage to Anret, who is here. We had started the West Africa IGF, we had started regional IGFs here and there, and then we were struggling to let stakeholders at the regional and national levels understand that this is something that is multi-stakeholder. And we used to refer to what CGI.br CGI was doing, and then they pulled Net Mondial off, and we're like, heck, that is what you can do when you have a strong national IGF that is multi-stakeholder. So that, those, those were the emotions I was bringing. And then uh, the last one uh, was, I think it's been mentioned, when Dilma Rousseff signed the Marco Civil right there and then, I was like, yes, this is more of what we should be doing with IGF, decide something, work for it so that IGF will be a place where we can say, now we are ready to roll. So those were my emotions. And of course, I got, I got a hug from Dilma Rousseff. So that was great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nena. We have uh, for the first part still 10 minutes for Q&A. You know, there are some people in the room who have also their very personal memories if they want to add something. Uh, you know, I, I will go around with the micro. And please, at your comments, uh, it's Stefano. Okay, uh, this net mondial is this net mondial is uh, a unique uh, occasion to do something special. Stefano Trumpi. Uh, at the time, I, I was uh, still uh, representing the, my government uh, with uh, in ICANN. And, uh, and so I had to report and uh, what, what Net Mundial was, was something unique. Um, and then uh, this uh, uh, came one year before the United Nations has to decide how long to prolong the, net, uh, the, the, the IGFs. And then uh, they decided to prolong for 10 years. That was something really, really excep exceptional because uh, never had uh, so long uh, prosecution. So then uh, il, uh, the, the idea of, of uh, agreeing on a document was a, a very uh, important. Uh, um, also because uh, uh, the, um, the uh, opinions concerning the, uh, the IGFs was connected to the fact that apparently IGFs didn't make decisions and uh, as only for reaching best practices, let's say. So, in, in, and this is uh, this uh, exceptional value of Net Mundial. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, then is a closing of an era and starting another uh, time, because uh, then uh, uh, we have a, a start of internet fragmentation, we have uh, new technologies like uh, Internet of Things and other things, and, and so the uh, realm of, of the internet just uh, became a more and more complex, uh, let's say. Um, and uh, still in, uh, in the present, uh, the um, criticism concerning the, the life of uh, IGFs is connected to this uh, fact of uh, not going far more than best practices. And then uh, the, 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 especially the governments that understood the importance of the internet uh, also as uh, inside the country um, uh, and then uh, uh, having also this uh, problem of fake news elections and things like that. So uh, 
Um, but uh, we have to take value of what was the example of net mundial and maybe uh, to think something similar to that for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Yanis. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, Jans Kaklinschein with Latvian government. Um, so thank you, panelists, for, for a nice uh, return in the history. I, I, uh, I felt like being present in, in, in Net Mondial, uh, so at least in, 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 in memories. Uh, further we will go, though, uh, better it will um, uh, stay in our memories, though there were some, some um, uh, let's say, difficulties uh, also in organization and in running the meeting. But of course, uh, uncontestably, that was a unique ex experiment and, and experience of really multi-stakeholder uh, decision making. Um, so my my question to panelists actually reflecting uh, on on this unique experiment and experience, why the uh, decisions uh, of Net Mondial now we are referring in the past, why they are not making the uh, uh, the presence of today. So uh, we we heard that. Uh, uh, the, the declaration which was adopted uh, basically is uh, very good. The principles are, are uh, time, timeless, as, as if I recall correctly. Uh, but we're referring to Net Mondial document uh, as a past. Not this whole second half of the session is about the future. Okay, so maybe, maybe that, that I will, I will, I will uh, get, get uh, answer to, to that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any more, more interventions? Uh, I think if this is not the case, um, uh, then uh, I hand over back to Bill, and we could start with the, uh, Raul wants to make a final comment, and then uh, we start with the second part. Very short, so, so you can discuss this in the second part of the meeting, but I think one of the reasons for that, that's a very personal comment, but I, I think that we lost a momentum immediately after the, the Net Mundial meeting, we could have continued uh, building over the declaration and the document, and we were distracted on other things. Uh, so that's the reason because, in my view, we started to speak about the Net Mundial as a past thing. Uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot recover many of the, most of the principles included in the comments and even some aspects of the roadmap. But I think that we made some mistakes uh, after, immediately after. The and probably we should not hide that, uh, you know, Fadi Shehada, who was a driver of the process, you know, went too fast and too far with the Net Mundial initiative, which was a little bit counterproductive. That means when he proposed that the World Economic Forum should overtake the implementation of the uh, Net Mundial Declaration, then he produced a lot of, uh, let's say, negative responses, uh, not only among the civil society, uh, but also other groups. So, but now, you know, with a certain distance, five years after Net Mundial, I think time is ripe to look forward. Uh, uh, Anvete and I were a member of the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, and we used a lot of the ideas from Net Mundial if the report, which was presented just two weeks ago, go at the Paris Peace Forum uh, to the French president and the, uh, and, 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 and the, the 2,000 participants of the Paris Peace Forum. And if you look to the report of the Global Commission, you will find a number of ideas uh, from the Net Mondial. So the Net Mondial is still uh, you know, uh, on the table and has potential to guide us through the next decade and, you know, to guide us to the next 30 minutes or 60 minutes. It's now in the hand of Bill. Bill, uh, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Um, there's a really... I'm okay, my name is Avri Doria, and I'm standing up. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of wonderful stuff about Net Mundial. I think the, the whole writing exercise at the beginning was wonderful. And perhaps it's just my own perversions that made it difficult for me. But I found myself completely unable to speak at Net Mundial because there were strict divisions of lines. You need to get into a line that said you were civil society. You needed to get a line that said you were technical community or government or whatever. Now, I felt I was a hybrid. 
And I felt that there was no place. So from that point on, I basically walked all the way through Net Mundial feeling I had no voice because we got into the strict siloization. So it was really wonderful to see people standing in line and waiting their turn, but there was no place for someone that wasn't willing to say, I am this and only this. The other thing I had, it was way too governmenty. I mean, when it got to the negotiations at the end, it was governments agreed or didn't, with the business people whispering behind them as to what they could or could not agree. As I said, that was my perception. And, and, and I just, as we go on, I would say, be careful of how it works in the future. Okay, thank you for that. Nothing right. is perfect, so, uh, and it's at the end of Bill's now. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Can I ask Henriette and Fiona to perhaps replace two of the Team One people on the podium so that we can get your voices on the stage? Thank you, folks. No, you can stay. You're, you're part of Team Two. So we broke it up into two groups, as I said, because we wanted to do one looking back to set the context for those who were not aware around, and now we're going to do the main part, which is to think about what the Net Mondial means going forward and whether it's had any impact beyond the time. Just to review, and then I'm going to turn uh, for a first question to Vint, who has, oddly has not had a chance to speak yet. I just wanted to quickly show you, for, for those of you who I put on the, um, uh, I linked on to the, the page for this session, both the Net Mundial statement, which you can download, and a book that I edited um, on the Net Mundial uh, roadmap, <clears throat> which is freely available to you if you're interested, which provides a lot of information. Uh, but for those who don't have it right in front of them, I, I want to just quickly tell you what the main elements of the Net Mundial statement were, and then we can talk about which of these has lasted, not lasted, and so on. Okay. So to start, the first half was principles. And we had principles such as, for the first time, a multi-stakeholder document, global document, that said the internet is a global resource to be managed in the public interest. It talked about human rights offline must be protected online, including a number of the key internationally protected human rights listed there. It said, for the first time in any international document that I'm aware of, that the internet must remain a unified and unfragmented space with security and stability, common unique identifiers, and end-to-end -end flow of lawful content. It emphasized the importance of open systems and architectures, enabling environments, uh, access, and cultural linguistic uh, diversity. And then it set out a whole series of uh, process principles for how internet governance should be conducted in the future, noting, for example, that the uh, WISIS agenda's language about uh, multi-stakeholder respective roles and responsibilities should be interpreted in a flexible manner, which is a whole different thing from what you got out of the UN-based negotiations among governments. That processes should be open, participatory, and consensus-driven, transparent, accountable, inclusive, bottom-up, yada, yada, distributed, decentralized. So these are all baselines that were set in terms of principles for how IG should be done going forward. Then we had a roadmap that set out a series of specific policy recommendations. The first set of recommendations pertain to existing mechanisms argued that the Internet Governance Forum should be strengthened, that there should be outcomes and recommendations, as we suggested in the working group on the Internet Governance Report in 2005 that laid out the vision for creating an IGF, that there should be renewed mandates, strengthened funding, and intersessional action, that the IANA transition that the U.S. government had just announced should be done in an open participatory way that reached beyond the ICANN community, that ICANN globalization should be pursued, in a very accountable and transparent way, taking into account all interests, et cetera. There was a principle saying that all IG organizations should implement principles for transparency, accountability, and inclusiveness and produce periodic public reports on their progress. What happened to that one? Um, then there was a set of uh, recommendations pertaining to possible new initiatives, that local, regional, and global uh, levels should have more coordination and dialogue, that technical and non-technical -commun communities should have more coordination dialogue, that there should be new coordination tools for ongoing monitoring, analysis, and information sharing functions, what some of us call the clearinghouse function, uh, that uh, multi-stakeholder mechanisms at the national level were needed, um, that there should be capacity ability and 
uh, empowerment, in particular supporting the emergence of true multi-stakeholder communities in places where that was insufficient, um, that there should be enhanced cooperation. Young man, you should appreciate this. Uh, enhanced cooperation pursued in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, that we should consider mechanisms, meaning new mechanisms, for emerging topics and issues not currently addressed. And then there was a miscellaneous set of recommendations having to do with a mix of issues, cybersecurity and cybercrime, strengthened co uh, cooperation on jurisdiction and law enforcement, NLATs, et cetera. Mass surveillance should not be an arbitrary and, and should be conducted in accordance with human rights law. Further consideration on some points where we couldn't reach agreement, such as roles and responsibilities, and what is the real meaning of equal footing, jurisdiction. Importantly, the idea of benchmarking applications of IG principles, um, net neutrality. And then finally, the hopeful statement that the net mondial outcomes would feed into other IG processes around the world. Um, so this was all put on paper through a collective process. And I want then to raise to the group um, the question of how do we think about which of these um, elements of this agreement that we spent the year working on have lasted, still have any meaning, uh, which have been seen follow-up and implementation, which have not, and why? Um, what lasts and is significant from this effort five years later? Vint, why don't we start with you on that point? Yeah, you can. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, let me start out by observing that the outcome of Net Mundial, this set of principles that we just reviewed, are still useful as a metric for future progress. So we can look at what we have accomplished, if we have accomplished something, and ask ourselves whether we've done so in a way that's still compatible uh, with the principles that uh, were set out in Net Mundial. One thing I would point out to you is that getting principles agreed is a lot easier than getting implementation of the principles. It's a little bit like law and regulation. In, you could have a law that says nobody should starve in this country. Then the question will be, okay, how do we implement that? And one answer might be, well, if they can't afford to eat, we should provide them with some subsidies. Then the question will be, well, who qualifies for the subsidies? And you get into the details about what are the right levels it gets complicated very, very quickly, and there are, are a variety of different interests uh, that are affected by implementation of principles. Uh, but that it, it simply reinforces the importance of taking the principles and, and asking how well the implementation uh, has uh, maintained compatibility with those principles. Uh, the contract for the web, which is being announced, I guess, before we walked into the room, but we couldn't stay to hear more about, uh, is a good vehicle to test the Net Mundial principles against because the contract has some specifics in it that would uh, allow us to assess that. You don't make progress uh, like was made that which was made at Net Mundial without a willingness to make progress. So people in the room had to want to uh, achieve this objective as opposed to finding any way they could to stop it. So many negotiating environments are, uh, are built around the idea of preventing something from happening. And so that's something we should be very uh, watchful about because we should be about making progress, not stopping it. Now, one of the principles in there uh, and the m mantra of this IGF is about one net. Uh, Bill and I and others wrote a fairly lengthy piece about fragmentation. I'm sorry to tell you, fragmentation is here. We were not able to stop it. And we will not be able to stop it uh, because the ability to fragment the internet is available at many layers in the architecture. It can be stopped entirely by simply removing the underlying transport capability. And we already have well-worked examples in which the internet has been shut down for periods of time. So I wish that I could be more positive about avoiding fragmentation, but the answer is it's here and it will continue to be here. So our job is to try to make the network as useful as possible in spite of that and to reinforce those who want to make it a common environment and help them achieve that uh, objective while making the system as safe uh, and secure as possible. 
And that is probably our biggest challenge because now we can see how this platform can be abused. We're seeing it in the social media. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, denial of service attacks and various malware attacks and the like. We're even seeing people finding uh, day zero vulnerabilities and hoarding them and then using them uh, you know, to interfere with uh, network operation. All of those sorts of things feel like they are counter to the principles that uh, we hope to adopt uh, with Net Mundial. So we have a substantial amount of work to do to preserve the value of the internet that we now know it has. And in spite of the interference uh, that we're seeing, I think we still have an opportunity to make this one of the most useful platforms ever developed. I'll stop there, Bill, thank you. And we'll come back to you in a second. So I think the key, key point you, you said relative to my question though is implementation. International uh, intergovernmental processes like the, the ITU, the WISIS can hold an annual conference to take stock of progress. There's organizational resources devoted there. There's somebody tasked with the responsibility to track. Even if some of it is kind of window dressing, it, there's a process. We adopted a set of norms here. We had nobody in place to do anything in the way of tracking progress and following up. So this became an initial limitation on the extent to which the agreement could be translated into concrete practice. But I want to turn to now first to people who haven't had a chance to speak yet, starting with Fiona, who was in a key role uh, as the, the head person for international communications in the US government at the time. At the time that we were doing this, the, you had just announced the IANA transition uh, and used the event of the Net Mundial to call attention to this and to seek international buy-in and so on. So when you think about the, the Net Mundial statement and what we agreed, what elements of that agreement have we been able to follow up on? And what have we, where have we seen progress, where have we not? Um, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Hi to everybody. Um, so I think, um, I think Raul is the one that said um, this earlier on, that once this was out, we kind of lost the momentum because we got busy with other things. And the Anna transition item number two up here took a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of people's resources. So it was two years of pretty intensive work for people. And I think a lot of those same people would have been involved in a Net Mundial follow-up in the way that you've described it. And people can only do so much in any given day. So I think that was part of, of the, the challenge of follow-up. Um, very happily, we finished the IANA transition. And then inside the US government, we had to do our own review processes. And then uh, because of some of the concerns about it, we had to do another additional review of it to deal with risk frameworks. And we had to hire outside uh, evaluators to make sure that it wasn't subject to capture. And then once that was done, and then we had to manage the US congressional budgeting process. And then it all ended with a lawsuit the very last day, um, which thankfully we won. But so there was a lot. There was a lot to that. And I think that sucked a lot of energy, rightly so, into something that needed to get finished. But it took a lot of the energy and momentum. And then I think, as uh, Wolfgang had said, I think the, the sort of rush to the Net Mundial initiative, uh, which we were very involved in at NTI as well, because we believed it was important to do, I think definitely didn't turn out well for, for folks. So I think that was part of the challenge. Um, you know, in terms of the four things that you have up here, I think uh, ICANN moved ahead and has tried to globalize as best as it can and continues to do so. Um, I'm reminded, um, or I try to remind myself, when I first started doing this 20 years ago, um, how different these, even these meetings are to what they used to be, that everyone can come in, there's no restrictions, everyone can talk. When we were first doing uh, the negotiations for phase one of WISIS, which was theoretically open to all stakeholders, people got kicked out of the room. Um, you know, I think maybe Paul complained at by gunpoint, if I can remember correctly. So, you know, you out of the UN be meeting. So the culmination of that with this visual of Benedictus' idea of these four lines was just this amazing you know, from a meeting where people got kicked out of the room because they couldn't speak, to the visual of people being lined up at a microphone to wait equally, always sticks with me. So the question is, how do we go forward with that? And I would say, you know, number four, I don't, I don't think much has happened with that. But these things don't happen unless people like you and us demand it. So that's, I think you've got to have the will and uh, the commitment and the energy for people to make these things happen. Otherwise, people will just continue to do what they do. So the first lesson is that implementation 
With regard to these elements, ICANN had already set up the pro or was beginning the process. Probably that would have all happened regardless of the NetMundial anyway, but the NetMundial added a political layer of uh, broader accountability that helped support the ICANN process and the globalization of ICANN, which was useful. So we saw pieces of the agreement that had specific organizations taking responsibility for particular actions, carrying through on them. But where there was not that, we got a little bit different result. Um, so, Madame, Henriette, your thoughts. What's the question? The question is which, which parts of the Mundial statement that we spent a year laboring over have been subject to any kind of real effort to follow up and do implementation, which have not, and why? Um, I think, I, mean, I, I actually want to pick up on Vin's point about um, fragmentation. Um, I think some aspects has. I think certainly the human rights um, uh, um, content of the, the, um, the Net Mondial Statement has been developed, but by the human rights community, you know, perhaps more so the bodies like the Human Rights Council and the, the treaty bodies, perhaps more so than by, by internet governance. But just to explain my role, so I see Marcus Kumar is sitting in the room. I um, co-chaired the drafting of the, the principal section with Marcus, and then Jeanette and Janis Karklins co-chaired the roadmap. So that, I just want to emphasize that. I think that was an innovation that was really significant, that from the outset, we looked at both looking at principles and then also at practice and at the way forward. Um, <laughs> I think that yeah, I'm not. I'm not responding entirely to your question. I think that what has been said is that it, that 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 um, there has been insufficient follow-up and implementation. And I think the fragmentation that that Vint is talking about is real, because there's a normative vacuum or gap. I think, and I think that's what Net Mondial came so close to filling, was that very high-level understanding of what are the principles. That, that, that should underpin internet governance. And we still haven't got agreement on that. And I think it's extremely risky. At the moment, we're talking about regulation. Facebook is asking governments to regulate it. Um, many governments have introduced at national level some form of content regulation. There's also you know, international processes looking at that. And that really frightens me because beginning to actually regulate the internet and those who run it and develop it and use it, when you don't have this agreement this at a principal level of what the internet is and how it should be governed, I think is a recipe for, for deepening um, um, fragmentation. So I, I think that there, I mean, I think another aspect you, you asked, well, what has um, uh, been followed up on? I think the IANA transition definitely rolled out well, but that might also be, one of the reasons that the Net Mundial, one of the many reasons, but that the Net Mundial um, statement um, did not go further, because I think it was perceived by many people as public relations for the IANA transition, as a way of creating political legitimacy. That was one of the critiques. Um, and so perhaps the fact that the IANA transition did work and was relatively successful also made many people feel, okay, well, maybe don't need the Net Mondial anymore, or others who were skeptical of the Net Mondial from the outset felt, you know, why, why bother? Um, I just want to, to highlight um, just a few things which for me was very significant. The, the leadership from a developing country. I come from the Global South. I identify with, with, with Global South issues and concerns. The internet governance space is still very much dominated in many respects by the global north. The fact that a developing country government showed the leadership to take this, initiate and take this process forward, that was immensely empowering. And if Nena was emotional, I think that was a very emotional um, feeling for, for many of us, but with good support, good support from governments in the, in the, in the global north and from other stakeholder groups, yes, Avery is right, it was very rigidly stakeholder group, but at that time, I think that was significant. Um, and I think what the Net Mondial process did is build on the WISIS principles, and the WISIS, both the Geneva phase and the Tunis phase. Um, 
very effectively. It looked at development, inclusion, and access, open standards, for example. Um, and then it looked at, at, uh, um, at some of the security, stability, and cybercrime. And if, in fact, if you look at that document now, and I'm, I'm glad, Bull, you went through it, it was very forward-looking in terms of the issues that it identified. Um, and the other thing I think that, that I want to uh, highlight is that it wasn't easy. Consensus wasn't easy. There, was, there were moments when governments used their power. The decision-making structure of NetModel was established in such a way that um, there was a, what was it called, the high-level panel or high level something that made final decisions. Now some people are very skeptical of that. Executive body that had to approve the decisions. And as a drafting group, we submitted some content. For example, there was mass surveillance, there was contention on intermediary liability and intellectual property. And governments pulled rank at the end. Um, I actually think that's good. I, for me, I'm, I would much rather that we have multi-stakeholder processes which are honest, which recognize that there are different interests, different political contexts and backgrounds, and that the private sector and civil society will not always agree. And yes, if government wants to use its power, that's also okay. That's how the world works. And I think the sort of fairy tale notion of the multi-stakeholder process where we all get together and it's very... We agree on everything. I think that undermines the, both the input and the effort that people put into this as well as the outcomes. So as for just going forward, I think, as I said at the beginning, there is still this normative gap. I think um, it holds back public interest-oriented internet governance and security and stability. I think we see other bodies trying to fill that gap. The web contract, for example, we've had within the UN processes, uh, we've had the working group on enhanced cooperation, for example, and none of them effectively fill the gap. And I think at some point we need to agree on a normative high-level framework that should underpin multilateral and multi-stakeholder internet governance processes at national and global and regional level. And I think the fragmentation that Vint talks about is real, but I'm hoping, Vint, that we can kind of still hold it back by agreeing on some of these principles. And there's no other body, I think, that's better situated to do that than the IGF. Because ultimately, and this, is, I think, was a failure of the, or a weakness of the Net Mondial, it existed outside of the multilateral process. And I think for those of us that are committed to inclusive, democratic, bottom-up governance, Yes, but you cannot ultimately achieve that by also engaging governments and getting their commitment and establishing normative frameworks that will be binding to governmental actors as well as to non-governmental actors. We don't have that yet. The Net Mondial brought us close. We need to develop that. I think the IGF still remains the, the most appropriate space for that. Thank you for that, Henriette. I'm sure that the idea that it was a good thing that at the end of the day, governments pulled rank, and the whole question of what do we really mean by equal footing is something that maybe we might want to take up in the, in the larger discussion. Okay, uh, let's turn then to Jeanette, who was also playing a central role in the, what was your, what were you again on the, one of those committees? I forget. You were in one of these. You were the co-chair. You were the co-chair of the meeting, right? Okay, fine. So you must have a few views on what's been done and what hasn't been done. Thank you, Bill. Um, when I looked at the principles and the roadmap again, the first thing I noticed is that some of the principles, in my view, have aged a bit. For example, this idea of permissionless innovation. It was controversial then, but now I would say it's pretty much discredited, and we wouldn't put this in a document anymore. And the same concerns perhaps this idea of intermediary liability limitations. We have them, but we continue, or let's say governments continue to restrict these limitations. Um, so we would probably uh, put this in a different way today too. But what I find actually quite interesting, uh, go to 11 again, the one I want to talk about, 11, um, here we go. 
the, uh, the emerging topics. What I noticed over the last years is that emerging topics are being taken up by internet governance processes only in a very reduced way. My feeling is that attention is more and more shifting from critical resources and infrastructure issues to platforms. Platforms is the big thing at the moment. Governments get really interested among them, the European Commission in regulating platforms. And what I also noticed is that there are more and more civil society initiatives taking up platforms. For example, the issue of freedom of speech. There are networks emerging in the US that deal with this, but none of them are connected in any way uh, to the internet governance, people, actors, processes that are in place so far. Many people looking at these issues are not even aware of processes such as Net Mondial. So we seem to reinvent uh, the wheel here in this field and thereby also learning anew how to deal with this. We see Facebook coming up with this uh, oversight board. We see civil society uh, um, and networks emerging on these issues, but they're completely decoupled uh, from what we've done in the traditional internet governance field, and that I think is really a problem. Not only that we don't build on this, also the sort of normative issues are gone. Um, and I think particularly in terms of human rights, uh, that is really a problem. Thank you. So then, just to synthesize a little bit and then turn to the next question and get some others into the discussion as well, if we look at the principles, many of these principles that were articulated back then, some have been followed up in other bodies, in Human Rights Council, things like that in varying degrees. Not with strong reference to the Net Mondial as a guide, but nevertheless, there's been some movement going forward. Some of the other issues that were listed as principles, basically there's no institutional nexus that has done anything in particular uh, to advance those principles or to measure compliance with those principles. Um, and I think that that's been an ongoing sort of issue. Uh, and then when we look at the, the things that were in the roadmap, those parts that spoke to specific organizations that were already in place, had budgets, had staff, had processes in place like ICANN, things move forward. Other things where we were making a recommendation to the world that the world ought to, ought to do something, nothing happened. So even the IGF, which there is a mechanism, has spent the past decade talking about how to strengthen outputs and do intercessional stuff, and not much has really strongly come out of that. There is intercessional work, but not enough. Um, nobody has done implementing principles for transparency and accountability, which is something that we put in, was in the WISIS principles as well. And, that the, and we put into the IGF mandate that the IGF would be a place that would monitor on an ongoing basis implementation of these of WISIS principles. That didn't happen. All the new initiatives type things that people talked about launching back then for expanded coordination, creation of new tools. There were some little bits of effort to create some, you know, you had various uh, efforts to do experimentally with some tools under Net Mondial Initiative and the European one. Diplo Foundation, but not a lot has been done there yet. Uh, most of these other areas, there has not really been significant follow-up. And on the miscellaneous issues, those are all being pursued in different bodies in varying ways without real reference to the Net Mondial Initiative. So as a general rule, you'd have to say Net Mondial may have had some normative input into some other processes, but there has not been really, as, tell me if I'm wrong. If anybody disagrees with me, that's great. I don't see really sustained activity to try to do it, and I think that's a pity. Vint, tell me I'm wrong. This is not necessarily a, to disagree with you at all. First, I want to disagree with Jeanette. Uh, so I figure I'll pick on you first. Uh, I don't agree with you that permissionless innovation is discredited, but I think that what you mean by it and what I mean by it might be different. From my point of view as an engineer, the architecture of the internet is still wide open in terms of uh, allowing people to invent new protocols at all layers in the architecture, to invent new applications. The place where I suspect you might come out is that uh, you can't get away with doing anything you want to do in terms of potential harm to users or exposure of private information. That 
uh, I think is a constraint which is increasing. So let me give you a concrete example of a trend which I think is becoming very visible, and that's transparency, the demand for transparency in many different dimensions, whether it's the algorithms that are used in artificial intelligence and machine learning, or practices that have to do with the way in which data uh, is being uh, consumed and used, or protected or not protected. So we can at least count on some aspects of the Net Mondial starting to influence the way in which regulatory thinking is, uh, is emerging. And I think we should be happy about that. Jeanette, did you want to react to that? Um, I fully agree with you. Well, I took care of that problem. You know, the part of the problem, I think, is that for a lot of people, permissionless innovation blurred into break fa move fast and break things. And in Europe, in particular, there's more of an ex-ante regulatory precautionary principle kind of approach mm -hmm. that people tend to think, you know, don't just launch into things until you have some idea what's going to happen. And American entrepreneurs are like, hell, let's just see what happens, which, you know, hasn't always been the, the best word for it. Uh, Henriette, did you want to get in? And then also, well, I, let's see, if any of the other panelists want to respond to... Well, uh, just to respond to your question, I think that, that yes, there is no formal uh, follow-up process. I think at a, at a more subtle and nuanced level, however, I think that there is a legacy. Net Montreal has a legacy that 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 is significant, and I think the, the the opening panel, the opening section of this panel speakers actually highlighted that. I think the the. I think, but where there is follow up and and building on on the Net Mondial, it because it's so institutionally fragmented, it doesn't help us to address the fragmentation in internet governance. Take, for example, the the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators, which is a set of metrics that that allow for a multi stakeholder approach at national level to to understand how universal access to the internet is, how secure and stable, um, how gender aware, um, how social justice aware. This is a set of metrics that, that I think, um, who talked about SON, Raul? No, not, Nena, Nena. The spirit of Net Mondial, I think, really informs those UNESCO indicators. They're a very powerful tool, but it's one UN agency um, whose member states have, have uh, adopted these or encouraged that this is being used. It's, it's, and it's doing so based on indicators, not necessarily, and on UNESCO's own normative framework, which is the Rome framework, which is rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholder. So, so yes, the legacy is there, but I think it's up to the IGF because it's so unique in that it's open and inclusive and connected to the multilateral system. It's connected to the UN, so it is connected to this institutional framework where governments still feel at home. And that's the challenge. I think we have to deal with that challenge. And, and every, if it, even if it does mean having separate queues for governments, I do think that that's, that's still what the IGF can and should do. And I think the, the fact that Net Mondial came so close should really be an inspiration to us, actually, that, that we can build that kind of common, high-level uh, understanding and roadmap. Uh, uh, I want to recall what uh, Avri Doria said about the little four boxes, uh, government, civil society, academia, etc. Uh, I don't say etc. I say private sector. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, when we uh, prepared the document of uh, the Marco Civil, this took uh, from 2009 to 2014, from the first draft to the sanction by the federal government you know, in the Net Mundial event. It was a participation very broad, open, transparent, etc., of all sectors. You know? And uh, when Dilma was to sign the document, there was a strong manifestation from some sectors of civil society claiming that she should not sign it at the time. So this is to demonstrate that the, the, this, these four boxes don't fit everything. 
the governments diverged, uh, at least two governments, three governments were strongly opposed to the process and to the content produced by Net Mundial. Uh, and when they were pres present there. And uh, the civil society has its tendencies and its, their approaches and very strong divisions, you know? and obviously the other sectors too. So it's very difficult to carry out a multi-stakeholder process trying to contemplate all these nuances, all these, these uh, differences, and arrive at a consensus. By the way, the, the Brazilian organizations that were opposed to the Marco Civil at the time now strongly defend it, given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nana, did you have any thoughts on the, what came out of this? I mean, how do we think about it after a few years in terms of what yeah. impacted, what didn't? I wanted to come back to, I think, principle number two. Uh, uh, rights of, on, offline should be also the same as rights online. And uh, it, it, in the days of Net Mundial, it was, it, it was there. And for people who live in the global north, it doesn't mean anything for them. But if you live in Africa as an activist, and you know how many drives, how many bills want to regulate ABC, um, Nigeria is actually in the process of adopting one that says death by hanging for hate speech. Hate speech which can mean that you do not agree with a top government official. Nobody has been hanged in, hung in Nigeria for dilapidating public funds. But someone who writes something on Twitter can be hung for that. But my point is, if you are coming from where I come from, and you have to fight on daily basis against multiple bills everywhere coming up, they want to regulate. In fact, there was one that wanted to regulate just WhatsApp. I mean, what the fuck? Are we, are we direct? <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but I am not offended. I assure some, you. Sometimes you have to call bullshit by its name, okay? But you know, when when you have these laws mushrooming every day, but by people who want to hold tight to things that should have been in the open space in the first place, you realize that the spirit of Net Mundial is with some of us who keep saying there isn't anything new in what is happening online, and we have laws that already govern offline life that can be applied online, and we do not need to invest taxpayers' money into new legislative processes that wouldn't lead us anywhere. So I, I believe that that is one thing uh, that uh, we took from the spirit of Net Mundial. You may not see Net Mundial cited, but I think this is one thing. I also want to pay homage to the gentleman over there who was, representing <laughs> who was representing Brazil in all those years through the oasis, and these two here. And I'm happy that they are still together. I mean, together as in still passionate about this. And it tells us something, uh, that Brazil led in Net Mondial, which is a follow-up to its lead in Marco Civil, has put Brazil somewhere that they now, everybody is interested in what is happening in Brazil. In, you may not know this, but if there's any digital rights issue, we, we want to know, we want to analyze it. And that brings me to my point, the point of having leadership in specific areas, which is what the IGF is yet to give us because the system is not that way built. Um, Europe has taken leadership in GDPR, who else will take leadership in what? Uh, at the time of Net Mundial, we were not talking much about artificial intelligence, but I think these days it is becoming bigger. So my, I have two points there. The one, the, the principle that says offline rights also apply to online has helped us as people who fight for human rights from the global south, fighting various bills on daily basis. And the fact that there was leadership from Brazil um, has put a kind of um, digital responsibility on that country, and we are hoping for digital leaders in other issues. Okay. I'm done. And I'm going to pay homage to that gentleman right now, but before I do, I just want to ask you then, in Africa, have you ever seen governments reference the Net Mondial uh, statement 
as providing a rationale for any action or justifying any activity? Um, I have seen countries take on uh, more organization around their, their equivalent of CGI. I, I have seen that. So I've seen countries that said we need to sit and we need to look at what Brazil has done. If you recall, after Net Mundial, we invited somebody from Brazil to West Africa IGF. And she had, we arranged a lot of bilaterals with governments. And at that time, uh, the Nigerian government was coping the uh, national IGF. And um, we had a lot of talk. And Nigeria actually started what looks like it will last as a national IGF, and which, for which we are proud of. So, like I said, we may not call it net mundial, mm -hmm. but the spirit of it is there. Okay. Because as we all remember, too, after we adopted this thing and all thought we had done this wonderful thing, in all the intergovernmental settings where somebody tried to raise it, the industrialized democracies would always keep, try to put net mundial language in, and the G77 would always take it out. In the, with the WSIS 10, all the, the, the UN agencies really were resistant to having much acknowledgement of the net mundial legitimizing it as a, would you like but, to correct but me? Just to, just to, absolutely true, but the reason for that was not because they did not necessarily agree with the contents of the net mundial statement no. or the net mundial roadmap, but because they felt that the issue of enhanced cooperation in the Tunis agenda, which is code for the role of governments, wasn't addressed effectively. Yeah. So it was, it, it, it's an example of how the success of a multi-stakeholder process um, became a kind of a deal breaker in the multilateral process. But there was also disquiet with the fact that the decision making had been multi-stakeholder, and if you remember at the end of the meeting, India, Russia, and other governments got up and said, on a process ground, this is not acceptable, we are not gonna legitimate this as a way to go forward. Absolutely, and there were several African um, countries who would have held that position, but there were also those that who endorsed the statement. But the spirit of Net Mondial, by the way, some of the language you will find in the African Union Commission's Declaration on Internet Governance, which followed shortly afterwards. So the spirit lives on, but the document itself has a soft, diffuse normative effect. Let's hear from somebody who is centrally involved, who several people have uh, pointed to, and that is Ambassador Fonseca, who played a central role in pulling all this together from Brazil. Thank you, Bill, and uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, however, I should start with a disclaimer because I, my participation in this meeting has a totally different uh, nature of before. Uh, as a diplomat, I have moved uh, on to another job. I am now the, the Consul General of Brazil in Boston. I hope to see you, many of you there at some point in time. Uh, in Boston, yeah, in Boston, yeah, sorry? Yes, ah, very good, excellent. <laughs> Uh, but this is to say that I, anything I say does not represent the Brazilian government position anymore. I'm not entitled to this anymore. Actually, my successor, Ambassador Achilles, uh, he is in, in, the, in town. He'll be here for, I think not today, I think he has a cybersecurity summit. Uh, He's on the panel with us. Yes, but, uh, oh yeah, um, but he'll be here. So he is the one who could speak. So my comments, uh, anyway, they reflect the uh, a few years I have dedicated myself to this uh, with uh, passion. <laughs> I think I remain uh, passionate about this and uh, my memory is still good in regard to what happened in Net Mundial. So I'd like to make uh, a few comments. Uh, first of all, I'm very proud of having been part of the team who organized Net Mundial uh, together with the Brazilian uh, uh, CGI. Uh, uh, I see here many colleagues from CGI and it's a great pleasure Hartmut Glaser, Carlos Afonso, and others, uh, in, in partnership with other uh, institutions and organizations. And, and I think one of the points I'd like to make is that the outcome of Net Mundial, with both its success and shortcomings, uh, 
I, I think all of this was larger than the, the sum of the parts. Uh, I think I have heard uh, reference to the work of the, of that was done by Fadi. I think it was very important at the beginning when Fadi approached our president and, and they agreed to convene Met Mundial and then the pres President Dilma itself, her role in uh, uh, convoking this meeting, uh, CGI working within its network and the other organizations. Uh, but everything in relation to the organization and to the realization of Net Mundial went far beyond individual participation. Just to give an example, and it's not a criticism to Fadi, who is a good friend, uh, uh, he sometimes wanted to move too fast. <laughs> For example, when we said uh, we want to have representatives from civil society, we said, no, so we can invite uh, one, two, B, and, right. and, and we said, no, no, that's not the way civil society operates. Uh, we must leave them to choose their uh, representatives. It's not up to us to choose. It's not up to us to say how they are going to organize bottom-up. It's up to them. Uh, but it takes time. Well, it takes the time, we don't have much time, but we should give them enough, otherwise it will not be legitimate. Just to say part of the things that were in backstage that are not uh, particularly secretive, but I think that's led. Because we were listening to each other, we were building on what uh, others said. <clears throat> the strengths of Net Mundial, it showed the possibility of coming together in a multi-stakeholder fashion and produce uh, concrete outcomes. Uh, it showed that uh, we, from the perspective of governments, and I am 100% uh, government, uh, it shows that it's possible to be creative, you know, that we are not obliged to, we are not tied to the, the procedure, the rules of procedures. We can be innovative, provided we give people comfort of what they are doing. And in regard to follow-up, I think it's also a strength. Even what happened later on in ICANN, uh, and I take the point that was made by Bill that those things were, in a way, already in progress. Uh, and maybe uh, it would be maybe a bit presumptuous to say that because of Net Mundial, the icon transition took place. But I think Net Mundial played a role to that. That was even acknowledged by uh, Larry Strickling and others that Net Mundial did provide, let's say, the impetus or the momentum for that to happen. And if in Net Mundial, uh, I think it was maybe the first uh, occasion in which there was a discussion on how to move forward uh, in that regard. Uh, also, I would mention the Internet and Jurisdiction Project that was also mentioned in, uh, as one of the areas that needed to move forward, and we are very glad to see that uh, this uh, important area uh, has been moving forward again. Uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle's project was already there, but I think uh, Net Mundial uh, also gave a push to that. But I have to go to the weaknesses of Net Mundial, and uh, I take the point made by Avri Dori, I think, uh, and others that we had, in a way, to work in silos. And I think it was unavoidable to do that because we had little time and we had a, a a goal in mind we wanted to achieve, and we had little time, so we had, in a way, to, to push a little bit everyone. <laughs> we pushed the governments to be there, because if we acted uh, by the rule in regard to government participation, they would not be there in a way, because we would need to make a, a resolution asking for that to happen, and that would be negotiated. It was just, let's invite those people to come, and they came. So, but... Uh, uh, I think that was part of the issues we, <coughs> we had to face. Uh, but then I, I'd like, in regard to governments, to build a little bit on what uh, Henriette said, because I think that when we think about the weak points of Net Mundial, I think Net Mundial was very important, was a unique thing. It produced many important things. The, it, it's a landmark that will remain. But we cannot say, we cannot not over uh, emphasize the importance of Net Mundial. Uh, and one of the weaknesses was the involvement of governments. I recall, maybe some of you recall that at the last session of Net Mundial, a number of countries, uh, they stood up and they said, we reject this document. We do not accept this document. We are not taking this forward. And it was for us, uh, for Brazil, uh, for the Brazilian government in particular, backlash. But we understand why they did that. As he had said, it's not basically not because of the content itself. I think 
even for governments, the country, there could be, if there was an opportunity to work a little bit around it, they could accept. Uh, just for give an example, when we were negotiating with this plus 10 document, uh, and then we have a diverse group, including from Ambassador uh, Sepulveda to colleagues from uh, Saudi Arabia and others and Cuba, and all, all the world was there. And we came out, out with a document that was good. We extended IGF for a number of years. We made things that remain also a landmark. So that, but this was following a procedure that, uh, fortunately, uh, in regard to Net Mundial, uh, there was not time to do that. But I think there maybe have a we had a lost opportunity, maybe after that Net Mundial, to try to embed it in the uh, multilateral uh, setting. Uh, it, it is not easy. When this was taken up by the Assembly General, uh, I recall we could not even welcome the document. Countries are not prepared to welcome because welcome takes, uh, I think it, the expression was used, takes note, which is something we know it's there and we move on. Uh, and I, I think this reflects also, uh, I, one comment I'd like to make, and I'm moving to my last point. <laughs> Uh, the lessons we have learned. That the first and most important lesson is that the multi stakeholder process to be not to go to move beyond discussions to good it must reflect respect each stakeholder group's culture, its way of doing things. Uh, government should respect civil society civil society should also respect governments. And I I'm sorry to I, I know I'm being a bit provocative, but I since I'm not uh, speaking, I'm on a personal capacity, so I can say anything. And as we move, uh, we grow older, and uh, we approach retirement. I I'll be retired in 19 years, <laughs> so uh, I'm approaching retirement uh, quickly. By the way, when the law was changed in Brazil, extending from 70 to 75, I was very happy, and I said to my wife, I, I have five years more to work, and she said, are you crazy? Uh, we <laughs> I don't want to enjoy life after you finish work. I said, I'm enjoying life now, and, <laughs> and I hope to be enjoying with you. But uh, I, I, I want to be very brief because I, I know the time is limited, and I don't want to abuse the time. Uh, so respect for each group. Uh, we, we should not, and, and this is a message I'd like to leave for uh, colleagues at IGF, because I know here civil society, academia, uh, private sector are here together with governments, and I personally I am convinced of the value of doing this. Uh, I am a strong advocate for this model, but you should not ignore, and again, the way governments do things. It is unrealistic to think that anything that will be done here will be automatically taken up by government. This will not be the case. If there is not an opportunity for governments to come together in according to rules or procedure that they are comfortable, uh, they will not be prepared to take it up. Because governments, and I, I'm government, we are accountable to our, we, we receive instructions, and we have to make reports, and we have to show that what we are doing, what we accept is in line with the overall. So I think it's possible to move beyond the normal way of doing things. IGF was created in the UN context and represents something different from what we have there. I think we can expand this, uh, but that should, the respect should be there. And uh, the final point is that I think it's important to reflect uh, uh, on the legacy of Net Mundial, also because there is a lot of areas in which clearly there is unfinished business, as uh, you went through, Bill. There's so many areas that when you look, they, they are still valid, valid areas in which we, also, we need to expand, but from 2014 to today, not much has happened. So it's important to, to revisit the spirit of Net Mundial, but with a very, I would say, outcome-oriented. And in that, I think all those aspects should be taken into account. So I, my message for you is, okay, I think it's important. Uh, I'm proud to have him be part, but let's move beyond Net Mundial. Net Mundial, in a way, was unique. I don't think it's worthwhile to repeat again the same uh, methodology. With, maybe we should work in, uh, in a more targeted way, because I think the, the, this idea of having provided a conscience of what needs to be done is already there. We need to move to implementation. And in that regard, I think it's very important that stakeholder groups 
should uh, be very much respectful of each other's way of doing things, respect the culture, and make sure that the decisions will be not only please ourselves and, uh, uh, and we have the impression we are changing the world by doing things here, but in, in, especially in regard to what governments are doing, the impact is not there. So this should be revisited. Thank you very much. Apologies for taking so long. Thank you, Benedicto. It was very helpful. We need to be respective of the clock. Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes left. I know people here want to engage. So I had a couple more questions I wanted to ask. Let me just ask for very concise responses uh, from colleagues on, on team two, and then we'll go open the floor. And that is, number one, as we look at all these new initiatives that are being put forward, and we've talked about them, main lesson that you would learn from the Net Mundial for making these things more successful. Um, is there anything we can draw from this experience about how do you do normative work to try to make it have some teeth be useful? And then secondly, how might the Net this is my personal interest, how might the Net Mundial process be useful in reimagining the IGF going forward? We have, a, we have a whole main session tomorrow on IGF plus and the proposal from the Guterres panel, which has a lot of interesting bells and whistles on it. What it doesn't have is a mechanism that would do the kind of thing that we did at Nutmundial, perhaps, which, by the way, the ITU does, in a way, with its World Telecom Policy Forum. They took a few specific issues. They do a, a year-long consultation process. They have versions of the document, and then they have a meeting. It's, that's intergovernmentalism plus. But nevertheless, the point is there are models out there to draw on. So how, how could we make use of what we've learned from NetMundial in doing these next kinds of initiatives? And what could be, what if anything could it mean for the IGF? Let's turn to you first, Ind. So uh, let me be uh, brief. Uh, first of all, I think NetMundial was uh, successful because it was a coalition of the willing. And so if we're going to learn anything at all for IGF Plus, for example, it is to discover uh, what people are actually willing to commit to. Uh, the second thing that I would urge is that uh, the tracking idea that was in uh, the Net Mundial uh, principles uh, find its way into IGF Plus, because unless we are willing to pay attention to whether we're making progress or not, uh, we won't make very much progress. So we have to hold ourselves accountable for trying to uh, move the whole internet governance process forward. And that idea is in the WISIS principles, which governments agreed to. Um, I, th I think I um, would strongly agree with Vince that you have to have a coalition of the willing um, if you're going to try to do this kind of thing or take anything forward. Um, the Net Mundial experience is one that I had never experienced as a government official, and I think that even for the United States at the time, it wasn't comfortable all the time. And we got a lot of questions back at home, and I'm still surprised Honoriette and I are still friends after that last <laughs> negotiation <laughs> session where governments kind of usurped her group. I'm sorry, but I was doing my job. Um, so I think um, you know. I think I would. The question I would ask back to you, and maybe to the folks here, is: well, What is it you're trying to do? Do we need to have another conversation where we reinforce the principles that we've already done? I would say the WISIS principles from 2003, 2005 hold up pretty well. These principles hold up fairly well. I agree with Jeanette. There's a few things. Um, I mean, intermediaries are the big issue of the day that don't work. But if you're trying to move towards actually solving people's problems and actually addressing the concerns that people have about what, what the internet can and can't do for them, you've got to have people that agree to do something. You've got to, I think things are successful when you have a clearly defined problem set. It can't be everything under the sun or people get too distracted. And you have to have funding. And without those three things, I think it's hard to move some of this forward. I wanted to, to draw attention to what the, the UN high-level panel on digital cooperation has done in holding consultations across. And I think that is one thing um, we, we developed from NetMondial. And the contract for the web that has just launched took a lot, I, I can tell you as an insider, from the process of the NetMondial, of having working groups, of putting out a draft of having people um, comment on 
line per line of the draft, and, and that was actually very instructive for me during the Net Mundial, and I think we've applied that here. Uh, so beyond having people at the, round, at the table as multi-stakeholder, I'm actually looking at multi-stakeholder input into the process that leads to uh, a product. Um, I think that the, the, the um, I think the fact that it was a multi-stakeholder process that made the decision, as opposed to just multi-stakeholder process into a decision, is actually an important, unique uh, um, characteristic of Net Mondial that I think should be retained. I think it's not going to be easy, but I think that at a very high level, we need international principles. We need to take the WISIS principles as a starting point, but build on them, making them a little bit more elaborate. And that's what we did with Net Mondial. Maybe we can be a little bit more minimalist about that. Um, uh, the Net Mondial statement starts with the sentence, the internet is a global public resource. I think just getting international agreement on that for me, would be a breakthrough in terms of underpinning internet governance and policy decisions at national industry, international level. And I think that can then um, help us get less fragmentation. I think the other lesson is just that we do, I mean, I, in, in fact, I have a slightly different view, again, sorry, Fiona, um, on the coalition of the like-minded. I think we've it's got to... Willing. willing. Oh, yes, you're right. Co coalition of the willing, yes, but not coalition of the like-minded. There's a tendency in multi-stakeholder processes to stay in the comfort zone of the like-minded and not work through the challenges of dissent and different views and opinions. Sorry, we agree, actually, and that is why we're still friends. <laughs> one of the reasons, one of the many. All right, Jeanette, you get to wrap it up, and then we're going to do what we can to get voices in the room. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the coalition of the willing. At that time, I had um, the impression that this coalition came together because of a serious legitimacy crisis. Uh, that convinced lots of governments to sort of get out of their comfort zone and do things they might not have done otherwise. And that also secured some support by the private sector. And I hope I'm wrong that we need these kind of crises to sort of do these innovative processes. That is an interesting place to stop. We've got 10 minutes. I know there's a lot of people here. Uh, please be, introduce yourself, be concise. If you're asking a question to somebody in particular, make sure that they understand that. If you're just making an intervention, that's fine. We'll go till uh, 13.05 and then they'll throw us out of the room. Hi, Enzo Pugliatti from ISOC Italy. Uh, the question is uh, how we can go from theory to practice and make it happen, especially when we move from the global to the local or the national level, uh, so the role of NRI. In spite of all we have heard and we know, and Carlos told us uh, of the difficulties they faced in Brazil, at the end you had an ideal scenario where all the components were there. Government support, role of the of the civil society, funding through the registry and so on. Not all countries are facing a similar environment. I come from Italy where uh, we had the national IGF where it, that was so inclusive that kicked, that, kicked us out as uh, ISOC uh, um, board member because we didn't agree with something. And this, it's, a, it's an IGF, uh, it's a national IGF. Uh, today we had, uh, for the first time, a minister attending the global IGF, uh, an Italian minister, and I think this is great. It's a big opportunity, but uh, we don't have a, a strong unified government approach. We have different bodies and so on. So how we can cope? How can we cope with situation in such environment? It's a simple question that probably doesn't, uh, that does require a complex answer, I'm sorry. Thank you, Bill. Actually, I was part of the executive multi-stakeholder committee that participated in the organization of Net Mundial, so I had the pleasure 
to work with um, many of you, and it was indeed a lifetime experience. My question to you brings the point that Jeanette mentioned in the end. Um, when Net Mondial happened, it was a moment of almost breaking of relationships. Countries were accusing each other publicly. They were talking about building cables to diversify infrastructure. Brazil had the idea to launch its own national mailing system, so we, would, we wouldn't use Google anymore. So Net Mondial showed us in that in a moment of very acute crisis, we have a constructive path forward. So the key thing to me is that we proved that we don't need to resort to fragmentation. We don't need to shut down dialogue. If bad things happen, we have a framework that show us how we can build dialogue and move forward. In your views, is there anything that you see coming up in the future that could mean a crisis that would lead us to call a second edition of Net Mondial? And just a quick comment that uh, Daniel Fink, myself, uh, and Nicolas Ingales, we wrote a case study on Net Mondial for Harvard after the meeting. So the step-by-step -step of the organization of the meeting and some of the lessons learned are documented there. If you are interested, that's a good starting point if you want to know more about the meeting. Thank you very much. So actually, Fiona wanted to respond to the gentleman from Italy, and then anybody wants to respond to Marilia, please do. Sure. Other questions? So, so to answer the, the first question, I think, um, even in the United States, where you have lots of different parts of the government that do different pieces, and even Congress does other things, at NTIA, we tried to actually live the multi-stakeholder model and propose processes and ways to do that. So, you know, we would convene these uh, multi-stakeholder processes domestically, which is c completely contrary to how Washington, D.C. works. Everybody goes and lobbies Congress, gets laws passed, and gets one of the regulators to do something. So my answer to you would be to try to find your part of the government that believes in what you believe in and go work with them. Yeah. Wait, oh wait, sorry. Uh, responses to Marilio. Yes. Um, first of all, I would observe, uh, don't waste a crisis, uh, because it really was a crisis uh, that, uh, that drove a lot of the net mundial situation. People wanted to deal with the crisis. Um, I was going to suggest a tactic that we should pay attention to. Internet governance is not going to work very well unless you take into account the transnational nature of the network and the businesses that it, is, uh, that it has spawned. And transnational activity means cooperation at the uh, multilateral level. So we're going to need governments to work together in order to fashion a multinational, transnational regime to allow these uh, multinational companies to function in the way which everyone seems to want. OK. Um, actually, before we go to the next in-room, I forgot about the online people. We have a question from online. Yes, the question is, why should permissionless innovation be taken out of the document or redefined or clarified? Uh, in other words, if there are abuses of this principle, the trouble with the principle needs to be addressed. Clarify the damn thing. <laughs> At that time, the sort of spirit in the private sector was, let's innovate and see what uh, the law says has to say about this later. And this emphasis on innovation at the cost of the regulatory framework, existing regulatory frameworks of markets, that has changed. Um, I don't know who it was, perhaps. It's changed. I mean, I was at the West Coast two or three weeks ago, and my feeling is it's changing. I can see employees of the IT industry getting really depressed about the reputation they have at the moment. That Mark Zuckerberg travels Europe and asks for regulation because he has created something that is beyond his own means to set the rules for. That has that reflects that reflects a change that we could not see five years ago. I see really a sort of change of tide at the moment. Uh, not some. I mean, I'm. It sounds sort of more positive uh, than I mean it. I don't. I'm not really happy with this idea of now let's regulate content. It is a very difficult thing, and it uh, sort of affects potentially negatively uh, human rights, particularly those of freedom of speech. So I see a real danger here. But what I mean to say that we. Would 
wouldn't put the principle as permissionless innovation as unqualified anymore in a document as we did at that time. So just, just to suggest that there is a crisis here, the, the nature of the crisis is that uh, if there is going to be any kind of regulation relating to product, service, and content, what you would prefer is something more or less uniform as opposed to 193 countries worth of regulation, all diverse. And so the crisis is, which I think Zuckerberg and others are recognizing, is that if we're going to have regulation, then we ought to have coherent regulation as opposed to incoherent regulation. Okay, we have almost no time left, but we have two people who want to ask questions, so let's just try to be as concise as possible and then I'll wrap it. So go ahead. Hi, I'm Jan, a public law, public international law researcher from the University of Hamburg. Um, in my research, I look at transnational spaces, uh, the deep sea outer space, yeah, which are the common heritage of humanity, and how they are regulated, and compare that to internet governance. And uh, one thing why I'm so incredibly thankful for the Net Mundial uh, statement, because I think it condensed core values, core principles of internet governance. And I'd be interested to hear how in the field of institutions uh, we can progress. Like the Net Mundial statement being a kind of um, constitutional document, yeah, one of the constitutional documents of the internet for the principles. And where's the progression on institutions? Do we need a stronger interaction maybe of the Internet Governance Forum and the UN? Do we need more public international law on, on the topic? That would be my question. And I hand over to the next. Thank you very much. Hi, Igor Ostrowski from IGF Poland. Um, I love what, Andriette, you, you said, and I fully agree that it's time to uh, freshen up the principles and maybe put some more meat on it. There's probably not much um, we can do right now, but actually IGF is coming to Poland in, uh, next year, and maybe um, we can start thinking about actual actions and what we can do. Um, so all I wanted to, um, to ask is uh, not to uh, lose this opportunity, and if we can somehow put the, this into the words and then into action, um, and in a, to, to do something concrete, so that when we meet in a year, we don't spend it, we're not in the same space, I, I, would, I would be a very happy man. Excellent. All right, listen, I want to thank everybody for staying in this hot room for two hours after lunch, trying to digest and process all this information at the same time. I think we covered a good deal of ground, and I think we drew some important... If nobody's listening to me, I won't talk anymore. Okay. Uh, I think we, we drew some important lessons that normative agreements, multi-stakeholder agreements, can be useful and do have a diffuse impact, but in order to translate into something concrete, we need to have institutional commitments and foci to be able to pick things up. It's not enough to just have declaratory statements that say the world ought to do X. We, have, we need statements that say actors X, Y, and Z should do, and, and so on. So we need to be more specific. But anyway, I think we've we moved the ball forward. This helps to set up the discussion of the other proposals that are on the table for this meeting. I thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can I have your attention for a second, please? Uh, this event is for the uh, MENA regional discussion. So if you are in the room for that session, I invite you please to take your seats. Uh, if you are not, I also invite you, if you would, to make room for colleagues who are making this session. Thank you. Uh, colleagues at the back of the room, if you would please, colleagues, if you would please take your seats, or if you want to have this discussion as well, you are welcome to have it just at the foyer. So uh, I think it's time to say good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. This is the IGF Regional Dialogue on Overcoming Barriers for the uh, meaningful, meaningful Participation for the MENA region. Um, my name is Hisham Abu Yazid. Uh, I'm with the NTRA of uh, Egypt. I'm happy to welcome you here on behalf of NTRA and uh, accompanied with our friends, uh, co-organizers from MIB, NCC, and uh, ISOC. Um, uh, this session, allow me first just to uh, take a few minutes to outline a few ideas and thoughts on the motivation for this session and uh, how also we are going to organize uh, our event. Um, so um, basically this session will, will go for um, our three hours, uh, so we are supposed to uh, close by 6.15 uh, p.m. Uh, we are organizing our session in uh, two segments, so uh, there will be two panels that will be invited to take their seats uh, in turn. Uh, but allow me at the outset just to uh, share a few ideas on how we actually uh, came here today and the motivation behind uh, uh, this session. Uh, when we first actually started to work on the concept for this event, uh, it was back in March, um, as many of you would know, maybe this is not the uh, first time we are having a similar discussion, but it was for us back uh, in March, it was obvious that we needed to take um, uh, this opportunity and make this gathering uh, for a couple of ideas. Uh, there were a number of factors actually that we thought uh, it's worth to have um, a new discussion uh, for. Um, mainly it was, it was obvious that uh, some new initiatives are taking place uh, globally and regionally. Uh, some new actors also and are coming into, into play uh, with more relevance for them and for new communities as well in the MENA region. Um, uh, also, uh, the, the classical actors, I would say, many of them were working hard in the last uh, year or two uh, to revamp their engagement uh, strategies and to, to reprogram their activities as well. Uh, but many of them, I would say, um, were less uh, holistic in the approach. So we are trying to uh, bring everyone to this discussion and try to uh, build synergies around uh, these uh, common priorities, I would say. Um, so uh, uh, very quickly, allow me to, uh, uh, to come to the uh, first panel. Uh, we, have, uh, we are lucky actually to have two very able uh, moderators. Uh, we have uh, Christina Aida and we have Hanan Bujimi. Uh, many of you already maybe uh, know. Uh, uh, segment one of this uh, discussion uh, will be led by uh, Christine. Uh, Christine is the executive director for planning and telecom services at uh, NTRA. Uh, she comes with uh, extended uh, experience in IG domain and uh, ICT policy in general. Um, she has been 
engaged with IGF since uh, 2006, and she has been a member of MAG uh, for many years as well. Uh, following that, uh, Hanan Bujimi will uh, lead us uh, for the second panel. Uh, Hanan is the uh, executive director for Policy Tech Tank. Uh, she is a permanent expert uh, on IG in the region and on uh, digital policies. Uh, I'm sure she will uh, also be able to lead us to a great discussion. So segment one will mainly uh, focus um, uh, more on capacity building activities and uh, engagement efforts by uh, many organizations who are uh, acting globally and uh, also regionally. Uh, second part of the agenda will look more broadly uh, at uh, several initiatives uh, that are addressing uh, the region and some of them actually are actually uh, at the, working at the national and regional level. So uh, without further ado, I invite uh, Christine uh, to take us forward, please. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Hashem. And if I can invite panelists uh, to come uh, uh, to the stage. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, panels for the first segment. And uh, do we have working microphones uh, at the table or? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ishan, for this introduction. And uh, it's a real pleasure actually to be here and uh, to discuss. I think um, I'm happy, uh, explicitly happy to see uh, discussions uh, uh, about and from the MENA region, something that we ha might have been missing for a couple of IGFs, but I think a strong presence, I see a strong presence in this IGF. And um, I'm really happy about that. Partially, uh, maybe, and I should give due thanks at, right at the start to the German government who have uh, uh, enabled the participation um, from very different uh, um, uh, various regions. Um, uh, and so thank you for that. So um, um, the first panel is on uh, regional engagement and capacity uh, development efforts. And um, um, I, I hope that um, together with uh, the distinguished panel, which I'll be um, right now introducing, um, I hope we can actually uh, uh, add uh, value to existing efforts that uh, are already happening in the region, specifically on boosting engagement uh, uh, in internet governance from uh, our region, um, not only uh, on a global level, but also uh, more uh, nationally and, uh, and regionally. And, um, and um, the, 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 the first segment is supposed to actually look at existing efforts in capacity building uh, and uh, closer so that we can all be aware of what is happening. Some of us uh, uh, maybe need to have more information on uh, different efforts. But also, uh, I hope we can together identify common challenges uh, uh, that we all face when we try to boost engagement each in his different capacity, and how can we actually work together and develop uh, uh, solutions to overcome in a more um, uh, coherent and build up uh, uh, way uh, those uh, challenges. So um, I have a, a great panel with me. I thank them all for uh, accepting uh, to be part of uh, the event. And I will right at start uh, maybe introduce all so we can then have um, a discussion together that is vivid. And um, I, I'm, we plan to have a very interactive discussion with all of you. So I will stop at uh, various points through the uh, through the coming um, 75 minutes to hear from more from uh, participants uh, on their input as well. So uh, let me just um, um, go of, uh, according to my <laughs> uh, setup. I have uh, Shafi uh, Shaya from uh, uh, RIPE NCC. Uh, Shafi is Regional Communication Manager for, uh, for uh, Middle East Region at RIPE NCC, and he actively works with uh, uh, RIPE members and uh, the other and the, the larger stakeholders uh, uh, range uh, on um, um, different activities and topics related to internet governance and capacity building, uh, both nationally and also uh, regionally. I also have Manal Ismail. Manal Ismail is Executive Director for International Technical Coordination at the National Telecom Regulatory Authority of Egypt. She's also um, uh, the elected chair of uh, the Government Advisory Committee uh, of ICANN. 
I have at the very um, uh, left Vladimir Radunovic. Uh, Vladimir is a director, uh, cybersecurity and e-diplomacy programs director um, at Diplo Foundation. Uh, Vladimir is also a lecturer in uh, cybersecurity policy, internet governance and e-diplomacy for uh, postgraduate and professional courses. He also serves as member of the advisory board uh, of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise uh, and an expert uh, with the Geneva Internet Platform. I um, um, also have Fahd, Fahd Bataina. Fahd uh, works for ICANN as part of the global stakeholder engagement team. He covers the Middle East uh, and he contributes uh, to regional and national IGFs, um, uh, schools on internet governance, and deeply involved in many uh, different capacity development uh, programs. Uh, I have uh, to my left uh, Susan Telsta. Uh, she is uh, uh, head of capacity and digital skills development division and acting head of ICT data and analytics division uh, at the telecommunication development bureau BDT of the um, International Telecommunications Union ITU. Uh, uh, last but not least, I have Adel Suleiman. Uh, Adel is a senior policy officer, uh, African Union uh, Commission. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me maybe uh, start right away with our uh, first uh, question today or first point that we want to discuss. And um, um, I will maybe start by Shafi. Um, um, right, you go first, Shafi. <laughs> so at, the first point that I would like to tackle in this panel is um, how can we actually uh, work to increase meaningful stakeholder participation uh, from the region in internet governance um, and digital policy discussions. So um, there is so much going on in internet governance and it's broadening, not becoming less. Uh, and we see the impact on the region. Um, we see that where we've been active, we're not capable to follow. We need a lot maybe of uh, development. We need more people to be engaged. Uh, and so um, what are the different uh, programs that are there, how can we actually achieve that meaningful participation through the different programs? So if you want to take, uh, I think the mic uh, in front of you might be working. Shafi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, thanks for being with us. And thank you for NTRA and ISOC for organizing this uh, pre-event uh, with Drive NCC. Uh, I am optimistic in my life, so I will start with what we are doing, and at the end, I will share with you the challenges that we have in capacity development. It's well known that uh, a country's successful development depends on having sufficient capacity. In the context of, of internet, the financial resources and the technology are vital. However, without skilled and trained people, we cannot promote for a sustainable internet development. As a regional uh, internet registry, uh, our main function is to allocate internet resor uh, number resources to Europe, Middle East, and part of Central Asia, and to keep a comprehensive uh, record for these allocations. But at the same time, we uh, promises to have the, business, the, the uh, development or the capacity building as a, as a prime contribution to our members and to our uh, community. How we do this? We have many uh, channels and paths uh, in doing this. So we have face-to-face -face and online courses we have a training, we have seminars, we visit countries, we uh, have tailored uh, solutions for each country. Uh, we uh, deal with all stakeholders from uh, the community, uh, private business like ISPs, mobile operator, governments uh, with TRAs, uh, academic with universities, and uh, financial institutions with banks. So we covered the whole region in the last five years when I joined RIPE NCC, and we did a really a nice job, and the outcomes are really was fruitful. However, this comes with challenges. First challenge that we have, I can summarize by three words, reach the unreachable. We have some regions and countries that we can't visit for different reasons. So to deal with this challenge, 
or we invite these countries to join us in another neighbor country or through online seminars. But with this, we have a limitation in doing what we call hands-on exercises. Second challenge that I can, that from, my, uh, from our experience we can share with you is that each country has its own issues related to internet. So we need to tailor solutions to these countries that fits their needs. Doing this, we need more resources that with our organization, we have limited resources to, to do uh, these uh, tailored solutions. And here comes the joint effort with ISOC or with ITUD, with ICANN, to uh, handle or deliver these uh, trainings, each in his expertise. The third one, which, is I, which I can see it from outside the box, is that when we have these experts and when we deliver this uh, training on the ground, these skilled people leave the country. So we need to have a suitable incentive environment to keep these local people in the country itself. Or not, they can go out and have expat contract and work for other uh, international organization. So this is the main three issues that I can share with you. Of course, some details from each country. Uh, for example, sometimes we don't have the suitable training, trainees, participants. So instead of having one level of people who have back technical background, we have different level of technical people and we need to, you know, to go slow with this. Uh, and then we have this uh, timetable, different uh, income, different output. So there are some related issues uh, that are related to certain countries. But on and all, we are uh, doing our best to are delivering all what we can in our uh, ex uh, area of expertise, and we are, de we are dealing with all issues that we have. Sometimes we can do compromise, sometimes, you know, as a neutral uh, center of expertise, we give them the best case studies, we give them the success stories, and they will choose and, uh, you know, select the, 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 uh, the, the scenario that fits the country itself. Oh, thank you, Shafi. Maybe very briefly before, before you leave the mic as well, if you can, because Ripen CC has this unique, um, um, I think, um, I don't know if it's unique, but I mean, uh, has this special setup of running, the, of uh, supporting the MENOC, uh, which is uh, gathering network operators in the region, but also does with governments a lot of work because explicitly your membership base is diverse. Um, and so from your experience in terms of uh, capacity building, do you think that uh, getting uh, connections or bridges between the world of uh, actual operators and governments is something that we still need to work on when we tackle capacity building? Very briefly, yeah. if you can also address that. We know that uh, the culture in the Middle East region is totally different from the European uh, countries. In Europe, the private sector leads in the Middle East country. If we don't have the green light from the government, we can't go anywhere, to be frank. But I can tell that the governments are really lead in some initiative and projects and really give us a lot of help and give the resources that we need. The question that, yes, due to certain divergence in points of view between governments and private sector, that they seek the same goal, by the way. The, when we meet with the governments and we meet with the, government, with the private sector, both of the players, they uh, have the same goal to develop the internet and to work for the good of the internet in their country. But both players, they have their own perception and they have their own paths to, to arrive to this uh, goal. So yes, we are trying to be facilitator, let's say, put the governments and the private on the same table to try to uh, find a common ground for both of them. And we succeed in this. Now I can, I can share with you that in the, in the Middle East country, in the Middle East region, we have four IPv6 enabled countries. We have Saudi, we have Emirates, we have Oman, and we have Lebanon. And these four countries, this collaboration between the different stakeholders make our effort and make the, 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 the result that we see now that we are in the right track, I say. We still have time, but we are on the right track. Thank you, Shafi. Now, speaking about governments, maybe I can turn uh, to Manel. 
uh, Ismail. So, uh, Manel, from the perspective of GAC, and you work very closely uh, with all governments uh, uh, in leading the GAC, how do you see uh, efforts for capacity building or for engagement in the region maybe different than uh, elsewhere? What is much needed more here than elsewhere? How does the engagement look uh, for the GAC in terms of governments? Um, thank you, Christine. Um, and uh, so the GAC has uh, 178 uh, member uh, governments and uh, 38 uh, intergovernmental organizations participating as observers. Uh, but yet, uh, from the 178 members, we are having very limited uh, participation, particularly from our region. Um, in terms of membership, uh, we're only missing four countries from the region, uh, but still, um, as I said, the, the active participation uh, and, and the real engagement uh, is, is uh, very limited. Um, so I, I'll try to divide the challenges, some of which I believe we are already addressing well, uh, but also uh, other uh, challenges we're missing. Um, so uh, first of all, in terms of um, the topics that are being discussed, they are quite complex. The working language is English, of course, um, so there may be a language barrier, uh, there may be complexity of issues, um, and of course this is um, in addition to um, the workload and, and other things. Um, the GAC has been conducting capacity building uh, workshops uh, for quite some time now as a joint initiative between the un GAC underserved regions working group um, along with um, ICANN teams um, of uh, government engagement and global stakeholder engagement. Um, so far we had um, uh, 10 workshops uh, and we had uh, 290 participants uh, from the different regions, uh, speaking about our region, uh, we already had three uh, workshops, one in Abu Dhabi in United Arab Emirates, one in Marrakesh in Morocco, and, and one in Bahrain, um, a very recent one in uh, September, last September. Um, the objective of the capacity building workshops, uh, of course, is lowering barriers to participation and encouraging uh, active engagement of uh, GAC members, uh, but also to make sure their voices are being heard um, uh, during the discussions uh, in order to be taken into consideration. Uh, we build the workshops around the needs and requirements uh, of the different regions. As Shafi mentioned, uh, each and every uh, country, they, they have different requirements and, and different uh, uh, needs. Uh, but also we help bringing uh, participants up to speed on specific hot topics uh, that are being discussed uh, uh, within uh, the GAC and ICANN at large. Uh, we've also tried to put other measures in place uh, to address um, other challenges. So we have um, real-time interpretation during the meetings in six UN languages uh, plus Portuguese. Uh, we have uh, real-time uh, captioning and transcription. Uh, we have translation of some documents and some parts of some documents. And this one is a bit challenging because we're not getting the usage that would justify the cost of, of, uh, of translating everything in all languages. So this is, uh, we're still struggling with this. Um, I can provide travel support to 35 GAC members and five observers. Um, um, and in addition to the capacity building workshops, we also hold a first timer session um, at the beginning of each meeting, face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we hold webinars before the meetings and read out sessions as well, and I'm sure Fahd will also uh, speak about this after uh, the meetings. Um, and uh, we also, um, we've been holding a high level governmental meeting uh, every other year, uh, because the feedback we got from GAC members was that we failed to convince our uh, 
our managers about the importance uh, of uh, attending uh, GAC uh, meetings. So we try to do this to bring to the attention of um, high-level governmental officials uh, the work of ICANN and the GAC so that they can spare their delegates uh, the authority to speak during the meetings, the resources to, to attend the meetings, but also to follow up the discussions uh, online and, and, uh, and the time to, to participate as well. Um, uh, there is also an ongoing dialogue within ICANN on the evolution of the multi-stakeholder model of ICANN and how uh, this could facilitate the participation um, of those who are not uh, uh, deeply engaged yet. So all these are some uh, of the efforts that are uh, currently in place uh, to address uh, the, the weak uh, participation. Um, I have to say that those may have addressed a few of the challenges, but we are still facing, for example, uh, challenges regarding continu continuity of participation. So we have a very high turnover. We, we do the capacity building workshops, we do the, the orientation and everything, but then the representative changes. And unfortunately, there is not a smooth handover between uh, uh, those who are participating, so this is uh, still a challenge. Um, another challenge is the, the workload and pr the prioritization itself, and, and we've got also feedback from members uh, that they fail to link the work um, or the discussion we're having uh, with the national agendas. So this is also something we are still trying uh, to work on and, and to address. So um, I think I may stop here, uh, but um, yeah, I, I, I have a few suggestions, but I'm not sure whether this is the right point in time or. I, I think we can come back on them, but I wanted maybe to trigger one point, uh, maybe out of your experience, because I know that there was, um, a phase when there was there was heavy engagement from from the region on specific topics within the ICANN GAC, like that when there were discussions about specific domains. So um, my question here is, how can we draw from that experience? And maybe if you'd like to reflect now, or maybe also later, on how can the topics, when they're relevant really, or when they are mutual interest, uh, you know, trigger engagement in a more snowball effect between countries of the region? So. So uh, you're right, Christine, and, and at some point in time, we got uh, good participation from uh, countries within the region uh, when there was uh, really a, a hot topic that concerns the region. Um, and this had to do with a few uh, new GTLD strings uh, like uh, .islam, .halal, uh, .gcc, and, and a few others. The uh, problem is, if you don't follow up the discussions and participate, you will get to miss the whole thing. So despite the fact that maybe not every single thing is equally of interest to everyone, but still it's important to follow uh, what's being discussed and, and at least keep an eye on anything that may be of interest or um, alerts the region. Um, another very good example also was the introduction of IDNs. Uh, this was also a, a very successful exercise in collaboration from the region. So, and, and this was one of my, the suggestions actually, is uh, regional coordination in preparation for the meetings, but also follow up after the meetings because this was vital in, in the introduction of uh, IDNs and uh, we all were speaking one voice. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Manel. So um, uh, before maybe I turn to one round of uh, floor, I will give the floor to Vlada. So Vlada, you've heard a bit uh, on efforts that are, uh, um, that are directed to the region. 
and speaking about how to get the region together uh, to further engagement and or to boost engagement. I think we might want to hear from you on new trends, on innovative ways, on you know thinking out of the box in terms of capacity, capacity building and engagement, maybe reaching out to new disciplines. I know uh, you had many ideas, to, so if you can give us uh, an idea, and also what are the challenges that you see, you've worked with the region, what are the challenges that you see from your perspective as maybe an outsider organization, and then how can we tackle that? Please. Thanks, Christine, and, and first of all, thank you for inviting me to join this. I always feel so pleasant being in, in the company of all, all the people I know. <clears throat> uh, some folks in Diplo, they prepared a photoshopped version of me as Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> the Komivlada of Arabia, because they, they know that, exactly, they know that I like being in the region. Uh, but you, you already mapped quite some, quite some things which are important. One is that uh, there, is no, there is no single bullet. Uh, there, you need to adjust the, the approach to everyone. Then you have the new actors, you have the new topics. If we look at the internet governance 10 years ago, even five years ago, uh, the topics were completely different. N not different, but they were not so in-depth. We were talking about IG. Now we're not talking about IG. We're talking about security, cybersecurity, privacy, human rights, artificial intelligence, and then artificial intelligence and ethics and principles and human rights. It's really much in-depth in than it used to be five years ago. Uh, you have a lot of institutions which have no, a lot of people which know much more than we used to have. So the IG is changing, if we wish. The geopolitics is changing. Um, five years ago, uh, who was talking about uh, data protection? It was mainly the advocacy groups. It was mainly the, the, the NGOs, not the states, not that much. In the last five years, we got the states talking about uh, data localization, uh, the GDPR came on, and so on. Talking about security. Uh, now we see the cybersecurity or national security being being within the trade wars even. Let's, geopolitics is changing. So there are a lot of things that are changing. And then the target group is also changing. Uh, we here, we are a big family at the IGF, and we know each other. But coming to diplomats, coming to parliamentarians, coming to people that actually bring decisions, it has always been a challenge. And it's not just in the Middle East uh, region. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, just look at the... <clears throat> I would begin to, to actually see the success of this year's campaign to bring the parliamentarians to the IGF. And there is funding, and there is a sort of a communication. I don't know what the results are. It would be good to hear if we know. But it's not easy to get the parliamentarians which actually want to come here. I don't know if there are any parliamentarians here. Uh, okay, I, I don't have to be cautious what I'm speaking, <laughs> even though it goes to transcript. No, but seriously, I mean, it's, it's not easy. <clears throat> so some of the... Um, uh, some of the lessons learned from, from, what is it now, almost 20 years of Diplo's work in capacity building in, in ICT and diplomacy, in a way. Um, one thing is certainly that the capacity development is, is, is not um, an event. It's not a training. It's not um, a course. It's a process. It really needs to be the process. And we usually forget about it. Uh, we usually do the training, and we say, okay, that's it. People are, are there. Uh, you can do the training... Um, which I, I think is very useful, like what ICANN does, what ISEC does, we do it as well. Back to back to IGF, ICANN meetings and so on. But that means that you get the people that might, at best, understand what's, what they're going to listen to at the next, in the next two, three, four days. But they don't have time to actually build the, the opinion and, and get the courage to jump on and say, this is what I think about cybersecurity. This is what I think about, about I don't know, human rights or intellectual property rights. Uh, so it needs to be the process which actually our experience shows that what, what used to be uh, working in a way is that you start with, with a, let's say, we start with the online program which lasts for like 10, 10 weeks, which is highly intensive, and mid-level professionals get into the topic, into details. Then, uh, a couple of days ago, or back to back with the event, we bring them together to firstly meet. Secondly, they already have a strong base, they understand, then they have a chance to learn from the experts in vivo and exchange the opinions in, you know, setting face-to-face, -face. then they're in the process. So the sort of a, the immersion at the IGF, at the ICANN and so on. And then they have the courage to raise a hand and if Windsurf is speaking, someone will say, Mr. Surf, I have this opinion. Otherwise, they're going to be shy and sit down back and not doing anything. That's for the mid-level professionals. For the diplomats and the decision makers, it's, it's also different. They're in different shoes. Mid-level professionals might have the interest to learn about whatever the topic. Diplomats uh, or, or parliamentarians, they, they have different goals. Parliamentarians usually, well, face it, they want to win the next elections. You have to be in these shoes. Diplomats, like the missions of most of our countries, particularly Africa, Middle East, 
even Asia, in Geneva, in, in uh, New York, they're small. They have three, four people. They're covering everything from migrations to health to armament to whatever. NIG, digital. Well, who cares about digital? So you really have to be very cautious. How do you approach them to get them on table and, and be in their shoes? There is no, no silver bu bullet on that one either. Uh, what we try to, try to do is um, uh, focus on not only on what, and I think that's the key message. We, when we talk about capacity, build, uh, capacity development, we usually talk about what should we tell someone. I dare say that it's even more than 50% is how, not what. How do you approach them? We usually don't think about it. And it needs to be innovative. That means people don't read anything anymore. If you do the briefing, pay, uh, briefing reading, it needs to be a half a page, a page. A briefing for parliamentarians now has um, maximum one page on cybersecurity. That's nothing, but that's as much as they can read. As much as you can, you do the illustration, you do the visuals, that's something that, that's appealing. You do the blended approach uh, where you combine uh, online in situ, you, you try to target them, particularly higher level ones, ta ta try to target them to link the training with what's happening. For instance, there is a discussion in WTO, World Trade Organization on, I don't know, e-commerce. You try to come up to them a couple of weeks or months before the WTO because you know they will be immersed into that. And say, you need help on this. Oh, yes, we need. So that, try to link to, to, to what, what, what is actually their concern, right? Um, of course, try to put it on the level they can understand. Again, that's, that's how. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the regional integration, it's not easy. I think using, using uh, uh, and I think Adil will talk uh, later on about the Brida project, but actually using the regional approach to, to a more comprehensive capacity development process, not just the, the program, that's the key. Uh, and with a blended thing, and there is one more thing. We can train the mid-level people. We can train, we can raise the awareness among the high-level people. But if we don't link them vertically, if those on the top don't understand they have people on the, on the ground, and if those on the mid-level don't, don't know that the guys up know about them, we didn't do anything. We have silos, right? So we have to find, we have to do it comprehensively. I know it's a buzzword. It's not easy. Uh, but, but it really needs to be about how even more than about what. And I'll stop there, but you can get back to it. No, thank you, Vlada. Very, very interesting about all the linkages that we have made. It looks to me like many dimensional linkages that, uh, that are needed out there. So maybe let me turn out uh, to you. And uh, if someone would like uh, to grab a mic, I don't know if we have mics. Do we have any mics in the room? Um, if not, yeah. And, uh, and I kindly ask you to introduce yourself and be yes. uh, concise very so that brief, we can uh, hear from other Th people. Thank you, Christina, and thanks to your distinguished uh, speakers. And uh, it is all about capacity building and uh, involvement. But really, since the last IGF... Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, my name is, uh, sorry, my name is Khalid Ibrahim from the Gold Center for Human Rights. Um, Last IGF, together with efforts from Hanan and Dr. Willis Saqaf, we managed to, uh, to have a meeting for MENA participants, and we agreed to uh, have consultation in preparation for this IGF. Unfortunately, none of that happened. And now, in this IGF, all our chronic problems are not addressed. Where is the consultation with civil society? So far, the IGF Arab, we don't know anything about the Arab IGF, whether it's council, dead, alive, nobody is telling us anything. Now, to this IGF, did we do any cooperation to address our chronic problems, the lack of uh, uh, network neutrality, uh, the lack of freedom of expression on the internet, and the fact that internet is, is, uh, is all, all the time blocked in countries such as Lebanon and Iraq and other places just because people, uh, they want to communicate about peaceful protests. I mean, I believe strongly that we need to address the real problems, the fact that the IBS, all the time, the internet uh, service providers are owned by, on many occasions, by intelligent services. Who, when we are going to cooperate to support our people to have freedom of expression on the net, when we are going to provide internet for the poorer of our communities, when we are going to consult with civil society, just talk about these problems. These are very important. Civil society activists and their organizations 
are not enemies. We just want to have a peaceful change in our countries in which our citizens will have a rule and a future that is prosperous for everybody. Thank, Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Khaled. And I think, yeah, I think the part of uh, the panel here is actually to identify mechanisms whereby we can do linkages, to talk, to have uh, processes or uh, uh, venues where we can actually discuss all those points that are relevant. But also your points are very important to take back when we, uh, when we talk about capacity building so that we, we can go to civil society and then to governments and then to the different stakeholders, to the industry, and say here are the concerns that are coming from the other stakeholders group. Uh, um, if anyone else would like to chime in, I, oh, please. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Christine. Uh, my name is Ayman Al Sherbini. I'm uh, from the United Nations Economic Social Commission for Western Asia and the Arab IGF community. Uh, I would like uh, to shed light uh, on another angle uh, related to the participation and the word meaningful. So, for some people, look at it as the, the availability or accessibility, which we have discussed accessibility to knowledge, accessibility to participation, things like that. For some others, including ours, UN, for example, look at it from a totally different angle, which is the meaningful participations should uh, be linked to the impact of participation. So when there is an impact of participation, then for some constituencies would uh, look at it as meaningful. So can we also have a round of discussion on how can we really and this is a problem related to the uh, regional IGFs only, but the IGF model in general. And this is something I talked with Vlada before on, re related to that and with uh, Jovan and many others. How can we start a new era of uh, uh, impact sizing, whatever the word is, the IGF dialogue or the INRI's dialogue into something that even we can measure and say, look, this was a connection. This was because of the, uh, that this happened, the global that this happened and so on, regarding policy change, whatever the policy is, be it net neutrality or fake news or whatever. So please, can you shed light on that angle, uh, impact? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayman. I believe uh, the next segment will talk about policy development, and I think it will be very relevant uh, uh, and I invite Hanan, maybe uh, when she's motoring, to actually address how impactful, impactful policy development can be and how to measure that. And I think I look at it as a closed circle because at the end of the day, capacity development and engagement need actually to learn from the impact of policy development and you know uh, evolve. So I'll take one more intervention uh, from the floor and then turn back to the panel. Uh, okay, I'll take one and then we will have another round, so please. Can I go on? Yes, please, but introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Uduma. I'm from Nigeria, and um, I'm part of the Africa uh, Regional um, IGF, and um, both at the continental level and at the, at the sub-regional level, that's the West Africa. And um, um, I think we have made a lot of progress from the day I came to the IG space. Uh, first, there was the issue of language barrier that um, hindered so many of the African countries. I don't know about the, the, um, the Middle East, I, I suppose is the same from participating. Participating partially, I mean, passively and uh, effectively participating. So um, uh, now the, language, the, the, the business of uh, IG space had always been in, um, in uh, English. In uh, most of the countries, uh, we don't have um, the we do, we don't speak English, and English is not our first language. So that's one one big barrier that I have uh, also identified. Um, secondly, the question of having national IGFs because that's the grassroots, and that's where it begins, and that's where awareness creation would be. So anything that can promote, anything we can do to promote the national IGFs being in place, then we can speak to ourselves in our local languages because in West Africa, we have the French speaking countries that have organizing their um, national IGFs. They are now participating effectively in IGF, even in ICANN. 
And again, translation and interpretation has, in, you know, has increased in this uh, space. And so we'll see more of uh, our people coming in uh, or participating, not only pass passively, but effectively. So any mechanism we'll be looking at will be the one that will promote the national IGF processes in our countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Very, very also um, inspiring to uh, listen uh, to uh, the different challenges also from the African region. I think there are so many synergies that, uh, that can be drawn here. So um, uh, with that comment from Mary, maybe I can turn to Fahd. Um, ICANN has been uh, a supporter of national IGFs, regional IGFs, but also many other initiatives that I can say can be labeled as multi-stakeholder partnerships and initiatives. Uh, the question is, how do the challenges look? And I know there are many uh, that are unique for the region here. Uh, so what is, from your perspective, this experience, and if you can shed also light on um, engaging maybe civil society, because this is one of the questions that came from the floor. I think uh, there is a story to tell you, so Fahd, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Christine, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure being here uh, with you. Uh, so at ICANN, uh, we've always been supportive of um, internet governance-related initiatives because the whole concept of internet governance revolves around uh, bottom-up, uh, multi-stakeholder, consensus-driven, uh, mechanisms, uh, and actually that falls at the heart of uh, ICANN's policy development process. Of course, there are many misconceptions, uh, sorry, m m misassumptions around ICANN and what it does, and actually that has a spillover effect on uh, our role in internet governance. Uh, so for example, many people approach us thinking that we actually police the internet. Um, in, in, in some better cases, they assume that we actually regulate the DNS industry and we have the authority or the kill switch uh, to put on and put off uh, domain names. And, and, and that's where, of course, they start discussing with us about um, our, uh, a, a much needed deeper role in internet governance. Of course, uh, just so that we are all uh, on the same page, ICANN has a very limited mandate of uh, working on the unique identifier system. And if we exclude the part on uh, uh, IP addresses, which is in the hands of uh, the RIRs, um, and the protocols, which is in the hand of the IETF, uh, that really leaves ICANN uh, with, with the domain name uh, system. Now, as I mentioned, we do, uh, uh, we do, we do support uh, the internet governance uh, discussions. We, we support the internet governance ecosystem. And of course, as a result, uh, we also support initiatives around uh, internet governance, whether the forums, uh, national, regional, and, uh, sorry, national, regional, and global, uh, or even the schools on internet governance, again, at the uh, same three levels. Um, of course, within within the Middle East, for example, uh, there has been, we, we've had this uh, school on internet governance uh, for the for the MIAC region, which we call the MIAC region, which is the Middle East and adjoining countries. And actually, it was a request that was put in literally uh, when ICANN's engagement strategy was developed in the region uh, back in 2013. So they wanted a, a an organization to kind of uh, kickstart this initiative, um, an organization that would uh, be willing to inject. Um, sufficient funds uh, to actually have it. Uh, I can gladly took uh, took up the uh, the step, uh, the, sorry, this role, and of course uh, from day one we worked very closely with our iStar partners in the Middle East, uh, whether it be it uh, the regional internet registries, uh, RIPE and CC, of course, uh, worth mentioning here, um, and of course the the Internet Society. Um, of course, it's not, it makes no sense to, to lead such initiatives at a regional level because we are not the only player in the ecosystem. Uh, there are plenty of other players who are technical or non-technical um, who are actually a part of this ecosystem and actually in order to deliver uh, top class uh, uh, course, uh, uh, five day experience uh, under the, the hoodship of, of the School on Internet Governance, uh, we really need uh, everybody to be on board. Uh, speaking about uh, Internet Governance Forums, of course we have in the region uh, the uh, Arab IGF and the most recent uh, North Africa IGF. Again, ICANN supports these initiatives. And of course, uh, just to mention, just to pause here for a while, when I, when I speak about support, it doesn't necessarily mean financial support. You also can include human resources, because in working on these initiatives, there's a lot of manpower that is put, a lot of hours that are um, consumed into actually um, having um, solid agendas and, and, and having solid speaking roles. Um, 
and of course, uh, uh, kind of mobilizing the community and bringing relevant uh, people. Um, so yes, as I said, in the region, we have the Arab IGF, we have the North Africa IGF, uh, which we've al always supported and found to be very good platforms to actually uh, discuss our work at ICANN and at the same time engage uh, with the wider community and probably niches of community where you would not probably engage uh, elsewhere. And I'd like to emphasize on civil society. Um, our dear friend actually mentioned about civil society. So yes, I mean, in some parts of, of, of our region, uh, Middle East, uh, sorry, in some parts of our, uh, the, of, the, of the Middle East, uh, the term civil society is, is, is misunderstood, um, maybe intentionally, maybe not. Uh, but it's, um, in some countries, it's really a, a taboo term. And, and so even, even civil society activists, many of them tend to uh, shy away from actually you know, showing themselves as, as a civil society uh, people. Um, of course, over the course of the f uh, past six or seven years since the start of the Arab IGF and then the School on Internet Governance, and then we started seeing more national IGFs uh, national Schools on Internet Governance, and of course the most recent uh, North Africa IGF. I think there is still a lot to work on. You find that uh, many of the attendees are actually, um, have, have the very basic knowledge of understanding how the internet functions and what the internet function, uh, I mean, the, 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 the way in which the internet functions. It's, it's actually ironic, I, I engage a lot with academia and academic students, and one of the few questions uh, that I ask uh, on regular basis is, who runs the internet? Do you really think that the internet is a spying device by uh, the FBI or the CIA? And actually it just doesn't strike the mind of many people how, how really the, the internet functions. Yes, I mean, people can surveil the internet, people can monitor the internet, but it really depends more or less on policies that are put in place. And, and definitely this whole notion of the CIA and the FBI thrown into the frame nah, doesn't make uh, nah, much sense. Um, of course, um, just to wrap up, I think there is a lot uh, that still needs to be done uh, within the MENA region. Uh, a lot of capacities need to be developed. I think trying to, try, trying to integrate our work into curriculum, not necessarily under the term uh, internet governance, but under any other term, is, is very vital and very important for our communities to actually understand how this technology works, uh, what's the benefits of, of, uh, of, of this technology, and of course, how best uh, to embrace it to actually push our digital economy agendas forward. Thank you, Fat. Um, speaking of um, efforts of collaboration, um, I think, I think we, we need to look at also ways of how to integrate efforts uh, in this region, how we can actually uh, we have different silos, it was mentioned. We have many efforts from different organizations. We've heard from so many. But how can we actually work collectively? I think this is one of the challenges uh, that, that we may have. And I, I'm, I know the, um, the ITUD uh, has recently um, uh, come uh, with new development, uh, capacity development programs. And just recently, many of us have participated to a, um, to a, to a program that has uh, been in Bahrain. And um, to me, uh, having been there in Bahrain, it was striking that uh, there was a lot of collaboration between different stakeholders that don't usually, or different parties that haven't classically been coming together. I don't know about other regions, but in this region, they haven't been coming together. The other striking fact was that we had um, a new community that is not classical to the IG that was present there. And that was an addition because we were reaching out to new communities. So Susan, maybe you can tell us a bit more about collaboration in that effort and how do you foresee from the experience of Bahrain how to build upon that and actually have more of that uh, coming? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, Thank you, uh, Hisham, uh, he's left, but thank you for the organizers for inviting um, me and inviting ITU to, to be part of uh, this uh, panel. Um, I wanted to say a few words. I'm here in my capacity as head of um, capacity and digital skills development in ITU, but I'm also acting head of uh, statistics and I worked in that field for many years in the ITU and I wanted to, um, say something at the beginning that links those two topics in terms of um, the need to build capacities uh, more generally. Because, um, and I think it's, it's quite important to keep that in mind. Um, you may know that uh, just recently, 
we released new data um, on internet usage in, in 2019. So we are now at the level of about 58% of global internet usage. So keeping in mind that we still have a big, um, a big portion of the population that is actually not even um, online. Uh, we also found that the gender um, internet user gap has grown uh, significantly over the past six years. And, uh, and that's another concern we also have to keep in mind. And that gap is uh, especially large in the least developed countries, in the poorer countries, but in this region is also quite large. So we also need to keep that in mind. And my point, I wanted to make that bridge to, to capacity development is that um, uh, we do have a, a very good net, network coverage overall right now because we are also tracking the, um, the population that lives somewhere where they have access to a, a service, um, uh, a mobile service. So more than 95% of the population lives somewhere where they have access to a 3G um, service. So what I'm getting at is the one of the main reasons for why people are not using the internet is not necessarily because of the lack of access to the service, but if you ask them, a lot is around um, capacity and skills. That's one of the, the key barriers um, apart from affordability, content, we, we know all that, but the lack of uh, capacity and knowledge about internet and skills on use it uh, if, uh, to, for their benefits is one of the main reasons for why, that we have now to address in the future in order to get um, uh, more people online. So this is why it's so important to talk about capacity development and let me now come back to this particular issue of internet governance. So we were asked by our um, membership in, in our, our last World Telecommunication Development Conference in 2017 to specifically look into building capacities on internet governance uh, for our membership. Okay, so we do a lot of training on all sorts of topics, but they're usually very specific. Internet governance is not specific, and as you can see here at the forum, and we have seen the evolution of the Internet Governance Forum over the years, the topics that are being dealt with are, are very wide and very complex and they reach into many, many different aspects because governance aspects are related to so many topics we are discussing related to internet. So when we then said, okay, what are we go how are we going to do this uh, and how, how, will, how can it be actually done in a meaningful way? So first we looked around what is actually already done and we engaged also with Diplo at that stage to do a stock taking and a mapping of who is doing what on capacity development in internet governance. And there are so many stakeholders out there, all, all of us being here, uh, there is the academic institutions as the tech community, there is the civil society, there are all the international organizations so um, everybody is involved to some extent in that field and we're, we're, what should ITU be doing here? So we were, we were looking, we were taking stock, there were also recommendations made in, in this report that we commissioned and um, we are trying to address specifically our uh, membership which means our policy makers, our administrations, uh, regulatory authorities, authorities because uh, uh, that's a very specific target group that we work with in ITU and uh, we are trying to get them more involved into the debates on internet governance. But, uh, uh, and I would like to share with you um, three main points that we have, uh, how, we are, um, how we have approached it and what we found, uh, um, at least for now, useful, but we are, we are looking to developing this further. One is uh, the topic to, to, be, um, to be addressed in the capacity development uh, in this field. So we have started, uh, and also because we worked with Diplo at the beginning, to look at the basket approach that Diplo also has, which covers many different topics. And uh, we have used that as a basis also in our internet governance uh, capacity building workshops. So we look at uh, different uh, topics ranging from infrastructure to cybersecurity to data protection to digital um, economy to, of course, the domain names. Uh, we are looking at these different uh, topics because they all have governance uh, aspects and that needs to be clearly uh, communicated. However, at the same time, each region has a different uh, set of priorities 
and in the last uh, workshop, uh, um, because we decided to embark on a series of regional workshops on this, and the last one, uh, which uh, Christine referred to in Bahrain, um, also then started out with asking people, so what do you think are the regional priorities here in your region? And then later on, when we, um, during the workshop, when we put people into the breakout groups, they also had to work on issue prioritization for the particular region. So while we need to look at uh, being comprehensive, we also need to look at what are the priorities in the particular um, uh, region. And then the second point is um, on the multi-stakeholder approach. So, okay, you will say, so what, what's new about that? <laughs> That's what we are all doing here. But in terms of capacity building from our point of view in ITU, it's, it has, it's a different approach than what we have done in our traditional training where usually we, have, uh, we hire experts who are um, e experts from academia or others who are, who are knowledgeable on one certain subject and then they deliver the training. This is obviously not the case with internet governance because uh, every a different stakeholder group um, has a different role to play in the internet governance uh, process. So it became clear very early on we, we need and we want to work with other um, um, uh, partners on this so that we get the diverse uh, view and also the expertise from every uh, partner that is um, involved in, in the particular subject area. So this is why we have um, partnered like in our last uh, workshop in, um, in Bahrain, we had Diplo, we had RIPE NCC, we had ISOP, we had ICANN. Um, we had, um, uh, who did I forget? <laughs> I suck, I think I mentioned, yeah. So they were all there um, and, and others, everybody who is now also on this panel and also in the subsequent panel and it's, um, it's quite important because of the different, uh, of the different uh, subject matters that are being uh, dealt with. So that's another uh, different approach that we are taking in, in this particular uh, work on capacity building on internet governance. And then the third uh, element is how we are delivering the training. So we have, um, we have experimented to do it in a way where we have a mix of, um, uh, of presentations to have some knowledge transfer, but then we have a lot of engagement of the participants through breakout groups, through role play, through simulation exercises where they can actually uh, uh, try to do some real life um, uh, uh, practices in terms of uh, uh, discussing and uh, even negotiating in, in different groups and also taking different uh, perspectives. So the policy makers will have to take perhaps the defend the interests of the civil society so that forces them to look at things from a different perspective. And this is also something that, that actually participants like this most. Um, about, this, um, about this, this kind of delivery of training. So that's something that, uh, that could be also looked at more in the future. Thank you Thank very you. much, Susan. Um, so maybe I can turn to Adil. Uh, Adil, um, now speaking about, um, uh, <laughs> speaking about uh, different um, initiatives and about uh, you know, collaboration, um, the African Union has the PRIDA initiative or the PRIDA project and I know that there is a specific um, um, uh, vertical on internet governance, the capacity development. And um, since the North African region, part of the MENA region is obviously um, uh, an area when we have many colleagues also from uh, the North African region and the North African IGF present, uh, is an area that also maybe needs a lot of uh, work in terms of engagement. I'd like to hear your experience uh, as African Union in that, uh, and also what you think, um, how, how can we actually connect dots between the different initiatives um, in light of the PRIDA project? And maybe also, sorry, reach out beyond the region, because I know you have many collaboration with uh, Europe in that. Thank you, Christine. I, I think PRIDA with I, Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. So it's an I, it's not an E. Um, I like the question that were asked, by the way, in the beginning. And I think that this goes to the heart of the issue. Uh, in the African Union, we looked at uh, at why Africans are not participating in the global debate, actively participating, as you mentioned, and we try to answer this question. And in collaboration with European Union, we came up with this policy and regulation initiative for Digital Africa, which has uh, several tracks, but one of which is the 
IG track, Internet Governance track. And um, I think we need not focus on the mechanics, like having the IGF and so forth, but we have to look at the impact. We need to create value, not only to those who are attending the forum, but those who are not lucky enough to be in, in the forums, whether it's at the national level, regional level, or the uh, global level. So PREDA, I think tomorrow at noon, we'll have a session. Um, we're going to talk more about the PREDA initiative. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, we are trying to address the question uh, of creating value and impact and having ac uh, active Africa participation in the global debate. So PREDA has two streams, right? Particularly when it, we talk about IG. Number one, we wanted to make sure that we strengthen and enable processes at national, uh, sub-regional, and regional level. This is number one. Number two is to build capacity. Build capacity also national, regional, and continental level as well. So in terms of uh, uh, strengthening the processes First of all, there are countries who don't have IG processes. We wanted to make sure that all 55 African countries will have processes in place, right? And there was a discussion about the policy development process. We need to make sure that these are enabled so that they can, of course, they're free to develop their own national policy on, on uh, internet uh, public, uh, public internet uh, policy. Just make sure that we create the enabling environment for them. They have the, uh, uh, the structures, the processes. Uh, actually, we, in fact, we develop a, a toolkit uh, under PREDA project, which, is in, which will enable countries and regions to be able to develop uh, their national uh, IGF or regional IGF. And it's a very uh, detailed toolkit. It has all the questions that is being asked around IG and IGFs are answered in the toolkits and where we can find resources uh, and who, who are the stakeholders and how to get them engaged in the process and so forth. We are also helping the regions to make sure that they, would, they have regional IGF and regional schools. In fact, we did that for the Western and African uh, region, ECOWAS. They did their uh, IGF and their uh, schools back in July. We helped the East East Africa community. Uh, we are, next, uh, next month we'll also do uh, for the Central Africa. And in fact, we are doing also something for, NASA, for North Africa, not uh, the uh, regional IGF, but the school on IGF. We are contemplating on having uh, the school in Nouakchott, Mauritania, because it's uh, in, the safe region, in the safe country within the region. So on the uh, capacity building, uh, we had, we hired African experts who were able to develop content, modules. We have uh, modules and we had, uh, in, back in May, we did the Train the Trainer program where we, we brought 70 African experts from all the regions. And it, by the way, they are not only uh, government, they are from civil society, business, academia, it's a mixed bag. We brought them to Addis Ababa. We trained them on IG, and they are our ambassadors in the regions, and we call them our trainers. So whenever there is an event at the national level or the regional level, we ask them and we support them to go and train uh, at those at the national level and the regional level as well. <clears throat> so so under and and, and Pete, I think we wanted to be able to ask to answer the questions and create value for 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 the community at different level. Uh, Furthermore, on the capacity building, we are uh, collaborating with the uh, Diplo Foundation. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the content that we, we developed, we wanted Diplo to fine tune it and make sure it's, 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 uh, it's also good for an online consumption. And we also want to develop a specific content for diplomats uh, with the help of uh, Diplo Foundation. Um, moreover, we want to make sure that uh, whatever we are doing is sustainable, so that's why we also, Diplo is helping us with a study on the sustainability of training. Whether it be it, uh, using the school, the model we use today, 
Uh, every time we have an IGF at the national, regional, continental level, we, it's preceded by a school on internet governance. So is that going to be the platform that is going to be sustainable, or there is going to be some other ways of capacitate uh, uh, stakeholder within uh, the member states? So DIPLU is helping us also on this front. Um, I think I'll stop at that, and then maybe if there's follow-up questions, I'll be Thank, happy thank you to. very much, Hadel, and uh, I, I, I think I still have like uh, five or uh, seven minutes, ten minutes, to hear uh, from, uh, f again, from um, the floor. So um, there were, um, yeah, there were comments back at the back. Again, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Makan Fai. Uh, UN retiree, I have several of my colleagues here. Hello, I greet you <laughs> here on the high table. Uh, I'm at the other side of the table now. Uh, I'm happy to see all of you here. Uh, I'm now uh, uh, working at, with the African uh, Internet Governance Forum as the secretary and uh, the West African Governance Forum as the chair of the scientific committee. So I'm still uh, in the business. Uh, I was not here when we started, uh, but I would like to pay tribute to our uh, colleague Tariq Kamel, who passed away, who was a very big asset on IG and ICT for development issues on the African continent. Uh, after that, uh, I've heard what you have said. You have uh, all spoken uh, uh, on valuable issues and you have defended your position. Uh, one thing I would like really to uh, stress upon is the need for collaboration between the MENA and the African region. Uh, because uh, some of the countries in the MENA are part of the African region and they are full member, members and active members of the African IGF. But uh, we hear about MENA only when we have the global idea. I think this should be corrected and we should find ways and means on working together so that uh, our uh, programs are working smoothly from a continent to another continent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, McCain, um, and very inspiring of course comments and thank you for the tribute. Um, I also invite you, if you have any questions, to actually um, address them. Comments or questions, please, are most welcome, please. Hello, uh, my name is Iba Aweshe. I'm from Syria. Uh, I'm just, um, I, I think that I want to add my voice to Christine when she talked about the convergence, the recent convergence between ITU and the ITUD specifically, and the other actors in the field of internet governance when it comes to capacity building. I think we need to stress a fact that uh, ITU is a historically a respected organization amongst Arab countries in general. And uh, the Arab group is very well presented there and very actively participating. That, um, the, and that the issue of internet, is, internet governance issues are quite uh, controversial in several aspects. And even if you are telling the right thing, you can't be mistrusted at one moment because of perceptions, as uh, our friend Shafiq said. Uh, uh, even when, because in, in several cases, uh, what is being said is not the most important, but who is saying it? So probably uh, the role of the ITU could be, and the ITUD specifically again, uh, could be very welcome in trying to, uh, to provide a more credible and more respected uh, point of view amongst all these countries uh, who are more keen on listening to them than what could happen if this message is delivered by someone else. Even if it's true, I'm not, I'm not the, 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 the debating this, okay? Uh, and uh, the more initiative, uh, initiatives in this field are more than welcome. And, uh, and I think that, um, well, given that this is about capacity building, uh, 
it's not easy to come with a neutral, uh, with the neutral uh, uh, content on internet governance because it's it's a very conf very controversial issue, a lot of controversial issues, especially if you talk about the old concepts about uh, critical resources and things like that. Now with the with the new uh, new issues in, in internet governance are less controversial, but the controversy is still there at, at, at a certain extent. So it's it's. Uh, let me say thanks for the ITU for what, what it has done, and we, we hope that it will always be there. Thank you. Thank you, Eba. Um, any reflections uh, maybe from uh, the panel? Does someone want to take a uh, mic, or do we have more from the floor? Okay. I will, please. Um, I just want to talk about the engagement by the uh, North Africa region. Uh, within Brida uh, context. Um, we have a good engagement uh, with the region. Uh, in fact, we had, uh, before we came here, we had a consultation workshop uh, in Addis Ababa where we presented uh, Brida IG implementation strategy. And uh, I think it's one of the region who actually st stood up and uh, they told us they would like to uh, engage more and, and, and kind of have form a, um, a working group around the strategy. Uh, I'll be glad to share the strategy with, with you if you uh, indulge us. Um, they want to have more engagement, having a working group to make sure that the specificity of the Northern Africa region is taken into account when it comes to the implementation of the IG strategy for Africa under PRIDA. And we welcome that. And actually, this, this was something very notable uh, in the meeting where uh, the, we had, uh, I think we had very good uh, resources in the North Africa region. I think we need to, to utilize this, these resources to make sure that we don't, we are not going to subscribe to some one, one size fits all. We wanted to make sure that we address the specificities of the region individually and, 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 and so and that the region will be able to tell us what are the priorities and what needs to be addressed uh, from the regional perspective. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanted to um, to make a comment on the two interventions. Um, maybe first, uh, Makan, and I'm very happy to see you. Uh, we have seen each other a lot in, in, in throughout our careers, so it's nice to see you back in different functions. Um, um, we are actually experimenting also with having joint uh, workshops across, the, across regions. We have done it on other topics, and I will, I think, the, I think you have make a very valid point. Um, I will also relay this to my colleagues in the respective um, regional offices to see um, if in the future we could uh, have something, if there is, if that is a, a, a wish, to have some joint cross-regional um, uh, capacity development workshops. We have trialed this on other topics and it, it was quite successful. On, um, thank you very much for your comments um, on uh, concerning ITU. In fact, uh, I didn't mention that, but that was also one of our um, approaches when we started to develop these capacity development programs on internet governance, uh, trying to have a, a to offer a neutral platform. Maybe you say it's not possible, but uh, or maybe put not easy, but put it differently. Uh, we wanted to bring in diverse views, at least, to not have just one view. So this is also the idea of bringing in partners who work on, who have different angles and different perspectives, so that the, um, the policy makers get exposed to all of them and not just to one. So this is also why we are um, emphasizing uh, the importance of working with other partners in the delivery of the of the workshop uh, precisely to, to bring in uh, the, the diverse um, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. You can pass uh, to Madame. Yes, very quickly, just a few tweets. So um, 
I think maybe in terms of capacity building, maybe we can um, take it a, a step forward and think about um, institutional capacity building. Um, I think it's important to have this institutionalized somehow within uh, the region. This would help building the right uh, teams in place. I don't think relying on one person who took the capacity building uh, is enough to follow up the very broad spectrum of topics uh, that are being discussed, like uh, Vlada mentioned. Um, so we need a variety of uh, skills, a variety of uh, calibers, a variety of backgrounds that would definitely not be available in one person, but in a, a cohesive team. This team could be built, built uh, across the region, by the way, and, and uh, across um, Africa and, and the Middle East, of course. Uh, but I think it's time to, to do this um, institutionalization um, and also um, not only building the teams but also building the appropriate channels at the national level reaching out to um, other relevant uh, parts of, uh, of the community. We are talking about uh, data protection, about GDPR, at the same time about human rights and technical issues. So it's very difficult to have just uh, one person uh, carrying all this over. And should we manage to do this, we will then have a good um, succession, uh, a good handover. So again, when this specific person leaves uh, or gets promoted or whatever, then we, we don't witness a drop. So again, this is more of food for thought. Um, I fully agree with Ayman on the impact and the importance of the impact. I would just cautious immediate impact versus long long-term impact because sometimes you need to continuously uh, engage until you reach the impact and and I, i'll stop here i know we're running out of time uh, just quick reactions from uh, vlada shafi and uh, fahd if you want to. Uh, okay uh, just uh, two comments small comments first uh, yes uh, i totally agree with the vlada on uh, this silos uh, this is another issue that we are facing when we do this capacity building so uh, when we do this capacity with the middle or uh, level people or technicians or, or uh, technical managers and uh, we want to uh, deliver the message to decision makers, we have an obstacle here because culturally these people, they can't go up and talk freely to their managers. So we need to go up to the managers and talk to them that we did this and this and this and they said, okay, we'll talk to these people and then they forgot to talk and there's no follow up. And uh, second, uh, you talk about uh, Minog, uh, Christine. Minog is a very interesting and I think uh, platform to, to use it. Why we don't use Minog for all these uh, internet governance issue? Because Minog is there. We have two uh, parallel, uh, two, two, uh, two uh, paths. We have the training, we do capacity building for three days, and we have conference for two days where we deliver and share uh, the knowledge uh, regarding technical and uh, regulation. So uh, let's try to have this platform which is neutral, which is very successful. Next year will be in Bahrain in March, I believe. So let's try to use it. It's there. And we can build on our uh, expertise that we have uh, to have some, some kind of institution, uh, but let not us uh, try to start everything from scratch. We have the base this institution. Thank you. Uh, on, on the cross-regional uh, cooperation, uh, and I again s s emphasize the, the uh, possibilities of the online, so walking the talk. We usually disregard that, particularly the Middle East, Balkans as well, is the, is the uh, culture of, of meeting face to face, you know, sitting, discussing. But online training programs, and I'm not just talking about, okay, Diplos online course, which is interactive. There are various ways. You can do online briefings, online webinars. There are many ways you can do online. It's much less costly. It can be much more in-depth, actually, sometimes, than meeting face-to-face. -face. Of course, it has to go blended. But it's one, one thing to always think about. The online op opportunities are great. And the second point is on, on the um, cross-stakeholder, if you wish. Uh, the new topics that are on the agenda, we shouldn't stick to the things which, have, which we have been discussing in the last 10 years. I mentioned artificial intelligence. 
it is a highly controversial topic. It might not seem so. But just take a look at embedding the ethics or principles into AI. The ethics and principles in Middle East, in Asia, in Europe, in US are completely different. Embedding it into AI, which is going to become a global thing, is, is a matter of geopolitics. These things are uh, not only very important to discuss already, but they're actually very sexy, if I may say, to the um, politicians, diplomats, because AI, yeah, I want to be an expert in AI. I want to talk about that. Try to embed these new topics. Talk about AI from different perspectives, from economic, um, security perspectives, human rights perspectives, humanism. We, we have this session tomorrow on humanism and AI. So these are the approaches. And just a quick comment on what Fahd mentioned at the end when we are packaging that. We used to be packaging that as IG. We don't have to do that. It can be IG. It can be digital policy. It can be data policy, data governance. It can be digital cooperation. Name it the way you want. As long as we stick to what we know what we are talking about, whether that's diplos taxonomy or any, anything else, just pack it differently so that it, it appeals to the target group you want. Thanks. Thank you. Very quickly, and yes, we need to close very, this segment. Very, very quickly. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't talk about PREDA. I, you know, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of perspective uh, and overview of PREDA. It has three tracks, one to do with spectrum, right? And the second one, harmonization of ICT policy and regulation. And the last uh, is to do with IG. Uh, so, so these are the overall. Uh, part of BRIDA also, we are building a digital platform where we have rooms where people can exchange ideas. And I think the, the, uh, the objective is to be able to have a common position. Like when, before you go to these kind of meetings, then uh, somebody would throw a document, right? And then the document is going to be deliberated among the stakeholders that are in the room, and then eventually they're going to come up a, a position on that document, and then now we don't talk about many people attending, maybe one person can attend the meeting and then reflect the position that reads in this room, and there is also a, another room that is going to be for, for policy maker at the government level, where if they don't want the information to be shared with others, they can have one-on-one -on -one interaction, and this is spe specifically before you go to bilateral, multilateral discussion. If you are unsure about what to do, what kind of uh, issues, then the, the person will get advice from the expert on the possible positions and option that they can take to this bilateral, multilateral meeting so that they can be coached before going to these meetings. Uh, so this is general, but tomorrow at um, noon, we will have more discussion about PRIDA in our session, African Union Open Forum, 12 noon. Thank, Thank you, you very Anit. much. Uh, Fahd, you have one? You're okay? You're okay. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, the panelists, and uh, it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, on the panel. Uh, thank you for our audience. We are not, sh we are not finished yet. Uh, so we are coming to the, actually, the more interesting and uh, more broad uh, segment of, of this uh, event. Uh, segment two of this event will look at initiatives in the region. Um, part of it is uh, national, part of it is regional. Uh, we will have uh, Hanan leading us. So we can, if you wish, we can have a few minutes just in the room, just to stretch yourself uh, for the time for our speakers to get to their seats, but uh, please keep in the room. And uh, if you would, those in the room, if you want to take your seats as well.
Hi, um, gentlemen, ladies, okay, I'm just, excuse me, Ayman, Hisham, okay, we, uh, I would like to call the uh, next panelists uh, to come to the, um, to the podium. Hi. Whenever, whenever, I think I'm, I'm going to take the stage and, hi, Zena. Okay, I think we're just missing Ayman. We would like to maybe um, settle down. First of all, thank you all for um, staying in the room and uh, putting up with us. I hope the second segment of this uh, interesting meeting will be um, as active and interactive. Um, so, thank you Hisham and NTRA with the support of ISOC uh, to um, invite me for, for, this, um, for this event and I think the first part was really a very important discussion. Uh, we will build on it. There was a lot of uh, talk already about digital policy, um, so we will go a bit deeper here. We have an excellent uh, panel, um, gender balance and everything, which is which is good news. My name is Hanan Bujemi, and I'm the executive director of Tech Policy Tank. It's a, a newly established consultancy helping governments, companies, and different actors with their digital strategy, uh, working mainly on legal and policy analysis um, and strategic advice. Um, I have other roles, namely um, vice chair of the Arab IGF. I set up the North African IGF. Um, and I work in different capacities with different, you know, organizations. You probably know I'm associated with Diplo Foundation. I recently joined the PRIDA program as an expert, so I'm helping them with the implementation since I also specialized in implementing large-scale programs specific to IG. Um, so today, uh, I think the focus of the session will be mainly on digital policies, the challenges that we face in the region, are we instrumental really in influencing policy in our local context, regionally, and then globally? So the first session was more about engagement, about the different stakeholders that are doing a lot of work in this field already for quite some time, um, work which is led by excellent colleagues for, for, for a long time. I really know them doing a lot of work to make you know, things happen in general. Um, and even though we still lack, you know, influence from the Middle East, you know, in the global context, which is really, really challenging because the lack of capacity, the knowledge gap, and the priorities. So we know that digital policy uh, or internet governance specifically does not feature high in the agenda of governments from our region for many, 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 many uh, uh, reasons. Um, Having said that, there is still you know, work that is being done. We're not going to wait for things to be 100% OK for us to be this work, because there is a large group of people from the region who are already doing great work. And we should just build on that, support that, and carry on. Uh, so without further ado, I think uh, it would be good. You know, I know everybody on the panel very well, but I would like to give them the space you know, to also introduce you know, uh, themselves. I have 
Zena, I have Sasha from uh, UNESCO, I have a veteran, you know, of IG, and, you know, he plays a big role in many policy processes, Tijani from Tunis, we have Eamon Shribini, he's the chief of ICT division of UNESCO, we have uh, Qusay Ashati from Kuwait, uh, he's one of the founding members of the Arab IGF, he was actually the first convener of the Arab IGF in Kuwait in 2012, he's AMAC chair, you know, he was uh, for, like previously MAG on the global IGF, many, many roles. We have Nadira Raji from Palestine. She's a civil society uh, activist and uh, quite prominent in different fora, mainly ISOC and ICANN, and she's very active in the Asia Pacific region, but also MENA region. And we have Jane Coffin from ISOC, a VP, a senior VP advisor to the CEO of um, Internet Society. They all bring a lot of experience. They have concrete on the ground experience on how to develop digital policy in our, um, in our region. So um, maybe, you know, to start with Jane, because she's got this kind of zoom out scope. She <laughs> works globally, but she's very familiar uh, with, with the context of the Middle East. And if you may uh, just shed some light, you know, of your experience in developing digital uh, policy in the context of the Middle East and the role of ISOC specifically uh, in doing so. And if you would like, you can, you know, be more specific uh, talking about, you know, the work that you're doing on community networks because access is still one of, you know, the key issues uh, that we um, actually have in the regional uh, context. So, Jane. There we go. Um, hello, and thank you for being here, and thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Jane Coffin. I work at the Internet Society and focus on infrastructure and connectivity. And um, I will give you a quick overview of some great work we're doing in the region, and I would be remiss if I did not recognize um, Nermeen El Sadani, who is from Egypt. She is the regional vice president for the Internet Society. And I sent her a quick note earlier, and I said, no, make sure I, I get all the points in. You want me to get in? Um, we have two studies that we're working on right now from this high-level perspective. One is the um, enabling environment for policy uh, for infrastructure, and there will be a separate focus also on internet exchange points. IXPs are, are a localized version of the internet in a country. When you have them, you have cheaper, better, faster internet. We help build those around the world. And our team um, that's done work in um, sub-Saharan, northern Africa, and around the world has probably been responsible with partners, of course. We don't do anything alone um, for putting in more IXPs than anyone uh, that I know as far as uh, in the nonprofit and the for-profit side of the house. Um, so that enabling environment report will be out in January. Um, we've, we're conducting a um, public ask right now for comments on that report. The second report we're working on is one on security in the region, more on infrastructure security, so more of the cybersecurity perspective. So there's another call out right now for comments from colleagues, so please take note if you're on any of our mailing lists and our chapter lists. Uh, we do try and reach out to our community to get feedback. Now that is often complicated when you have a report of that size and nature, but again, two things, the enabling environment in general with internet exchange points and infrastructure there, and cybersecurity slash security for infrastructure. And as you've said, um, Hanan, some of what we do is take a look at that global level, then dive down into the regional. And right now, some of the other regional work that we're doing, and I will make a nod to the panel before that spoke about the importance of um, different, uh, different political uh, changes in the region but also the work we're doing with government. This is a shift change for us on the nonprofit side. Um, recently, I was in um, Riyadh at the end of July, beginning of um, August. We've done more work with the region and the government there than in a long time. And this is on um, the enabling environment, and it was at the request of the ministry and the regulator in Saudi to work with them. And we really appreciated the great collaboration and we're doing internet exchange point development work with them there as well, and actually a team is going tomorrow. I was there, uh, so we've had three, three different meetings in the last, I say, three or four months. We've been in Bahrain, Jordan, um, Oman as well, so there's more and more work that will be done both on this internet exchange point side, which is that localized internet development, 
Content will, of course, come into the question. There's always this other issue of security, which is coming through, how to secure information, and how to continue to build up that, um, that infrastructure. Now, this also goes into, um, someone had mentioned earlier, the ITU. We work closely with the development sector, and I'm a vice rapporteur in one of the study groups. And it's important that we do more and more work um, together collaboratively. And we were on a panel at WISIS in March, and we had um, UNCTAD, WTO, ITU, the Internet Society, APC. So we had civil society, UN organizations talking about the importance of collaborative policymaking, collaborative infrastructure work together. And I think this is where we're seeing more and more of a, of a happy breakdown versus a siloing of we should do this and someone else should, should do that. Um, so this is top of mind for us uh, to try and see where we can work collaboratively. Sometimes what people will say is, oh, that's just a small thing you're doing. Well, it's not small when you're working with ICANN and ISOC and the team at RIPE NCC and any of you where we go in together. Someone had said, oh, you know, you go in and you tell, and we do not tell. <laughs> we go in and listen. It is very important that to us that we're asked to come in to work as a partner, but also we don't know all the countries that well. We know a lot about the region, but when we go in, we go in with local people, and part of the key thing that we try and do is what I call local, local. Local training for local people for sustainability. I used to work on big aid projects years ago um, in the former Soviet republics. And I will tell you that you can come in for years and do work on certain projects, but if you're not collaborating across organizations, you might as well have, I said, thrown the money out the window of the plane as you flew over the country. Because if you are competing as organizations in a region, it's much less effective. And so I've been doing this a long time, and I believe that some of this very strategic focused work is far more sustainable and scalable, and this goes to community networks as well. These are small localized networks. They are not illegal. We had this long debate um, with some people recently who said, gosh, these are small networks that are coming in at a local level. Local people are helping design them. These are ways to connect the unconnected. We're trying to look at ways to change the old policy regulatory models, not to overturn spectrum policy overnight. Do not worry. <laughs> if you're in the room, I've, I've had a lot of experience in this area, and people say, gosh, Jane. And I said, nothing's changed. If we've been doing this for 20 years and people are still unconnected, we have a problem. We have got to do something. And so instead of calling those people who are unconnected at the last mile, let's call them the first mile. Connecting from the local instance out, working with people to train them how to build those networks and how to train each other for sustainability. So this is a critical factor of what we've been doing. You have to take care when you're working at that local level, and we work very closely with governments to make sure that they don't think we're doing something that is um, inappropriate to their rules. But we do want to see if we can change the, the way people think about licensing and small networks. Yeah. No, thank you, Jane. I think the example that you brought up is, is very important to highlight is the level of collaboration among the technical community and how you decided to you know, all work together uh, to channel your efforts because the objective is one, is to help you know, all these countries improve at the level of you know, policy implementation. Um, and I think that, that is, um, that is a, a very good asset for the region. You just have to work out, obviously, the cultural differences and how each you know, country in the Middle East and North Africa is quite distinct you know, in the way it does things, which makes your job a little bit more tricky. And I know that you have you all have a great team of people uh, who are very, very experienced in dealing with uh, governments uh, in our region. So I will kind of ask you straight away, what are the challenges, you know, apart from, you know, the cultural diversity before I move on to somebody else, what are, you know, the, the nitty gritty, you know, of what you do and how do you kind of tackle it, you know? So you're not very familiar, you said, with you know, how things are done and you get the support from other people, but what are the challenges and how do you tackle them? I think the challenge often for nonprofits is that um, we're a very technical neutral group. We have people who are very experienced from um, many years, but we come in with that technical trust. Often it's hard for governments to believe that we're, um, I don't want to say, uh, but I would like to say an equal partner. 
And so it's taken some time, and we participate in a lot of those UN meetings as well at the ITU in order to talk to governments about the importance of working with us. Because we're not there to, um, we're not just gonna jump in country and then jump back out. We've watched people do that, and that's not something we believe in. We think you're in for the longer haul. Mm -hmm. It's a three to four to five year process. It depends on, on the country, as you've said. But also, some governments are afraid to change the rules. And so if you can show them that the older rules are not working to connect people with the new internet infrastructure and the way content's delivery, uh, being delivered, then that actually is something when you show them the models that work in other places in the region, mm -hmm. then they start to see that they can create that uh, sort of newer way of working. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And I, I, I confirm that having a vision, you know, more or less than actually a short-term plan, it's more um, valuable uh, and it generates more uh, results uh, when you're working in the context of the Middle East. And um, maybe this is a good, you know, um, uh, opportunity for me to turn to Sasha because she's working on a very important project that was launched recently uh, by UNESCO, um, uh, the uh, indicators. And you mentioned briefly to me before the meeting that you actually apply them to two countries in the Middle East. And uh, if you may maybe shed light more on that experience, and I know that you just basically launched them and you're still uh, deliberating on, on, on these indicators, so you, you might uh, bring us to the picture on what's going on on that front. Thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be here today and also on a panel with many of our very close partners, including the Internet Society that have been a uh, central part in the work that we've been doing in looking at the development of our Internet Universality Framework and Internet Universality Indicators. Uh, so just very briefly uh, to highlight what uh, the indicators and also the concept that's guiding this work is. Uh, we work, as many of you in the room are very familiar with, all around the world, and we have several field offices on the ground working very closely, not only with government counterparts, but also with counterparts from civil society and from the technical community to look at how to ensure that the internet is harnessed to meet the sustainable development goals. And so in 2015, our member states at our general conference adopted what we call the Internet Universality Framework. And this framework is guiding our work on internet, but also more broadly on our work on digital transformation, including uh, right now our work on artificial intelligence and the ethical dimensions specifically of artificial intelligence. So what is the Internet Universality Framework? Basically, this framework underlines that in order for the internet to be harnessed to contribute to sustainable development, the internet must be rights-based. So all rights that exist offline exist in the online environment. It must be open, it must be accessible, and it must be multi-stakeholder. And that without these three these four principles, we cannot actually harness the internet for the future we want and for sustainable development. So following the adoption of this internet universality framework in 2015, for over three years and with many partners, including some in the room, we worked to develop the internet universality indicators. And these indicators used a multi-stakeholder process in order to consult with various actors on the ground at the local level and also at the global level to say, okay, okay, if we want to harness the development of the internet to contribute to sustainable development, what needs to be done? And the result is an instrument that was welcomed by our member states uh, at the most recent meeting of UNESCO's International Program for the Development of Communication in November 2018. And since then, we have begun applying these indicators in partnership with national counterparts at the local level. And as you underline, uh, first and foremost, in the Middle East and North Africa region, in Tunisia and in Sudan. So what are the objectives, concretely, of this Internet Universality Indicators Framework? First of all, it presents a comprehensive and substantive understanding of the national internet environment and policies. Because in order to assist governments in developing inclusive policies for the internet, we first need to ensure that a gaps analysis exists to say, okay, well, what is missing in order to ensure a Rome compliant, let's say, internet? The second is to assess the alignment of the environment and policies to these four principles, rights-based, open, accessible, and multi-stakeholder. 
and the third is based on this analysis to develop policy recommendations and practical initiatives that enable at the country level uh, the governments to develop inclusive policies through multi-stakeholder approaches that ensure that the internet ecosystem and advanced ICTs contribute to sustainable development. So what concretely do these indicators look like? There are five categories of indicators, four of which reflect the Rome principles, and the fifth which is concerned with cross-cutting issues, so things like gender equality, needs of children and young people, the economic dimensions of the internet, trust and security, and legal and ethical aspects of the internet. And here I'd just like to salute my dear friend from the ITU who is in the room because we work very closely with the ITU having complementary mandates, the ITU specifically on issues related to infrastructure, and UNESCO in the follow-up to WISIS looking specifically at questions of you know, multilingualism online, for example. How do languages, and this is a huge issue in the Middle East and North Africa region, how does, for example, the presence of the Arabic language on the internet ensure the production of local content that meets the needs of local communities. These internet universality indicators, there are 303 indicators. Of these, 110 are the core indicators for basic level assessments of national internet contexts. So the way we look at these indicators is that they are a toolbox, not only for governments, but also for civil society and NGO actors on the ground to be able to undertake gaps analysis to really understand what needs to be done in order for the internet to take its rightful place in sustainable development. And here again, I'm not talking just about access to the internet, but use of the internet to ensure that specifically here, marginalized groups like young people, like indigenous communities, like women, can actively be producing local content and local solutions using the internet that contributes to sustainable development. So, what are some of the challenges to preempt perhaps one of the questions that you may ask in implementing these indicators? Uh, the first is that obviously it requires careful planning. It also requires sufficient time and resources for effective data gathering. And one of the things that we're seeing on the ground is that this question of collecting data is a real issue because many governments do not have centers for data or statistical offices. So how do you say, okay, well, here are these great indicators. Let's get data to identify gaps analysis, when in fact, one of the first things that needs to be done is to un understand and ensure, for example, the challenges on the ground in ensuring appropriate statistics and access to data that could guide informed policy making. Uh, here also another uh, uh, challenge, I would say, is to ensure that this process is inclusive. This is not a government-only led process. This is a process that is multi-stakeholder, so that involves civil society, that involves the technical community, and that involves uh, NGOs, for example, on the ground that are doing informed work. So here we're also reimagining the way in which public policy related to the internet is undertaken, where it is no longer a top-down policy development by governments alone, but an inclusive public policy approach. So this is another aspect of our work is to say, okay, well, how can we reimagine, thanks to the internet, and thanks also to artificial intelligence, the way in which we collect input and data from multi-stakeholder consultations in order to ensure inclusive public policies. Very briefly, just to kind of give an overview of what the implementation of these indicators means and how we go about it. There are really kind of eight steps to how we see the implementation of these indicators. The first is establishing a multi-stakeholder advisory group to ensure that this process is indeed participatory. The second is building a collaborative research team to make sure that the different stakeholder groups, so technical community, academia, civil society, the media, the government, and the private sector, which play a huge role in the way in which internet infrastructure and access is rolled out at the national level, is around the table from the beginning to ensure inclusive internet policies. The third is developing a research plan. And here again, I'd like to underline uh, specifically for the MENA region, is saying, okay, well, what infrastructures, as it concerns, you know, for example, uh, Department of Statistics exists in the actual ecosystem that we can rely on, and how can UNESCO, with its partners, reinforce the development of this ecosystem to ensure inclusive research? The fourth aspect is really data gathering and data analysis, which looks at how to make sure that we collect this data to informed 
informed public policy development. And then uh, the two last tasks is really looking at developing a national validation workshop and related advocacy activities. Because it's hard to say we need to work towards harnessing the internet for sustainable development, where many people on the ground, if you go up to a young person who's 13, for example, and thinking about how they, what they would like to study in high school, they don't necessarily understand why this issue is directly relevant to sustainable development. And again, in partnership with the ITU and the framework of WISIS follow-up, we've looked at mapping specifically how the WISIS follow-up action lines relate to sustainable development. And a huge part of that is also related to internet access and internet use. And then the last task is really looking at impact assessment and monitoring. So how can we not only develop the public policy, but look at how we need to uh, backstop uh, national counterparts in the implementation, because there are lots of very beautiful policies out there. But the difference between the policy and the actual implementation is also another huge gap that we're looking at. And so these multi-stakeholder groups really serve as a platform to ensure both development implementation and monitoring so that we can adapt accordingly with a very, very fast changing and disruptive tech ecosystem in Middle East and North Africa, how we can make sure that these policies are adaptable and inclusive and keep up to the speed with the actual technological developments on the ground that are going on. Oh, thank you, Sasha. That, that was amazing. You know, I'm, I'm really impressed you know, by the, the work that you're doing. And I think it sets the benchmark for policy making you know, at the global level. And I think it will increase the level of acceptance uh, of how uh, digital policy making should be inclusive. And I think being UNESCO and other UN institutions leading this process, it will be more appealing you know, to governments you know, from uh, the Middle East to adopt uh, and adapt also uh, this uh, specific process. So I'm not sure if you have any outcomes yet about you know, the implementation or the application of the universal indicators in the case of Tunis, Tunisia and Sudan. Was it Sudan? Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Just briefly, you know, quickly, what have you kind of noticed from your initial exercise with these two countries? So this is uh, en cours, in progress, okay. in Tunisia and Sudan. Right. Uh, but what I would invite uh, uh, member states who are around the table today and also civil society organizations who are here, uh, we have a policy of open access. Mm -hmm. So all of our work is published uh, openly online, including obviously the in uh, internet universality indicators and, free and framework. So they are uh, downloadable for free mm -hmm. in several languages, uh, also including in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I would invite uh, countries and, and uh, counterparts here today to consult that. Uh, the assessments will be available online. I'd like to underline here, though, that in no way is this tool indicated to say, okay, Tunisia is better than this other country. Yeah. and then no, this It's not at all a no. ranking. It's really a toolbox that's uh, being used on the ground to assist in digital transformation and public policy mm -hmm. making. So in no way are these indicators meant to rank countries as it concerns their internet development, mm -hmm. but really used as a toolbox to ensure multi-stakeholder engagement in public policy making. We will be sharing the results uh, of these uh, uh, indicator applications, mm -hmm. uh, including actually this morning and this afternoon in our open forum dedicated to this question, specifically to ensure uh, lessons learned and best practices and challenges encountered between different regions. So the open, uh, the day zero event that we held today and actually an open forum that will occur in a couple days in the framework of the IGF really looks at providing platforms to exchange best practices between the different regions because as you underlined, challenges that are encountered, for example, in Middle East and North Africa mm -hmm. may indeed be different than the challenges encountered in applying these indicators in the South Pacific or in Asia. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think showing somehow that there is some kind of competition between countries is also not desired practice, but it would be good to actually measure the uptake mm -hmm. uh, of how to apply these indicators because then it will help us all move forward as far as, you know, policy implementation is concerned. Now, thank you very much, Sasha. That thank was you. really, really very helpful. And, um, you know, with that, I think it's time to zoom in now and speak about the Middle East and, uh, you know, specifically what's, what are the kind of initiatives in place at the moment in terms of uh, digital. And I think the best person to maybe start with would be um, Ayman Shabini, who is the head of the ICT division of uh, UNESCO. And um, I think Ayman, you know, and his team you know, is here with us today, do a lot of work and collaborate with 
many, many governments on different fronts. So it would be good if Ayman can um, give his point of view on when it comes to the current digital initiatives, um, digital policy initiatives taking place in, in the MENA region uh, before we uh, jump on. Uh, okay, Th issues. thank you so much, Hanan. I'm trying to raise my voice to keep some energy flowing uh, for the la remaining one hour. So actually, I'm going to speak with uh, sometimes two hats. Uh, one hat is mine, which is the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. And one hat for my main close partner, which is the League of Arab States. Myself, my team, and the last are tomorrow doing an open forum related to uh, these topics in details from a very regional perspective. And it is Open Forum 21. It is after tomorrow. It is from 5.20 till 6.20. Uh, uh, don't remember the room now, but we will give more detail. So back to the, my original hat, which is the United Nations. First of all, I'd like to make one very good announcement that uh, the UN is undergoing a, a very uh, uh, creative and, uh, let us say, uh, uh, disruptive, maybe uh, reinventing itself. So part of the reinvention is actually, and I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Secretary General, most of you have read about that, but uh, I'm happy that I have also here with me Sasha from UNESCO, and I managed to uh, keep uh, uh, Susan for some time before she leaves at 5.30. But the idea of One UN, the One UN thing has been there for some time, but uh, not even related to the crossing line 2015, which of course I'll speak about, but related uh, to uh, several uh, leadership uh, uh, eras, uh, last of which was Ban Ki-moon, and then Mr. Guterres, now our Secretary General. We are uh, uh, undergoing three types of reform at the same time, the most important of which uh, uh, it is not the planning reform, while it is that important, it is not the management and organization reform, but most um, important is the developmental reform. We have new philosophy to development. We are acting not only as one UN with all the organizations, but we are also working with the multi-stakeholder approach more and more. We are uh, outreaching to all the players. Not only that, but in fact, we are actually reinventing our partnership. The Secretary General have convened uh, for a year from 2018 till 2019, the SGE High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation. And most of us have read the digital cooperation. For me, as if I'm reading the WISIS and the IGF once again, but a new incarnation. This is something that we are keen on bringing to the region. The Arab IGF is coming very soon. Uh, it was supposed to be next month, but because of uh, some problems in the region regarding political, uh, uh, geopolitical issues, we just moved it uh, to after Christmas vacation. So mark your calendar, 15 and 16 of January. We are going to speak about the topic that is going to be our main talk tomorrow in the morning, plenary session, one of IGF Berlin, digital cooperation, is going to be our main plenary in the Arab IGF. We've been watching closely this kind of uh, proposed new dynamics, co-governance, uh, co new ecosystems, IGF plus, all these things we are going to bring to the region. We have been also in a retreat for two years trying to reinvent the Arab IGF post-2015, post the, the SDGs, post-2030 agenda. And we managed to do that. We have a new charter. We have a new roadmap for the 2030. So this is one element regarding the IGF, the global IGF, the Arab IGF, and the idea of focus on digital cooperation. But let me pause and focus again on the, the Arab WISIS, which is the father or the mother of all the foras that we are speaking about. And we have strong, uh, let, let us say, uh, uh, relationship with this uh, founding uh, process, where every one of us, whether the ITU, UNESCO, regional commissions, even the, uh, the I-STARS and everyone, have had a partnership ownership role. Uh, the idea of the regional WISIS, we also brought to the region the initiative of the Arab WISIS, it has not been coined as such before 2015. We had like participated in the PrepCom 1, 2, 3, whatever, be between 2003, 2005, the WIGIG, all these things. One follow-up point in 2009, and another one, 2014, uh, much lighter. So now we are institutionalizing the process. Starting 2015, we launched a biannual uh, Arab uh, WISIS process. And uh, we have a strong partnership in the region with ITU and uh, UNESCO. 
uh, of course, with my other hat, with the League of Arab States, who couldn't come uh, today. So that Arab Voices had uh, taken place in 2017 and in 2019. Last year, I was also with uh, Sasha and ITU colleague, and we were consulting on the idea of Arab Voices. We had also Mukhtar from ECA, and we made it, we made the 2019. And now our next big thing, hopefully, and this is what Hanan asked me to speak about, and Christine also, is that we are looking into synergy between the two processes. It is not logical anymore, not sustainable, not efficient, to do like different, uh, uh, like WSIS uh, versions, one of the WSIS itself, and the Arab IGF, or Arab WSIS and Arab IGF, especially after the ITU has opened now its uh, uh, like doors to the uh, internet governance, and uh, 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 already the I-STARS are there in the WSIS process. So what has been always the case before 2015, like this is a community, this is another, the WSIS is one community, the internet governance are the other. Now they are merging globally, and we have really to find ways, and this is our discussion for the next year, from today until the General Assembly 75th, when we will uh, hopefully reach the global commitment on digital cooperation, are we going to merge or suggest merge the two processes in the Arab region and have something that uh, Vlada has called it even, yes, let, let's call it anything. So let's call it maybe the Arab uh, digital cooperation platform, forum, process, whatever it is. So I hope that uh, these initiatives converge very soon because we have only 11, it's coming very soon, 10 years to go till 2030. Mm -hmm. So at least at the level of the 2020, we should come up also with something at the regional level. Before I, uh, I leave the mic, I'd like to mention that we also have done very important uh, uh, process. That the process is actually based because we are all connecting the dots of the matrix, the famous matrix of the ITU, which is the SDGs with the, the WSIS intersections. They are 200 intersections, roughly speaking, or 100. We cannot, I mean, deal with all of that at the same time. So we decided to do a, a, an Arab digital development report that is based on national digital development reviews every two years, and we move with the high-level political forum, focus on certain SDGs. So this year, today in the morning, I was finalizing the last touches on that Arab digital development report. You will see it very soon. We'll make a, a, a nice launch about it. It uh, had uh, like contributions from uh, official partners uh, uh, representing 10 Arab countries and from UNESCO Cairo office, from ITU Arab office, and many others, DESA in New York and so on. So this is also a, a piece of, of the puzzle. If we now had in mind, for example, to do indicators next iteration, we will not do it. We will work together more. Mm -hmm. You work more indicators, we work on other things, people work in capacity building. Yeah. So it is time really for the Arab region to experiment this synergy, complementarity, mm -hmm. and hopefully we bring something new also from the region to the rest of the world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, you know, defining synergies was something that would come in after in the conversation, after we actually hammer all the issues at stake. So I'm not drilling on something specific because I know you're the focal point when it comes to dealing with governments from the Middle East. And actually, it's an opportune moment to discuss a little bit in details the challenges, you know, that you face convincing governments from our region to be more involved in this project, uh, in, in this process, and more specifically, I would like you to share with, you know, the people in the room at the moment, what is considered at stake, you know, when it comes to digital policy issues uh, for government representatives? What are the three priorities on the agenda of governments from uh, our region? So we know exactly where we're, we're, we're going, you know, what, what's the trend? Okay, first of all, it relates to my uh, first idea of reinventing <coughs> approaches. I mean, it is not logical for the same government to receive the same content from several players at the same time, not only at the regional level, but m maybe from the global, or maybe from the country also. We have to synergize. We have to look at this kind of domain as a global supply chain. We need really not to like confuse the recipients or the beneficiaries or the stakeholders, especially that we are not really saying so much different things. So that synergy is very important. It is now about co cooperation and not competition. We want, don't want to distract 
the recipients about things that are of the past. The other thing relates to the uh, impact, what I spoke in the morning. I am faced always with that question from the government, from the UN, and from uh, uh, also the partners. What is the outcome of the Internet Governance Forum as a platform? We say policy dialogue and dialogue means policy shaping. Blah. What are these issues? That the are issue of impact. What is the impact? No, the but what are the issues at stake? You know, the topic per se. We say cybersecurity. What is it exactly? Okay, it is the forum. It is the platform, itself. the process. I have heard, unfortunately, when Vlada said that it's about the process, we took a note, me and Mirna here, because this is a, a, something that we believe in. The UN environment now, be, uh, backed by the governments in the General Assembly, say we don't want processes. We want something practical, on the ground, policy change process, not dialogue only. So the, the challenge is to sell the idea or, uh, of just a dialogue without linkages to policy making is the, the biggest challenge. And that brings uh, me to the other hat, which I'm representing, the LAS, or Adel and the uh, AFU, and uh, this kind of bodies, the political uh, uh, umbrellas of regions, are very important to get really connected to the dialogue process. Because we want to give them the digest, the messages, we call it, directly to the, from hand to mouth, to the policy making body, which is councils and things like that. This link is still very weak. Very weak and missing. And of yeah. course, the third thing is the, the, uh, the idea of, uh, let us say, uh, agility. Yeah. I mean, we need really to show results in order to snowball. Yeah, and it's unfortunate also that we haven't got think tanks in the region that are specialized on doing research of the impact, you know, of certain technologies and policies on digital economy, on, you know, geopolitics and other issues that are relevant to the region. And I'm not sure wh why is that? Uh, is it because digital policy does not feature as a priority in the agendas of, you know, research organizations? and this is in the context of the Middle East, because that will help us shape policies for the future. So that is completely absent, you know, from, from our context. And I'm actually surprised that governments, you know, um, uh, or even companies are not interested in any kind of market analysis, you know, that will help us, you know, shape up these policies for the future. And I don't blame governments, you know, from, uh, you know, uh, having some kind of uncertainty about the role of the IGF because we're not used to have a conversation, you know, about the issues at stake. But it is a good opportunity to do so. We just need to get used to each other. And I see Kosaya shaking his head about this and maybe he's a very good, you know, person to uh, jump on uh, after to kind of share with us from his own point of view, what does it look like, you know, to kind of convince governments, uh, develop policy about issues that are very sensitive. And I think you've got very good experience in that, so Qasai. Well, uh, thank you, Hanan. Thank you for that. Uh, in the Arab world, we have uh, several digital policies. Well, some of them worked somehow. Some of them didn't work. Some of them were just kept in papers. For example, the, uh, the uh, Arab League were leaders in 2005 or seven. They launched what's called the Arab ICT strategic plan. Um, and it wasn't it kept that way. It didn't, nothing in it has been implemented. Uh, many countries on national level, uh, they develop policies 2020, 2030, 2035, 2050, 2040. But, and they incorporated a digital component into that plan. Uh, well, you cannot consider it a digital policy because the scope of what is called 2020, 2030 is so wide, it's in many sectors. And the digital policy is uh, it's like directed toward uh, Supporting all, it doesn't work that. Digital policies first needs to be specific towards something. Uh, is it toward SMEs? Is it toward social inclusion? Empowering women? Uh, it needs to be toward a specific issue. And it needs to be branded for that it's, it's a specific uh, target or uh, issue. More than that, uh, it needs to be localized. So 
a digital policy need to be on a national level or a community level or a society level, even national as wide, possibly. Uh, we cannot say regional digital policy. Uh, it, it needs to be national or focused about a specific society, community, and so on. And we have the status quo on that. Uh, uh, it needs to be tailored toward the socioeconomics of that society or country or community. Um, and then it is not about targets or goals as much as about empowering, enabling, fostering innovation. Uh, it needs to target these. It needs to be so clear in, in, in targeting uh, these. Um, and most of all, also creating opportunity. Innovation for what? Uh, if, if innovation will not create opportunities uh, that will help improve the community, society, individuals, people, whatever, uh, then there is no point. There is no return out of that. Um, and in that sense, it leads us to be a participatory strategy where it can have dialogue, where it can bring people on board, uh, where it can win certain segments like youth, the young generation, the university students and uh, grads. Um, and then uh, there are digital policies. Okay, 2020, 2030, 2035, 2040, 2050. Um, and you may go to the common and you tell them, do you know about these policies? They say, yeah, 2020. Yeah. They are about what? And, yeah. It's a national plan. We have what in it? It should make sense. So it means there is a gap between what's this strategy or what is Yeah. What's this plan? This is like high level What's in overview. it for me? So in a way, it needs to be clear, simple, outreach to whoever needs to benefit from that mm -hmm. or who wants to participate in it. Uh, so I can know what's in it for me. It can be in my mindset. So if I want to do something, yeah. uh, maybe things are there, yeah. right? Um, then we create plans, but who leads? Who's the champion? Who's the leader by example? Where did we have success stories before? Not necessarily, not, not necessarily related to these plans, mm -hmm. but it has been, for example, in Kuwait, we have two successful stories. Not, not relating to Kuwait, but because I know. It's, for example, Talabat.com and uh, uh, what's called carriage. It's all about food delivery, that's fine. But it's a success story. It's an investment that made by a young stars, and someone came and bought these for millions, and it's a success story. It's just operating till today. We have, for example, Maktoub.com at a point. Uh, it was a success story. So, are these clear, visible, known, uh, lesson learned from them? Uh, and again, the plans ca should have a sponsorship, a sponsor, an umbrella. And the state cannot be the umbrella for all. We cannot say the state need to be, or the government need to be the sponsor. There should be communities, groups that can be Sponsors, for example, the telcos today, the, the mobile operators in our region, they are all establishing innovation centers, and it's a win-win situation because these someone there is creating apps, bringing ideas, and they will use the mobile telecom services to implement these ideas. So it's a win-win situation. So they are creating an environment, creating a space, a work space for that, and it's working somehow. Uh, sometimes a great success, sometimes mild success, but it's working. So in, 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 a, in a nutshell, uh, we do have these challenges. It's going so wide scope. And we always talk, we need to have a regional, for example, digital pass. Now, for regional, we need to have something like the Internet University, uh, Universality Indicators, where we say each country, we adopt these indicators, need to be targeted, achieved by that date, 
uh, but you need to create your own national policy or your own national plan to achieve that target or bring view in a bad position in that indicators. But we don't necessarily need to go regional. And that's it. Yeah, I, th I hear what you're saying. I think, yes, digital policy is more effective and efficient when it's kind of applicable to the local context. But if you heard Kosai, I think his intervention is in line with what Vlada mentioned earlier. It's like he's more bothered about the how. You know, the how we do things is very important. And yes, we can have a regional perspective, but ultimately we need to work a lot harder at the local level to make sure that the, the implemented policies are, you know, relevant to the context. Um, so nicely, you know, from initiatives led by ISOC and, and UNESCO to the processes that Eamon uh, mentioned, plus, you know, the uh, kind of challenges, high level, you know, uh, style. Uh, type of challenges that Kusai mentioned, I would like to move swiftly to the gaps, you know, like identifying the gaps from a perspective of people who are working on the ground, doing a lot of work, you know, with different communities and involved at various levels. And maybe it's good to give the, uh, uh, the floor to Mr. Tijani uh, to um, talk us through what he sees, you know, from his own perspective as the gaps, you know, that we see um, in our context. I'm not going to talk probably anymore about regional <laughs> because it's, uh, it's it's maybe good to, to zoom in and, and take Tunisia as, as an example of how, you know, digital um, policy initiatives are kind of filling the gaps um, at the moment. Um, maybe you share with us as well from your own perspective what you see at the moment as a hot issue that you know is not getting the attention of the community and the different institutions working in, in this field. Tijani. Thank you very much, Hanen. I, uh, I wanted to speak about the various um, uh, internet governance initiatives in which I was involved and try to, to, to give what are, the, what are things that we can do to improve those initiatives because uh, I think there is, uh, 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 there is something to do to make them really effective. Uh, I, I am involved in uh, several uh, national, sub-regional, and uh, regional uh, internet governance forums, uh, such as uh, the African Internet Governance Forum, the Arab uh, Afri uh, Internet Governance Forum, the, as regional, as sub-regional West African uh, Internet Governance Forum, North African Internet Governance Forum, and national uh, IGFs, such as the Tunisian one. So uh, there is, uh, uh, let me first speak about the North African Internet Governance Forum because I, uh, I am among the, the leadership team now of this uh, initiative. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, this forum was uh, created in 2012 in Hammamet. And, uh, um, and then uh, the, the first step, if, uh, uh, I think, in making it effective was in uh, Marrakesh where the charter was uh, approved and a NOMCOM was appointed to select the first MAG, and, uh, it, which was done. And uh, the first Internet Governance Forum for North Africa was uh, held in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. The second was in Hamamat in Tunis, in Tunisia. And uh, the third was held last September in Rabat in Morocco. Uh, this uh, last one, uh, we uh, decided to change, to, to modify or to review the, the charter to avoid the problems we faced uh, uh, during these uh, three uh, uh, first years of this uh, uh, forum. So this is the North African IGF. This uh, initiative has common problems with the other initiatives I, I was speaking about. So this is where you're going to speak about the gap? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the main problem is participation. And uh, uh, I don't know if you not said that, but uh, the, the forum is an annual forum to discuss public policies related to internet. So it is open to everyone. It is not for engineers to speak about the unique identifiers of internet. It is not only for lawyers to speak about the, the legal aspects of internet. It is for everyone to speak about the problems they are facing about the threat they have, about their children, about their, their privacy, etc. 
The problem is that we have always the same people participating, a few, not a lot, and mainly local people because of funding, you know, this is always a problem. But this is not a problem. It, the, the main problem is that the participation is very low. And, uh, and even it is uh, of uh, a, a low level. Because after uh, the end of the, of the forum of this year, people will disappear and uh, they, they will not uh, uh, remember anything. They will, st they will wait for the next year, which is not effective at all. So the, I think that the best way is to try to, to build the, ne the, the networks. We have several networks. For example, for, for North African IGF, we can uh, uh, have the network of the Arab IGF. We, have, we can have the network of the African IGF and take all uh, North African people from them to, to, to be in contact with them, to try to inform them yeah. on, on a regular basis, to, to try to, uh, to ask them about their opinion, about what kind of topic they want to, to see addressed during the, the forum. Etc. So the problem of participation is very important and the problem of the quality of participation is important. If we, if we want that uh, the, the, the internet uh, community participate in policy development, we need to make them aware and we, we, we need to make them interested and to make them, uh, to make them know that they have to, uh, to ask to participate in the policy development. And this cannot happen if they are not, if they don't understand what is happening, yeah. if they don't participate in the discussion, uh, because participating in the discussion will make them understand what is the issue, what is the real issue, and how to overcome it. And this is the way to to uh, to make them ask to be involved in the policy development uh, uh, about the, the the internet governance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tijani. I think Tijani brought us back to earth, probably, because he mentioned a very basic issue, participation. It's like we're looking at each other now and we're like, oh, why is this a problem, you know? I know that organizations are deploying a lot of resources, you know, to uh, organize events and you want to see new blood in these processes because you want to feel like you're creating some kind of impact. Um, so it's not only about talking to the same people all the time, and I know how that can be very draining uh, because uh, it's like we are all the usual suspects and we all have, you know, uh, good reason to be here, but we also have very good intentions, uh, if I may say. But I hear what you're saying, and I, I have to say also that there is hope. I'd like to be very positive because I have seen progress and I have seen new faces in the latest edition of the uh, summer school on internet governance for the Middle East, which was organized by the chair of the North African IGF, Mr. Aziz Hilali, and it was very successful and it was with a bunch of PhD students that I was very, very overwhelmed, you know, to talk to, and I felt really like I don't know anything, you know, like they know really more, and it's just a matter of kind of putting more effort into the engagement. And I don't see Fahd anymore in the room, and I know that he's doing a lot of work, you know, on the part of ICANN to the engagement, and I know ISOC also is pulling a lot of resources to make this happen, and luckily we have two hands that we can clap, because huh? you cannot clap with one hand. But the thing is, these efforts are still limited, you know, that, that's not meant to be negative, uh, you know, it doesn't have negative connotation, but I think these people need help, you know, to be able to scale up. So it would be good if, you know, ITU, uh, unfortunately, uh, the lady left the room and maybe UNESCO pull resources together to see how we can scale the work, you know, at the, you know, at the regional level because it's maybe easier. And then also, um, piggyback on other initiatives, important ones like Prida, because Prida has, you know, the basically resources to make things happen. So we have to really take advantage of um, this kind of opportunities and gain momentum so we can bring in more people into this process so we can create a base of people that we can talk with. And I think this is the challenge that I faced myself when I led you know, IGMENA program five, well, I don't know, six or seven years back. It was, there was nothing. You know, I had to start from zero. And then at the end, you know, we, we could see a little bit of movement, but unfortunately, the momentum, you know, is not kept. So we need to make sure that whatever is happening on the ground, we build on it. 
to make sure that there is some kind of continuity. Otherwise, we'll have Tijani as a veteran coming back to us and say, there is no participation, <laughs> which is, to a certain extent, you know, correct. You know, you, you are, uh, you know, I, I, I get your point. Um, when, moment. When, one of the initiatives that the North African IGF tried to do is to involve more and more youth people, yeah. young, young people. Oh, it's and, a lot better and, now, and, yeah. And there is two initiatives in this. Uh, uh, one, the Internet Governance School, that will be always with the Internet Governance Forum. Yeah. For, for, uh, for young people, and second, the Youth Internet Governance uh, Forum. Yeah, thank North. you, yes. Yeah. I think the, the, the participation of youth in IGF, in all IGFs now, it's a lot more prominent than, than, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I think you all remember how it used to be, you know, in the last decade of the IGF, but now I think it's improving. And, and you know, to just feed into your conversation before um, ending up with Zena, I will have to go to Nadira because Nadira also has a lot of experience on the ground in two, you know, kind of contexts, that is the Asia Pacific and, and the many region. And maybe you want to dwell a little bit further on the gaps, you know, that yes. we have uh, in our context. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact I, I want to thank, first of all, the organizer to include uh, somebody to bring the voice of the civil society, or the, indiv the end user. And uh, one of the gaps I see in uh, the region, there is no n nurturing environment. Uh, not there is. There is uh, the, the people start to contribute to contribute to the policies either when they are stuck with uh, some uh, problem or when they find a nurturing environment environment to pull them into the level uh, by doing, not by uh, going back to the earlier uh, session about the capacity building, not necessary to have to be organized. It could be uh, 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 by doing. Uh, and that's the experience I have uh, uh, when I, I was engaged uh, in, into the, attending the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Internet Governance. And I found that uh, in that region, anybody who are interested to, to join, he can be part of the multi-stakeholder uh, group and, uh, and the program committee. And they, have, they do have work mod modalities. The work modalities when they have rules and procedures, and every year they have to uh, open it to, to everybody, all the comments, the community who participated. And you could see the input coming from newcomers so it's not lack of participation of uh, how to bring people. Uh, it's open, it's it, inclusive, nobody, no selection process. So everybody learn by doing, listening and reading what's going on. So this is another approach of, uh, of uh, uh, this is the nurturing environment which I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I would like to encourage to, uh, to bring to the region as well. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, when I mentioned about uh, when we are stuck, we start working with uh, uh, the digital uh, policies. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the, on, on the national level. Uh, for example, when the, uh, two years ago the cybersecurity was implemented, it, it, it has a lot of uh, 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 kind of control of the freedom of speech. The first affected and been like uh, the, the, a lot of journalists. They were being affected by that. And uh, then the think tank, the Palestinian think tank, which they don't bring uh, their research, in, uh, digital research in, into their uh, studies, they start discussing these issues. Even the journalists, uh, syndicates, uh, syndicates also start uh, bringing this uh, initiative. We also, me and Tijani, we uh, also, Fahid is not here, another nurturing environment we, which we, we created in the Middle East. Uh, uh, it's it's community-driven uh, initiative where, uh, uh, where the Middle East, uh, uh, ICANN Middle East group, uh, created that we call mid, uh, Middle East space where uh, uh, very close to each uh, ICANN meeting will we'll handle one of the issues and we uh, call for participants to, uh, to write a comment on the, the, the discussion, discussion on that and then we do the discussion and it, is represent, it will represent the, the regional perspective. 
So it is by doing, you know, learn by doing and getting engaged, and, uh, but also uh, such environment, it, it will help. Another issue about, uh, I was really happy to hear about the, the, the new move of uh, uh, the, uh, the ITU. And I was happy that I was part of uh, the delegate in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ITU PPT, uh, PPT uh, 18. Uh, and I could see that we, you talked about the Arabic, uh, uh, I heard about the Arabic group, and in fact, I felt alienated because I was not allowed to sit with the group to bring the perspective of the end user. I'm not kind of competing. It's, they have to, uh, to listen that we are working to the multi-stakeholder uh, opinion, different opinion, to bring everybody to the same understanding. It's not for top-down. We need to, 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 go, to go to the <coughs> grassroots and listen to what is the exact needs. Yeah. No, I get you. I hear you, Nadira. I think she made really good points. I think developing policy can be intimidating if you don't uh, know the terminology, understand the concepts, and how to link the dots. And if you're not well connected as well in this forum, because we all know that there is few people that can get things done. And to do that, you need to have access to a lot of different you know, layers in this fora. And it's not, uh, we shouldn't take this for granted. So if we're bringing new people to, to, to participate, we have to obviously uh, overcome the siloed environment. And I think I heard this conversation in the first panel. Uh, and to do that is extremely challenging. Um, and I know other fora where you know, developing policy can take years. You know? So you, you are on the same page with other veterans in the process. But it's not impossible. It's doable. It takes time. And people need to be persistent. But not everybody uh, that we know should be kind of contaminated with what I call the IG bug. Because it's a bug. <laughs> and it's like when, when you hit that moment, you understand the issue, you suddenly feel like you want everybody to buy in into what you're doing. But I'll, I can assure you that it took me a long time to convince people that I know outside of the IG world what I do can be understood. Because nobody ever understood what kind of work that I do. So I, I, I do um, feel you and I, I hear you, you know, on the need to kind of have that representation on equal footing with other stakeholders just because you want your voice to be heard as a civil society uh, member. So thank you very much, uh, Nadira, for that intervention. And last but not least, I'll, I'm turning to Zena. Zena, she's actually the convener of the Lebanese IGF and she's also um, the head of international cooperation with Ogero, uh, Lebanon. Are you still? Yes, you on. are still on. Okay. Well, you know, your experience is interesting in this panel because you went through everything, you know, to be able to set your, you know, national IGF. And it would be actually good if you can give us a snapshot of how did it go, you know, with you when it comes you know, from the very beginning, like when you got involved uh, in IG to become a magnet member, and now you're trying obviously to influence policy in your, um, in your country, uh, using perhaps, you know, the IGF as a mechanism, maybe. So let us know what, what's going on. Thank you, Hanan. Uh, first, let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, who is Ogero? Because maybe there are some people in the in the room that doesn't uh, know. Ogero is the public incumbent operator uh, in Lebanon, so uh, we are mainly tasked with a pure technical project like uh, connecting the nation with uh, Lebanon with fiber optics. Uh, we are currently working uh, on implementing a supercomputer for the for the students uh, for uh, to. Uh, uh, enhance uh, innovation uh, with e-science, uh, but uh, also we are trying to to align our uh, business strategies in order to accelerate uh, uh, progress in towards the SDGs. So not only we're not only working on technical issues, uh, we initiated the uh, discussion. Uh, for the internet governance uh, in Lebanon, uh, I've been I've been um, involved with the UN. Uh, I've been member of the UN Mag and member of the Arab uh, Mag, and uh, we thought that 
the experience we gained from these uh, uh, international and regional uh, forums should be implemented uh, also in Lebanon. And luckily, the management uh, uh, at Ogero uh, were uh, uh, happy to have uh, to contribute to this initiative. So we started by gathering like uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, community to compose this uh, Lebanese uh, mag from the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, we tried to involve as many uh, uh, people from from uh, academia. We have uh, like more than three universities on the mag. We have uh, the big uh, technical communities, Cisco, Microsoft, and others. We have uh, the uh, regional organization like uh, ESQUA. We have private sector, civil society. Uh, currently, the, uh, the chair of the Lebanese uh, IGF uh, is uh, Maharat from, from the civil society. So uh, the, we, we initiated to, to prepare for, uh, for the uh, forums. We had our first forum last year, and uh, our second uh, yearly forum was planned, was scheduled on the on uh, uh, last week, yes. But unfortunately, due to the current situation in Lebanon, we had to postpone it uh, till uh, maybe the first quarter uh, of uh, of next year. Uh, we set uh, for ourselves uh, ourselves uh, a mission. I will share with you what, what was the initial uh, idea the about the, 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 yeah, the, the, for the Lebanese IGF, I mean. Uh, it's to build capacity and to promote better understanding of internet governance issues by the different stakeholders in Lebanon and to facilitate a multi-stakeholder consultation, exchange of ideas and views to enhance the cooperation between all the different relevant uh, stakeholders and, and to communicate with, with young people to achieve their aspiration in that area. And maybe we can be a model uh, in the region in that regard. Yeah, no, thank you, Zina. I think, you know, the Lebanese IGF is, could, could perhaps be the best practice, you know, in the region because you actually managed to integrate, you know, the IG process. You uh, managed to learn a lot from the global level and you're trying to apply you know, all the um, learning that happened in, in due course in your local context, which is very good. And I hope, you know, other countries from the region will come to you, you know, to learn how you did it so they can actually, you know, yes. probably follow uh, steps. It's uh, the easy way, kind actually of. Actually, because of uh, the, uh, the experience we gained from the, uh, from the regional and international, we are, uh, we are now heading the Lebanese uh, IGF secretariat because mm -hmm. we, we know how we know things... We know how it works, yeah. yeah. Now, well, I hope other countries will follow course, and uh, I think we still have a bit of time, and I would like to open the floor, you know, for any questions, because there is maybe... Um, a last point that we want to discuss and how to create synergies to overcome you know all the challenges that we uh, discussed today when it comes to uh, digital policy frameworks in the context of the Middle East we um, touch upon um, this specific question with Jane and, and Sasha because you spoke a lot about how to uh, create synergies but if we have any questions from the floor on this specific point or other questions the floor is open Yes, my name is uh, Aziz Hilali. I am professor uh, at the University of Morocco. And uh, I am also the chair of in, uh, North Africa IGF. Uh, I have just a remark about uh, uh, follow what Tijani and Hanan said about the participation of young people uh, in the IGF. Uh, Despite uh, of all efforts made by ICANN, by ISOC, by, uh, and others about fellowship program, I think, in my opinion, that our universities uh, need to introduce uh, in their curricula the, the courses on the governance internet. We tried this experience in, in my university and uh, a course with the score and it's uh, now it's a course in the university 
and uh, to it's for me it's the best way to involve these young uh, people and i am very happy to now to f meet some students in uh, different meeting in Mon in montreal i i meet three students of me and now two per per person here in uh, in berlin that's Pretty great, yeah. that's my hope to introduce the courses mm -hmm. of internet governance yeah. in the university. That's a very good point. I think whoever has access, you know, or influence in their university or institutions to adopt um, a curriculum specific to IG, uh, that would be good. I also heard that um, this specific topic is appealing to media students. I don't know where I heard that, but I think media students and media practitioners are very interested in understanding, you know, uh, the politics of the internet. So. We have to kind of capitalize on that and maybe also streamline, you know, what we do. So we don't only kind of restrict our work to specific disciplines, but be more open to um, to gauge, you know, interest from other uh, people. Um, I see Khalid. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. There is there is a question from the gentleman. Yes. Please introduce yourself and then uh, uh, your my question. My name is Mohamed El Bekri from the Data Protection Authority, CNDP. My question is addressed to Mr. Ayman. It seems that some Arab governments are still struggling to shape their digital policies. My question is, uh, what's missing exactly? Do, uh, are, are they self-centered or do they miss the multi-stakeholders approach or what's missing? Okay, thank you. All right, Ayman, yeah? Yes, actually what is missing is also the, the, the linkages, multi-sectoral linkages. That has been evident in many countries. The silos is not between only the organizations, but uh, uh, it is a silo between the ministers. And particularly the machinery related to planning. So the machinery related to planning does look at the socioeconomic issues and plan for it in the conventional classical approach that has been done a long time ago without the digitization. And when they mention digitalization, as my colleague and friend Qusay said, they just push it in somewhere in the national agenda. What is needed is an overarching and let us say uh, disruptive approach to uh, digital planning at the national level. So the approach we are introducing this, uh, starting this year and uh, onward is national digital agendas. We are working on national digital agendas that uh, by definition includes all sectors uh, and it is of course engaging the champion sector which is the ICT sector. But not anymore the, the, the silo like ICT ministry has its own agenda and the national planning has just a, a stamp or that we use the word digital and AI somewhere here and there. So what does in this entail? It entails a process. What the process would be a multi-sectoral interdisciplinary process that also multi-stakeholder in nature across all sectors. But for this to happen, we have to start with the also multi-sectoral reviews. And this is what we introduced. This is really very tedious and very heavy, but this the response to the question of the gap, response to the question of the stock taking of problems and challenges at the national level, and it's a feed uh, forward to the think tanks. I mean, we as in the UN as think tank, we cannot really give, uh, I mean, uh, uh, one uh, size fits all uh, policy advice. So this is really the starting point for correct advice and advocacy. So without that thing, and this is what happened in the 2030 community. They started by the national VNRs, Voluntary National Reviews. And this voluntary national reviews is the starting point for the 2030 planning. So we are doing the same, voluntary national reviews for the digital development. And from there, we hope in two years' time, we will have this national things uh, uh, at the country level. The rest is details. I mean, yeah. who, who to implement, uh, where are the partners, uh, who trains. But the vision should start from that holistic Standpoint. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, that was very useful, and uh, we have a question from uh, Khalid. Yeah. Thank you, Hanan, and uh, very quickly, my name is Khalid Ibrahim from the Gulf Center for Human Rights, and uh, I want, uh, f first of all, to agree with you uh, when you started this session uh, about the lack of interest among our governments when it's about digital security, but 
then we have other problems that we need to address. Like, I just give you a quickly example. In March, we brought, uh, before March, uh, at the start of this year, we brought some young activists who are uh, really IT experts, and they have interest in promoting a free and open internet, and they managed to write a proposal for the, the IGF. It's about uh, the dual technology that used by our government to monitor online activism. It was really well-established proposal, and unfortunately, it was rejected, and I believe there was no any justi justification for such a rejection. Now, uh, we just need to work together, and I agree with Nadira about really civil society should be involved all the time. Whenever you have a project, an initiative, consult them. There are a lot of them working in the field, and we are here, just as I said earlier, that we, we are here to work with you to have a prosperous future. We are not uh, different from any other nation that uh, needs to be civilized and to have respect for civil society. So I am trying to uh, organize with some colleagues a, a meeting for MENA in which all the stakeholders could work together. Mm -hmm. That's our purpose here. We want to work together. We want to promote a free internet. We want to respect the human and civil rights of our citizens. Yeah, thank, thank you, Farid. Thank you, Harit. Uh, very, uh, very good uh, point, and it's pertinent. I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, room uh, for improvement when it comes to engaging civil society. Um, so, yeah, so point taken, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, maybe we don't have any more questions, and uh, I would like, you know, to give the panel uh, maybe uh, the opportunity to uh, add some concluding remarks, if any. If not, I think um, the session is uh, over, and um, I'll pass on the microphone to Hisham. Uh, everybody may stay in their seats so we can conclude the session. Thank you, Hisham. Uh, thank you, Hanan, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, from the speakers, from the co-organizers, and the uh, speakers of the first panel as well. Uh, I know how challenging it is to stay until 6 p.m. on day zero, only on day zero, so uh, uh, thank you all for sticking out. Uh, just to, to highlight some of the takeaways of uh, the discussion, and I will keep it very brief so that we can still enjoy the evening. Uh, I, I think the word uh, uh, context is king, reflects many of what we have uh, uh, discussed and learned from our speakers uh, during the session. Um, uh, several speakers actually talked about the importance of uh, how we package uh, internet governance to keep it interesting, as Tijani uh, you mentioned and uh, uh, e-package it uh, in a way that matches uh, the context. Um, there was obvious also that our countries, maybe uh, not just the government but other stakeholders as well, are taking different approaches to internet and internet governance as uh, Yushafi also highlighted. Uh, and this is maybe uh, one reason and also a result of how we engaged uh, at different fora like IGF, like uh, ITU, like ICANN, and so on. Um, so it's, uh, it's obvious that the need to uh, institutionalize uh, at various levels, uh, whether at uh, uh, regional or national, is uh, key to what uh, could be done. Um, uh, there's a lot to be done at the national level, uh, whether from the planning uh, for our digital strategies or uh, for how we can uh, also engage with uh, different stakeholders, whether civil society, as Khaled mentioned, or uh, technical community, uh, or other uh, private sector actors. Uh, process is important. Uh, Ayman, you highlighted this. Um, so having the process uh, right is, is very important to our stakeholders to, uh, to properly engage. Uh, and of course, the last thing is the long term. So. Digital policies, internet governance is not something that just works overnight. You need to invest on the long term other than uh, just expect quick results. So the impact is usually the long term. So uh, by that, we conclude the session. Uh, thank you all again for participating and being part of this. Thank you uh, all our speakers and our partners for uh, responding to, uh, to our invitation to this one. And uh, till next time, maybe. Thank you.